Full stack web development is a field that requires you to be proficient in both front end and back end technologies. The field has consistently been one of the high demand, high pay jobs in the market. So, if you are looking to get started in full stack development, you are in the right place. Hey everybody, you are already watching a full stack web development full course video provided by Edureka. If you love watching videos like this, then do consider hitting the like button and subscribing to our channel. You can also click the bell icon to receive regular updates from here. We also have a lot of training programs and certification courses in our website. So if you are interested in them, check the links given in the description. Now we've got to remember that full stack web development is a combination of skills. So this video aims to target exactly that. We'll start this video with an introduction to full stack web development. This section will help you properly understand what it is that you're trying to learn. Followed by this is HTML. Any web developer knows that the process starts with scripting HTML. And once you're done with this section, you will be able to do exactly that. After this, we have CSS. Now CSS is used to make your site look pretty. It deals with design features and graphics. And after that, we will start with JavaScript, a language that can add functionality to your website and dynamic features that heavily impact user interface. After this, we have jQuery. Now jQuery is very similar to JavaScript. It is used when you want to accomplish certain tasks that need a lot of JavaScript code and replaces it with a single line of code. After jQuery, we have Angular, React.js and Node.js. These technologies are a structural framework for highly dynamic applications. It lets you extend the functionality of HTML to clearly and succinctly express your application's components. Next up, we have MongoDB, which is a database platform which can help you read data, modify it, store it, etc. And after MongoDB, we have REST API, an application programming interface that conforms to the constraints of REST architectural style and allows the interaction with RESTful web services. We will then see how we can collaborate and control versions using Git and GitHub, after which we have Maven, Jenkins and Docker. These are platforms that can help you build projects, manage pipelines and run applications. Now let's not waste a lot of time and move on to the first part of the video, which is introduction to full stack web development. So what is full stack web development? I'm sure you all must have heard of front end and back end web development, but what is full stack web development? Now full stack web development basically involves front end and back end web development. It requires in-depth knowledge of the different scripting languages like HTML, JavaScript, CSS, which make the web look more interactive and alive. It also requires high level programming languages such as Java, Python, and so on to code the server side. Apart from this, you also require experience in working with JavaScript frameworks like Node.js and libraries such as jQuery and so on. Now in the further slides, I'll be covering the different aspects of becoming a full stack web developer in depth. So stay tuned. So before we move on to what a full stack developer does and how a front end and back end developer works, let's look at the different layers of full stack. First, we have the presentation layer or the front end of the web. This layer helps you interact with the web, watch videos, perform actions like register to an online shopping site. So guys, whenever you surf a website, the different fonts, images and the content of the website forms the presentation or the front end of that website. So basically the design, look and feel of the web is accomplished with the help of HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Then comes the logic layer or the back end layer. Now this layer forms a dynamic connection between the front end and the database. So every time you search the web, it's the logic layer that transmits your requirements to the database and returns what you searched for. All of this is powered by a web server. Now, in order to get this layer working, it's important to know at least one of the programming languages such as Python, Java or C hash. OK, now lastly, we have the database layer. This layer is a massive warehouse of information. It contains a database repository which captures and stores information from the front end through the back end. Now, a prerequisite over here is to have knowledge of how data is stored, edited, retrieved and so on. Languages such as MySQL, MongoDB are a must to know. Now let's look at the type of web developers. 
So guys, front-end developers are responsible for a website's look and feel. These developers must be masters at three main languages, which is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. They also need to be familiar with frameworks like Bootstrap, AngularJS, and EmberJS, which make the website look more interactive and alive. Libraries like jQuery also help to package code into a lightweight and compatible form. Now, moving on to the backend developers. Now, the backend of a website consists of three components the server, the application, and a database. A backend developer creates and maintains the web server, application, and the database which allows the front end of the website to operate. To make the server, application, and a database to communicate with each other, backend developers use server side languages like PHP, Ruby, Python, Java, and .NET to build an application. They also require to operate on tools like MySQL, SQL, MongoDB in order to fetch, store, or edit data and then serve it back to the user in the front end. Now, guys, this is how backend developers work. Now, moving on to full stack developers. The term full stack developer was popularized in a meeting around eight years ago when Facebook announced that they are looking to hire only full stack web developers. Now, basically, a full stack developer should be knowledgeable enough to work on both the front end technology and the back end technology. So he needs to have an understanding of how the web works at each and every level, including setting up and configuring Linux or Windows servers, coding server side APIs, running the client side of the application by using JavaScript, and structuring and designing the web page with CSS and HTML. A full stack developer is like the jack of all trades. One must have enough knowledge to run both the client and the scripting side. Now let's discuss a few key points about why one must practice full stack web development. One of the reasons is the full stack developers can choose from a rich set of tools and technologies for creating and designing unique code. They are not restricted to a certain set of tools for development because there are n number of frameworks and libraries that will assist a full stack developer in achieving an effective web application. Now the next reason is design and development. Now, one of the best things about working as a full stack developer is that you're not restricted to only development. As a full stack developer, you can design and style your application. And then if you're bored of designing, you can probably switch to your developer mode. Now, developer skills come into handy when you want to create a functional and a bug free application. A full stack developer is basically a creative person who can both develop and design an application. So guys, I'm not going to lie to you. A full stack developer is like the Stephen Hawking's of web development. After mastering various scripting and programming languages and working alongside several frameworks and libraries, a full stack developer is no less than a master. Of course, one requires to have work experience and a lot of knowledge, but nothing is unachievable if you have the will to do it. Apart from that, a full stack developer is highly valued in all parts of the world. In the US, the average salary of a full stack developer is over $110,000. Not only in the US, all around the world, full stack developers are in high demand. Now that you have a basic understanding about what a full stack developer is, let's dive deep into how to become a full stack developer. Let's look at the responsibilities of a developer and what exactly does he do. All right. So guys, to begin with, you must have a decent understanding of how a website or a web application is built and what tools and technologies are used to do so. So let's begin with our front end web development. To master front end web development, you'll need to know many technologies, but the main technologies are HTML, CSS and JavaScript. Now HTML, which stands for hypertext markup language is the skeleton of every web page. It defines the structure of the web. Without it, the web would be as shapeless as a lump of clay. By using HTML, you tell the browser how you want your content to be structured by defining the different parts of a web page. For example, you define the content of your web page within HTML tags. Now, these tags tell the browser which part are headings, body, sidebars, and footers. This not only helps to structure the web page, it also lets you style each HTML element by selecting them and then adding different style parameters. Now CSS, which stands for cascading style sheets, is like the clothes we wear to look stylish and attractive. The HTML elements we defined can now be styled using CSS. For example, you can change the color of the header, add and style various buttons. You can also use CSS to adjust the width of the HTML elements. You can style them by adding color and design. 
you can also play around with buttons and make them look colorful and attractive so guys you can style a web page in any way you want css has thousands of styling functions which let you design and make a web page look like a beautiful painting next up is javascript now before i get on with how full stack developers use javascript it is important to understand how javascript works javascript is basically a language of the web which every browser pc and mobile phone understands now javascript can natively run on the browser by natively i mean that most of the web browsers like google chrome safari and internet explorer have a javascript engine embedded into their browsers okay now this javascript engine interprets the javascript code so that it can run on the browser so guys this is exactly how javascript runs on the web browser now where is javascript used now let's look at an example so guys when you're browsing on a web page you come across many buttons on clicking these buttons some event occurs now javascript has event listeners which perform specific actions on the click of a button like for example on the click of a button another page might open up or a personal detail form can pop up all of this is possible only through javascript it is basically used to manipulate the html elements add motions and graphics to them so any sort of motion that you see on your web page is all javascript now that you have a good idea of how full stack developers work on the front end let's look at the back end now when a user opens up a web page and clicks on a link or submits some form or let's say he enters a url where does this data get stored and how does the browser return information to the user so basically the browser connects to a web server now a web server is just a computer running an application or a software that delivers resources to the web pages so guys when a web server receives a request for a resource it has to respond with that resource so how does it do that now basically back end developers program the web servers to respond with the right resources so the main aim of the web server here is to respond with the correct resources but where do they get these resources the web server is connected to a database which is continuously pulled on receiving some request so the role of a full stack developer here would be to create an application that fills a web page with the required resources by pulling data from the database now this application is programmed using server side languages like java python php node.js and the database is also programmed using languages such as mysql mongodb and sql so guys basically the back end of a web page is used to serve the required resources to a user so here we just discussed how the front end development is used to design the user facing part of a web page that lets us interact with the web page we also discussed how the back end is used to deliver a web page to the browser along with the requested resources which are retrieved from a database so guys this is what a full stack developer does he has to create both the front end and the back end of a web page all right now let's look at some of the important technologies and tools that a full stack developer must know first of all a full stack developer must choose a code editor that is best suitable for him there are hundreds of code editors out there personally i switch between visual studio code and sublime text they are the most user friendly code editors but you guys can go ahead and choose whichever code editor you like now the second tool is a version control system a version control system basically is used to keep a track of all the changes that you make to your code files or any sort of documents now like the name suggests it creates versions of your code or your file every time you change something so let's say that you created a web application and added an additional feature to it but for some reason this feature slowed down your website and you want to go back to the old version of your website so usually it is very hard to revert back to an older version but a version control system takes care of this because it has a track of all the code changes that you've made and it can easily revert back to any code change some of the popular version control systems include git and subversion now guys there are thousands of javascript frameworks and libraries which will come handy during web development frameworks like node.js can help with back end development of a web page and javascript libraries such as jquery can help at the front end to design a web page then there is angular react backbone meteor which are all very useful to a full stack developer a full stack web developer is always familiar with a couple of javascript frameworks and the best part of these frameworks is that after learning javascript which you'll definitely need while developing the front end they are very easy to understand next up we have http protocols 
Now, HTTP is basically a stateless application protocol on the internet which allows clients to communicate with the server. So basically, it enables communication between the front end of your web page and the back end. Guys, let me tell you that there are a lot of web developers out there who don't know much about HTTP. But it is quite essential to have an understanding about HTTP and how the internet works. It is also necessary to understand what is REST and why is it important in regards to the HTTP protocol in web applications. Apart from all of this, a full stack developer obviously needs to have prior knowledge about running the application on operating systems such as Linux, Windows and so on. Because at the end of the day, all of this is running on top of an operating system. Also, a lot of full stack developers have brushed up on various project management tools like Jira, Teamwork, Basecamp to effectively carry out the web development process. So guys, becoming a full stack web developer requires good amount of effort and dedication. But is it worth all the effort? I would say definitely it is. It is the most value designation and once you practice full stack web development, you'll become a master of the web. And at Edureka, we provide a full stack web development course that has all the required tools and technologies that you need to learn. And we also make sure that you don't just learn it, you master it. So guys, if you're interested in learning the full stack web development master course or any other training technologies, let us know in the comment section and we'll get back to you at the earliest. So the idea behind HTML was a modest one. When Tim Berners-Lee was putting together his first elementary browsing and authoring system for the web, he created a quick little hypertext language that would serve his purposes. He imagined dozens or even hundreds of hypertext formats in the future and smart clients that could easily negotiate and translate documents from servers all across the internet. Now HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language and it is a standard markup language for creating web pages and web applications. It is used to describe the structure of the web pages using a process called markup. Now HTML mostly constitutes of elements and these elements are the building blocks of any HTML page and are represented by tags. Now let me just give you a brief introduction to the structure of HTML. Now this is also called an HTML boilerplate. So firstly, an HTML boilerplate begins with the HTML tags, which tells the browser that this is an HTML page and this is where it begins from. Next comes the head tag, which contains most of the meta information about the document. The head tag normally also contains the link to the styling sheets, the fonts that you might be using on your web page, and even the JavaScript that you might be using. Now, the head tag also has the title element, which specifies the title for the document and can be seen as a text on the tab that you open on a browser. Now, next comes the body tag, which mostly contains the content that is visible to the viewer of your page. And these contains elements like H1 tags or paragraph tags, which are known by P tags, and they make up the mass of your content. Now, to create an HTML page, there are a few steps. So firstly, you need to open any sort of text editor. It could be Notepad++, Notepad, Sublime Text, or even Visual Studio Code. You have the freedom to use whatever text editor you want. Next, you have to write up some HTML code that you want to show on your web page, and then you just save your file as a .html. And to open the file, all you have to do is just view it on your browser. Now, let me just give you a quick demonstration on how that is actually done, if you've still not understood that. So let us create a folder first. So let's call this folder HTML demo. And now we're just gonna use Sublime Text because that's my favorite text editor. Out here, all you have to do is create a new file and I'm gonna be saying that it's a HTML type. Then you just fit in your HTML boilerplate. I'm gonna tell my title is gonna be my first web page. And that is the title of our web page. Now let's put in some content into this. So it's gonna have an H1 which says, this is just some text. Let's save this. This is gonna be saved into our HTML demo. So let's open it, let's save it as index.html. Now, once you've saved it, all you have to do to view it is go into your folder and just open it on your browser. So as you guys can see, the title is written out here on the tab and this is our H1 that we just created. Okay, so that's how you basically create an HTML page. So let's move on. Now there are some elements that I want to tell you all about which is very important. So first is the doc type element. So the doc type declaration 
represents that the file you're working is a document type and helps the browser to display web pages correctly. And it only appears once at the top of the page before any HTML tag and the doc type declaration is not case sensitive. Okay, so this is what HTML actually looks like. Now before we move further with some HTML coding, I want to make you all aware that a web page is fundamentally made up of three constituents. The first is HTML, the second is CSS or cascading style sheets, and the third is JavaScript. Now HTML will only give the structure of the web page. It has nothing to do with the styling, while CSS is completely responsible for how beautiful your web page looks, what colors you're using as the background, how your images are actually lined up, and all those sorts of things. To learn more about CSS, you can always refer to our CSS tutorial on the same page of EduRecker. And thirdly, JavaScript is for making your page much more dynamic. If you're clicking on a button, your posts are being actually submitted. That's all being done by JavaScript. And if you all want to learn about JavaScript, we also have tutorials for that and you can surely check them out. Okay, so now let's go ahead and create some elements and see how they look like on an HTML page. So let's go back to our HTML page. So this is what an H1 looks like. So let me just copy this down now. And let me show you all the types of headings that HTML provides us. It's actually H1 through H6, so H2, H3, H4, H5, and H6. Let's also change them here. H6, H5, H4, H3, 2. Now let's save it. Let's go ahead and reload our page. So this is how the different types of headings look like. This is H1 being the biggest and H6 being the smallest. Okay, so that was about headings. Now we have some other tags also that I want to make you all aware of. So there's the P tag first. So P normally stands for paragraph. Now paragraph is basically what it looks like and it normally contains random text or paragraphs of your web page. And this is what they look like. So this is what a paragraph looks like. Okay, so that was all about adding a paragraph. So how do you add images? So you can simply add image with the image tag and all you have to say is a source. Now I already have a beautiful picture of a Pokemon that I really loved as a kid. So let me just copy that down into the folder. Okay, so now that we've copied down our image into our folder, all you have to do is give the source. Now this can be ninetails.png. That's the name of our image. Let's go back to our page. Let's reload it. Okay. Now you can also put in attributes like height and you could say the height is going to be 7 or 500 pixels and then you can also put in an attribute called width and say that's also going to be 500 pixels. Yeah, so that changes the height and width of your image. You can also make it smaller by saying something like 100 pixels. So let me just show you that. Save it, let's reload it. And yeah, now we have a much smaller nine tails out there. Now, suppose you don't have a picture, you can also put an alt tag. So this will say, there was supposed to be an image here. So let's save that. Now you will not be able to see the alt tag because our image is working. But suppose I misspelled the name of my image and now you'll see something like that out there. So there was supposed to be an image out here. So it's showing the alternate thing. Right, we can also have line breaks in our HTML. So you do that simply by saying slash br. And then there will be a line break between this word Alamco and Laboris. So let's save that. Let's cancel this out. Okay, so now Alamco and Laboris are on different lines. We can also make stuff bold. So suppose you want to make this first word bold. So you can go b slash b and that'll make it bold yep now lorem is bold you can also for making things bold you can use a strong tag and now let's say this is also bold and now this is also bold comes up right there then you can change the size of text so let's just create some other text so it not so that it doesn't get cluttered up so we have tags like big and we also have tags like small let me just show you the difference. This text is big, while this is small. Let's do that. So this text is big, while this is small. So let me just put a line break here. Save that. Let's also put a line break here. And now let's put back our image. 
yeah this text is big while this is small now you can also put in horizontal lines inside your HTML all you have to say is HR and that'll put in horizontal line out there right like that you can also put the width and height out here so width there's no reason to put a height because it's not there and width is going to be something like 70 percent you could say 70 percent and you have a line that goes 70 percent through the screen next we can also put in links into our html so suppose you want to go to a site so let's say you want to go to edureka now we can put some text like say this is a link to a website let's save that Spread here and now this will take us to edureka.co yep so that's how it works you can also put links on images so suppose we were to remove this text out here copy this image from here and just put it out here now if we were to click on the image it'll take us to edureka.co okay you can also add lists into your HTML page so there are two types of lists one is an ordered list so ordered lists are numbered lists and you can put in list items like this so let's put in a bunch of list items okay so let's type in some text so this is a random list so list items are actually going to be the things that you're going to list out so these could be anything that you're listing out you could list out your favorite dogs you could list out your favorite chocolates or anything like that let me just show you what that looks like let's go back to our page and this is what it looks like so as you guys can see we have a list out here which says this is a random list this is a random list and just to make it a little more creative let's go and put in some stuff like that so firstly let's put an h2 out here these are some of my favorite dogs uh, let's say I love Samoeds I also love Corgis I love Huskies and I also love Golden Retrievers so now we'll have an actually good list out here so these are some of my favorite dogs now if I were to just make this an unordered list so we could also have unordered list so this is how you create an unordered list you just go UL and then you put in your list items so I'm gonna say so let's put an H2 again and these are some of my favorite heroes in Dota 2 so list item this is gonna be let's see I really love playing Shadow Fiend then let's put in some other heroes like Storm Spirit, Invoker, and let's say Templar Assassin. Let's save that and let's see. So these are some of my favorite heroes in Dota 2. Now if you see our H2 is kind of indented. That is because we have put it inside our list. Now if you were to just cut it out and put it outside. Let's read in my lines and let's see. So now it's properly showing. So these are some of my favorite heroes in Dota 2. You can also put in images in these list items. So suppose we were to put in some images of Shadow Fiend Storm Spirit. You would just put an image out here and you would put the source. Now I don't really have images but you can also put in the URL of images. So let me just show you how to do that. So let's see Shadow Fiend. Let's go into the images. Let's find something small like let's say 300 x 300 okay so this looks like a nice cartoonish figure so we open this image in a new tab and we copy down this link so you can see the source is this link let's save it let's see if it shows up yep and now this thing shows up just outside shadow fiend you can also put in some styling or some attributes like you say width is going to be 100 pixels and height is going to be 100 pixels so let's save that now and now it's a much smaller image of shadow fiend now we have other types of tags also so these are called div tags so div tag stands for division so to divide your page into separate parts you could say this will contain the footer so footer tags are normally coming in the end now you could also have a div tag in the beginning and this could contain the header so these tags will contain the header this is so let me just put in some header so this is the header and this is the footer 
So this is the header, headers always come on top and this is the footer. Now you can also create forms using HTML. So let's go ahead and create one. So our form is going to be called a registration form. Okay, so now let's put our form in a div first of all. So let's give our div an ID. So IDs and classes are actually used to select stuff on an HTML page when you're styling. So to understand more about IDs, check out our CSS tutorial. Let's give this ID form or registration form rather. Then let's go into our div and create a form. Our form will always stay inside our form tags. Now that we have done that, let's understand the elements of a form. Firstly, we need an input. So first input will be of type text. Let's say its name is going to be first name and we'll have a placeholder that sounds like this, say aria and we will always be requiring it. So if you say required, that means somebody will, if he's actually inputting stuff into the form, this is a mandatory field. Okay, so let's save that and see. So now we have a registration form called aria. Okay, so we also need labels. So let's go ahead and create one. So label, so for first name, and this is gonna say first name, and it's gonna have a colon. So now there's a label called first name. Now we can do this for last name also. So let's control C, control V. So it's gonna be last, it's gonna be last, and this is also gonna be last. And we wanna put a placeholder for Paul, and this is also a required field. So now we have a last name with this placeholder. We can submit stuff into that. Now form also takes in two important attributes I forgot to mention. So one is the action and the other is the method. Now action is something that will happen when you submit this form. So you can run a script, something like script.php. But for now, that's for another session. Okay, now there are other types of inputs. So let's see, let's create another div. Now suppose you want to input the gender also. So let's see, let's first create a label and let's also create an input type. So input will be type of radio and this is going to be called gender male and let's also give us a value of choice one. Save it. Now you want to label and you want to give it the attribute for and you want to give it the name out here. So let's put in that. So gender male save that and let's write mail out here. So let's save that now and let's see what it looks like. So now we have this thing called mail. We can check it and we can uncheck it. Now let's create for female also and others. So let's see, let's call this female and this is gonna be of type choice two. Now we have male, we have female. But if you see, we can actually select both of them or all of them. So that's not something we want. Right, so let's make this choice three. Let's make this other. Okay, now we have a gender submission going on. So male or it's female or it's other. Now we can't really select everything. So how do we actually solve that? So let's give them all the same name. So we can call it gender choice, save it. Now you either go male, or you go female, or you go other. You can't really select the same thing. So that's how you make that happen. Okay, now let's look into some other types of input types we can take in. So let's create another div. Suppose you want to take in the email address. So let's go ahead and copy that. Let's put it out here. Let's say, so label for, let's see. First of all, we need to change this type to email. And we will also give this a name of email. Let's put in a placeholder instead of a value. And it's gonna be something like, let's put xyz at the rate email.com. Okay, now we have this thing going on. So let's change this label to email and let's change this label to email too. Now we have this thing going and we can type in our email. And we'll also need to type in a password for registrations. Let's call this password. Let's also make this password. The type is going to be password. 
and let's remove a placeholder because passwords don't really have placeholders save that and now you see when you type in a password you can't really see anything that's how you make a form that inputs a password okay so that was how you take in emails and passwords in a form now there are some other stuff that I want to show you so let's dive right into that so let's create another div okay so first of all we need a select tag so select tags are used for making selections so let me show you how that works so firstly let's give this a name and let's call this birthday or let's call this the month now we'll also need a label for this let's create a label so our label is for month let's call it birthday now our select can have various options so you're basically going to put it in a bunch of options out here let's see option now we need 12 options actually that's 3 that's 6 that's 9 that's 12 delete these out just read in my lines now our options are going to have values so our value will be something like fine so let's say Jan Feb March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. And you could say January out here, February. Let me just create this quickly. March. let's save this now let's see what this looks like so we have this birthday thing and it has all the months in there okay now out here if you see it already comes with the default value of January now you can also mitigate that by putting in another option called default so let's put another option or so now that we have an option let's give this a value 0 and let's say selected disabled now if you reload this there's nothing but you get all these different values now instead of just making it blank you could say that this could say month so now this says month and you could create something similar for days also so for days you need to create 30 of these and I hope you get the logic of creating this thing now now our form also needs a button to submit so let's go and create that also let me show you another type of input so let's say input and the type will be check box and the name will be agree and let's put a label for this a for agree and I agree to all the conditions of the form now we will have this thing going and we have a checkbox we could check it we could uncheck it something like that then all we need is an input and on an input we rather need a button say button and you say submit and you also have to give this a type so this is going to be of type submit so once that's done we see this button and we can submit it so if you go and submit you'll see please fill out this field because it's a required field and that's all that is there the forms so that's how you create a form in HTML you can also create tables in HTML so let me show you how to do that let's reload and make this blank save it yeah so our tables are created with table tags your table and tables have table data okay so we can also create tables in HTML for that we need the table tag now table comes with the table header first of all so this will contain all your table headers so suppose you are creating a table for dogs and the breed so th dog uh, and you can say the dog also has a name and breed so this has created a table header now so let me just show you what that looks like so now we have the dog name and breed now we can just simply go in and put in some table 
rows so for instance row you say tr and in every row you will have to put in some table data so for that you use the table data tag so td so let's say our dog is called so let's make this rather dog owner name right so I had a dog and my dog's name was stoner let's call him stoner and stoner was a street dog so let's just keep the breed as street okay so that was one table data row save it now we'll be needing multiple table rows so let's just copy that paste it multiple times so let's say my friend Shubham he has a dog called Goldie and it's a retriever and then I also have this friend called Ayushman he has a dog called Duke and it's Husky and then there's this guy called Ishan he has a dog called Monster but it's a pug yeah so now we have successfully created a table and you guys, you guys can see dog owners are Arya, Shubham, Ayushman and Ishan their name of their respective dogs are Stoner, Goldie, Duke and Monster and their breeds are Street, Retriever, Husky and Pug so that's how you create a table now with CSS you can add a border to this table so let me just show you how that's done with a little bit of CSS so let's say style let's say text slash CSS now out here you could just do some little styling let's say let's give our table a border of 1px solid black now our table will have a border and we can also give TDs a border and and they're gonna have 1px solid black too so now everything has a border and our table looks much neater yep so that's how you create a table in HTML okay guys so now it's time I actually show you how HTML can be really polished sometimes so let's go ahead and create a blog so for this blog I've already created the CSS out here so I'm not really going to be explaining the styling part but we are going to be creating our blog so let's go ahead and see how that looks like so first of all let's delete everything let's create a page now so let's call this blog now we'll be linking our style sheet out here so for linking our style sheet all you have to say is something like this and then we go ahead and copy my style sheets in the desktop we're doing our stuff in HTML demo let's copy this here right now our blog.css is going to be here now let's go and start creating our blog so firstly let's put everything inside a div now this is going to have a class called post because I've used the class to actually style some stuff now that's done so let's have another div so this is going to have a class called date and we're going to be putting in the date so let's say our date is going to be October 24th 2018 now let's say we have a heading so let's say Vancouver my favorite city then let's put in some paragraphs because every article needs a paragraph so for paragraphs you're just going to be filling it with some lorem ipsum now a paragraph will have a class called quote okay now let's reload and see what is being made okay so if you guys can see a blog post is coming up now we can also add some images to our blog post so let's say let's add a link first so we link to https www.edureca.co now we are going to use an image for actually making it clickable so we already have an image it's called image1.jpg so that's there let's also put an alt tag out here just in case this doesn't load up so alt and say Vancouver image now let's put in some another paragraphs so not a lorem ipsum and some more paragraphs I guess because this is a blog so let's make it look like a blog save that and let's also give it a horizontal line to make it look neat save this let's load it okay so we have this nice looking article and it has this image if you click on this image it'll take us to edureka site so we go to edureka if we click that image let's add another article into this just to make it a little longer so let's copy down this div 
So let's change the date first because let's say we post it on the next day. Let's change the title. So the, my second blog post. Save it. Let's remove the image from this one to make it a little different. Yeah. So now if you see, we have this nice looking blog post going on. It has this horizontal line. We have some code out here. And that's how you can do stuff with HTML. So what exactly is CSS? Well, CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets and is generally used to control how HTML tags and elements are displayed on your screen. So this means basic styling of your web page is controlled by CSS. Now CSS was actually made to solve problems that were introduced in HTML 3.2. Now HTML 3.2 got in some new attributes like font color, background color, which generally was pertaining to styling of a element on a web page. Now, while this did add some very, very needed functionality into HTML 3.2, it cluttered up your code as a developer and made your life pretty miserable. So to keep the structure of your web page, which is the HTML, and to make the styling a different aspect, CSS was made by W3C. So W3C stands for the World Wide Web Consortium and CSS till date is still being maintained by the W3C developers. Okay, so that was a general introduction to CSS. Now let's move ahead. So this is the basic syntax of CSS. You basically have selectors, which selects or targets the place that you want to attach your styling to. Then you have basic properties and value pairs. Now you can include your CSS into your HTML with a link tag while putting the href attribute as the file name. Or you can do some inline CSS, but that's not actually recommended because that's the problem that we are actually trying to mitigate by putting CSS as a different file. Also, if you don't want to create another CSS file, you can do some internal CSS by putting in some style tags in your head tag and just writing some normal CSS to it. Okay, so now let's see the different type of CSS selectors. So these are all the different type of CSS selectors. And basically a selector is a way of targeting an element on a web page. So the star selector selects all the elements and applies the CSS that you would apply to it. And then if you would say div, then it would apply your CSS to all the divs. Now div comma p will apply to all the divs and paragraphs. Div space p will put your styling to all the paragraphs inside divs. Now going through all the CSS selectors is a pretty cumbersome job. So I recommend that you go through this page on W3 Schools, which has all the different types of selectors and the different types of pseudo selectors all listed out. So this will very much help you when you're doing your own CSS. So always keep this page open. Now, just for basic sake, let me just tell you about pseudo selectors. So we also have pseudo selectors, which is defined something like this. So pseudo selectors include stuff like hover, active, visited, and stuff like that. Now, suppose you were hovering over an A tag. So you can say there is supposed to be some specific styling when you're hovering over it. So how would you do that? You would just say A colon hover, and then you would actually specify the styling that you want. Now you could also find all these types of pseudo selectors out here and it's all listed out here. So A visited, like select all visited links, something like that. Now I also want to make you all aware of the box model that is very much used in CSS. Now box model has four things, the content, padding, border and margin. So content is the basic content of the web page that you want to show to you, your general audience. Then the padding is the space between your border and the content itself. The border is a line that can be of any size, color and width. And then there's a margin, which is the distance from the edge of the screen to the border. Okay. And now the box model looks something like this. So the content comes in between, then comes the padding, which is between the border and the content. And then there's the margin, which is between the screen and the border itself, the screen edge and the border, right? So that's how the box model works. Now the last bit of basics is the CSS units. So there are four kinds of units. Firstly, we have the pixel. So pixel is represents any pixel on a device. So you could say something like font size is equals to 25 pixels. So it'll make it actually 25 pixels. Then there's also points, which is mostly used in print media. And all you need to remember to use points correctly, that 72 points equals one inch. Now the last two types of units are relative units. Now these are relative to your current font size. So one EM or 100% is actually equals to your current font size. So if you want something to be double your font size, all you have to say is two EM. So these are how relative units work in CSS. 
Okay, so that was all the basics of CSS and how you select stuff and all the units. Now let's get ahead and code some of our own CSS. So for this time, I've actually created a bunch of HTML pages and we're gonna style these HTML pages by adding some CSS into them. And this will stand as good practice for CSS alone. Okay, so for the first page, we have this page called page1.html and it's a pretty basic page. Let me just open it up and show it to you guys. So this is what it looks like without any sort of CSS being attached to it. Now we're gonna create some CSS and we're gonna try and practice, first of all, selecting stuff in different ways possible. Okay. So firstly, let's do some very random CSS, okay? Firstly, let's target all the divs in this HTML. So how would you actually do that? Well, you'd say div by going selectors and let's actually save this as a CSS file first so that our syntax is colored properly. Okay, so that's a div. So that's how you select any element in CSS. Now, suppose we were to say background color or rather just background, it'll be purple. And the text or the color of the text will be white. So now everything inside a div will look like that. So now let's just save this as page one. As it's saved as page one.css, let's reload our page. And everything that is inside a div now has a white text and it also has a purple background. Okay, now let's see how we actually select IDs. So we select IDs with the hash. So we have an ID called quote out here, if you go and see. So where is that thing gone? Okay, so this paragraph out here that you see has the ID called quote. So we're gonna select that and put in some of our own CSS. So let's see, now that we've selected our ID, we can say, suppose we wanna change the font family. So we could say font family is Verdana and you could also put in alternate font families just in case Verdana doesn't exist in your system like kill sands. Fine. So that's how you set up your font family. Let's also set the color to be black. Let's see what changes now. So this is the code that I was talking about. So that font should change now. Let's reload. Oh yes, now the font has become Verdana and that's what we exactly want. And the text is also black now. Okay, so how do we select classes now? So, if you go here and see, we should have a class called Movies, right? So all these have a class called Movie, all these A tags. So let's select them. So first of all, to select a class, you say dot, and then you say the class name. Now, we could put in some random CSS into this again. So let's make the color, let's keep it white, and let's make the background steel blue. Let's see. So where are our movies? Let's see where the movies actually exist. Oh yeah, Dota, Splinter Cell, and God of War. These are the movies, so these should now change. Let's save it. And now they have a background color of steel blue and they have a text color of white. And that's exactly what we defined out here. Fine. Now let's try out some other kinds of selectors. So suppose in the span out here, we have this ID called author. So what if we only want to target that? What would we say? So we could say span and hashtag author. Now you could put any type of CSS. So let's say text transform. So this is how you transform any sort of text. And you could say uppercase. Now the author will be changed to uppercase out here. And this is the author, the Pope Alexander part. Now watch that. Now it's just uppercase. And we have selected it with this selector called span and hashtag author. We can also do some other kinds of selecting. Let me just show it to you. So we could select the allies of the unordered list or the ordered list. So our skills is the ID. This is the ID of skills. So let's select them now. So we have skills and we could go the ordered list and then the ally. And what we want to say out here is color will be purple. We can do the same thing for the unordered list too. Let me just copy that down. Put this here, say unordered list. And let's say we change the text color to white. Save that, let's reload our page. So wait, first of all, let me uncommon this. Now let's save it again. Reload our page and see the differences. 
now since we had given it a purple color it's now all purple and let me just put a background of white so that you can see it yeah now these are purple and these are background white we can do the same for the unordered list too let me just uncomment that let me also give it a background of purple or actually let it be like that let's just make it blue now sass and hamel have turned into blue as you see out here this is the blue thing fine now that was the selectors okay now let's go ahead and select some other stuff so what if we want to select all the paragraphs that are after the h3 tag so if you remember we can do that by saying h3 plus p and let's say we want a background of black and some text color that is white so color white not being very creative with my CSS at this moment because this is just about selecting. So let's see how that reloads. Yep, now we have a color of white and a background of black. And that only selected the paragraph just after the S3, which is my favorite video games. Okay, we can also select every paragraph that has a class by just saying something like P and class. We don't even need to specify the color or I mean the class name. So you go background, let's say we want to give a gray background. Let's see all the paragraphs of the class. So this is the only paragraph of the class. Now you can do the same thing for IDs. Just say ID out here. And let's see all the paragraphs with an ID. So this is the only paragraph with an ID. Okay, so now that we're done with selecting stuff, let's go and actually see how text can be transformed with the use of CSS. Fine. So first of all, I already have a page created for that. So this is going to be our page that we are going to use to see how text is transformed. If you see, I have an ordered list with all the types of text transformations or the text stylings that I want to show. And we also have a paragraph out here which will show the basics box elements like the borders, margins and padding. So I'm going to demonstrate that through this PID out here. Right, so let's get started. First of all, let's create our CSS file and in the CSS file, we're going to save it and we're going to call it page 2.css, right? Then, yeah, it's connected as page 2. So let's get started. So first of all, let's target this ID with lorem. So lorem ipsum is just some Latin paragraph that is normally used in web development to fill in spaces with text where you can always come back and delete that text and fill it with something more meaningful. So for now, we are going to be using this lorem epsom thing. So it's in a paragraph tag with an ID of lorem. So let's go ahead and select it. So we are going to select it with the help of the ID. Let's call it lorem. Now, first of all, let me just show you what the page looks like without any CSS attached to it. So this is what the page looks like, right? So this is the part that we are going to target right now. First of all, let's give it a background of black. Let's make the color of the text white. Let me show you what that looks like. Okay, right? Now let's give it some borders and padding. So first of all, to give a border, we could say, we use the border at a property, then we give three parameters. The type of the border, the size of the border, and then the color. And you do it something like this, 3px, solid, red. Now, apart from solid, there are a lot of types of borders, and those include dashed, dotted, rigged and many more these are the ones that are just from the top of my head so you can try out them out and you can find other types of css border just by going to google and saying css border types so these are all the types of borders that you get and you can definitely check them out it's impossible to show everything in one video like that so let me just show you the solid type so let's save it and let's see what kind of border we actually get let's close this down yeah now we have this neat little border of three pixels in size and red in color now let me just show you how dotted would look like so this is what dotted looks like and this is what dashed looks like fine and this is what dashed is okay now let's also give this thing some padding now padding exists between the content and the border so i just explained the box model when we were discussing the basics of css so i hope you remember that so for padding there are four parameters actually the right, top, left, and bottom. So you can define your pad something like this. You can go 13 pixels, 13 pixels, 13 pixels, and 20 pixels. Now these are just very arbitrary numbers, but what I want to explain is that this first part will mean that there's 13 pixels of padding from the top, and then we move via in a clockwise fashion. 
So this is on the right, this is in the bottom. So 13 pixels of padding in the bottom and 20 pixels of padding on the left. Now you could also say this really easily if you want to give equal amounts of padding, suppose. Now this means that there will be 13 pixels of padding on the top and bottom. And this second part would mean that there's 13 pixels of padding on the left and the right. And if you just put one digit, that means there's 13 pixels of padding all around it. Now let's go and put these different paddings around lorem ipsum. Now it looks much neater. We can also put a margin. So let's put a margin and the margin also works in the same way. So suppose you were to say five pixels, that means it would give a five pixel margin all around your content. If you were to put say 10 pixels and 20 pixels, this means that 10 pixels of margin on the top and bottom and 20 pixels of margin on the left and right. And there's also another keyword that I want to make you aware of and that is auto. So what auto does is it gives equal amounts of margin however you specify it. So out here it'll give 10 pixels of margin on the top and bottom and equal amounts of margin on the left and right. So let's see how that works. Yep, so that's how it changed it. Now that was all about the box modeling. So let me just remove this part from the HTML and let's remove this part from the CSS. Now as you guys can see, I have this ordered list out here. First of all, let me reload the page. Now I have this ordered list out here, which shows us all the types of styles and weights and sizes that I'm going to be showing right now. And this will include a lot of the units that we discussed like M's, points, pixels and percentages. So let's move ahead. So to select these, I'll be using these IDs. So let me just remember the first four IDs is normal, italic, oblique and small cap. So let's go ahead and create them. So firstly, let's select our normal ID and say what are we going to try and show here is font style. So all you have to say is font style is normal. So normal basically means that the font style will be normal instead of something bolded. Then I think we had italic. So you go font style italic. Then we also had oblique. So you go font style oblique. And we also had small caps. So let me just see that again. Yep, it's small cap. So you go small cap and what are we trying to show in small cap is the font variant. So font variant small caps. So let me just reload and see how that changed stuff. Okay, so font style normal just stays normal while italic and oblique are almost similar. Then in font variant small caps, this is how it would look like where the first letter has a bigger font size and the rest have a smaller font size but everything is in capital. And next is the font weight. So let's see the IDs. It's normal, bold, bolder. So let's go with that now. So firstly we have normal. So font size is the size or weight. It's weight. So font weight will be normal. Next part is bold, bolder, lighter. Okay. So we select bolder like that. We go font weight is bolder and we can say again let's first after boulder it's bold okay we so w bold and you go font weight is bold let's see how that changes stuff so yeah bold is bold and font weight bolder is slightly more bolder while font weight normal is absolutely normal right time for some more so the next is the font size which goes from extra large large medium small extra extra small so let's do that so first is extra extra large and this is the font size that we're talking about so it's extra extra large there's also extra large so extra extra large looks something like this while only extra large looks something like this fine then we also have large so font size will be large so that's font size large Next, we have medium, small, and extra, extra small. So, medium, small, and extra, extra small. So, this is going to be font size medium. This is going to be font size small. And this is going to be font size extra, extra small. So, let's see how that changes stuff. So, this is extra, extra small. This is small, and this is medium. Now the next thing that we're going to see is how points work. So our size is going to be 25 points. So instead of just doing that, let me just change extra extra small. 
and let's say it's 25 points you should remember that one point is around two inches so that's how font size extracts the small would look like if it was 25 points then we could also say the font size is 150 percent so that shows us how percentages works where 100 percent means the current font size look at the change and that's how 150 percent means the next thing that we want to show is line height so let's say what is the ID let me just check the ID so the line height IDs are line normal height 25 points so let's just select one line normal and this is gonna have a line height of normal let's put a semicolon save it up and that's how line height normal is that is the normal line height now you could say your line height is 25 points and that's how it would change also you could say your line height is around 25 em or just 5 em let's say that and that's how it would change even more with em with 1 em being the constant font size that we are using or you could say line height is 200 percent that is basically twice of what our line height or font is and so that's how it would change right so that was all about text styling. Now let's move ahead and see how positioning and stuff takes place in CSS. So for positioning, I have again gone ahead and created this page3.html. So in here we will be including a CSS page called page3.css. So let's go ahead and create that. First of all, we have to set this to CSS. Save it as page3 and let's get started so first of all we have three types of positioning in CSS absolute fixed and relative so first of all I'm gonna show absolute positioning to you guys now before I show absolute positioning let me just show you guys how text and stuff can be centered first of all so let's start doing some random CSS so first of all we are going to target this ID called container so let's go hashtag container and let's go to background some random color so for color picker we just go color picker let's give us uh, this background go okay that's the background we chose let's also give it some borders border will be two pixels solid and black we can also set up a border radius so border radius gives you a curved border so you could say border radius is around five pixels let's say now let me just open up the HTML file that is concerned at this moment. So this is page 3. Okay, so this is with some CSS. Now let me just uncomment that CSS first. So this is what our page would look like without any sort of CSS. Now this is what it looks like with the CSS that we just included. Now to make you aware of how box radius works, let me just uncomment that first. Let's comment it out so box radius should not work and we should get yeah now if you see let's zoom in out here you see that this border is pointed suppose we don't want that to happen let's remove that first and let's uncomment this save it let's reload and now we have this slight little curved border which looks much neater okay now we can also center stuff so a neat way to do that is let me just show it to you let's take this part called centered now to center it let me just give it a first background to make it look different so this background will be let's say 89 CFF 0 so that's our color let's see what our color looks like so that is the color that we are gonna center now let's say our width is gonna be we can set the width of elements like this so you say width is 50% and then you go margin is going to be auto so what does auto do it'll put an equal margin on all sides let's reload our page yep and now it's centered we can also center without actually centering the element we can just center the text by just saying text align and center fine now that will remove the background and just keep the text out here so that's exactly what we wanted and that's how you align your text okay now let's move ahead with absolute positioning now absolute positioning means positioning based on the document itself which means this whole web browser so a browser is basically the document that you are actually manipulating so it's called document object manipulation if you've heard of that term so let's go ahead and let me just show you how absolute positioning works 
So first of all we have this element called top left and we're going to try and put it on the top left. So let's select that first. So you go top left. Now let's give it a background. Okay, that'll go to be the background. Now let's also give it a border. So let the border be one pixel solid and black. Let's say now to position something with absolute positioning, all you have to say is position is absolute. Now let's also keep the width around 200 pixels and the height also around 200 pixels. Let's save it. Let's see how stuff changes. Let me just zoom out. Yeah, so that is our element. So this is what top left and bottom right is going to look like. Now we are going to try and select this element and put it in the bottom right of this parent. So let me just show you how that is done. So to select that, I've already created an ID for it and it's called bottom right. Let me give it a background of white. And you say the position is absolute. Now we want to change the position to actually inside the element. So we have to say it's going to be zero pixels from the bottom and also zero pixels from the right. So since it is, has absolute positioning, it's going to position this inside of this. So first of all, let's give it a background of white and also make the color black. Right, and now we have this right where we want it. Now there's also something called the Z index. So Z index is what comes first on your screen basically. So if you have multiple things that are stacked on top of each other with absolute positioning, the one with the most Z index will be the one that is shown on top. So you can set a Z index like this and say the Z index is five. So anything with a Z index of four will actually come underneath this thing, right? So that was all about absolute positioning. Now let's go ahead and do some fixed positioning. So for fixed positioning we have this ID called fixed which contains a paragraph saying I'm staying right here. So let's select that first. Let me just remove all this stuff so that it's not cluttered anymore. Let me reload the page. Save it, reload it and that's how. So I'm staying here first of all. This is what is going to change. Fixed positioning. Right? Is that what we called it? Fixed position. Okay. Now, first of all, all you have to say is position is going to be fixed. Now, let's make it more prominent by giving it a background of black and a text color of white. So, let's see. This has become black and position is fixed. What do I do? If I'm scrolling, it just stays there. It doesn't really matter what I do to this thing. Okay, so that was all about fixed positioning. Now the next thing that we're going to see is relative positioning. So for that I already have two elements created. So let's say these are the divs which says this is going to be relative. So relative positioning as I was just saying is positioning based on the relative position of the element. So let me just show you. So relative one. Now let's go to background first. So let's just select some color. Let's make this green, this green out here. Okay, that's gonna be our color. Let's give it a border of one pixel solid black. And let's say the height is gonna be around 100 pixels. Now we're gonna select another element and position it relative to this element, okay? So that is this element uh, right out here is gonna be relative to. So to set something with the position of relative, all we have to say that the position is relative. And the less rest of the CSS is just arbitrary. So let's say left, not padding left. So you wanna position it somewhere, left of it and the positioning is going to be relative. So 20 pixels from the original positions, 20 pixels to the left from the original position I mean. And you could say from the top it would be around 30 pixels. You could also say negative 30 pixels to move it the other way around. Let's give it a background. I'm already given it a background. Okay, let's give it a background of yellow. So you say background equals yellow and you could also give it a border and say 1px solid. Blue. Let's get a blue background. Okay, so this relative layout is going to be positioned relative to this thing. Fine. Let's just reload and see. Yep, and that's how relative positioning works. Now this might just not look neat at this moment, but I'm trying to drive a point home. Fine. Okay. Now let me just see uh, if I have dog.jpg. Okay, there's a PNG file called edureka. 
let me just show you something cool. First of all, let me just remove everything from here. Okay, so now that our things are less cluttered, and let me just rename this now to the image that is already there. So edureka.png and edureka.png. Fine, let's save this. Let's see what our page looks like now. So this is what it looks like. Now you can float stuff like images to the left and right. So let's just select the image tag and suppose you say float them to the right. These will float everything to the right. Now that's how you position stuff or images with the float tag. So I guess that was all about positioning of stuff. Now let's move ahead. Okay, so in this part, we are going to be learning about overflows. So for overflows, what we can do, let's say, let's go back to page2.html and we have this text out here or this unordered list and this list is pretty big. Right. First of all, let's open up a new page or rather let's open up. Uh, okay, wait. Let me just close these out. So let's save this as page2 dot CSS or rather let's just call it something new. first of all let's set this to CSS right let's save it and let's call it overflow now what I want to show you guys is something really cool so let's select the ordered list so that's what we're gonna select let's say it has width of around 100 pixels it has some padding from the top and right so let's get some padding of 10 pixels and 10 pixels all around rather let's give it a margin of 100 pixels and auto so we'll bring it right to the center let's see so it was page 2 that we're fiddling around with so this is page 2.html now let me just replace this with overflow dot css let's see now yeah so this is what it looks like now if you see to scroll through this list is quite cumbersome because you have to actually scroll like this let's give it a background also background is going to be black as i just love black and the color of our font is going to be white see how that changed yep so this is what it looks like now what if you do and say max height is equals to 500 or rather only 200 pixels yeah, so that doesn't really do much. So if you say overflow is auto, you get a scrolling bar. Or you could say overflow is scroll. Let's remove this max height. Now you see we have these little scroll bars out here and that's what exactly overflow does. It basically shows us the items and you can scroll through them. Yeah, basically like that. So if you were to say that the width is only suppose 50 pixels, let's say, make this even smaller. Yeah, so that's how, it, now you have this little scroll bar and let's just scroll through stuff. So that's how overflow works. Okay, now let's look at some pseudo selectors or some pseudo classes that we can select and style. So first of all, let me open up the page that is going to be responsible for that. So we have this page out here that I've created. Now it also has some new tags that you might be seeing. These are some HTML5 tags. So header tag, nav tags, and then the main tag. These are just some new tags that you see in HTML5, and you can also target them through CSS3. So targeting them is pretty easy, but what I want to show is something pretty cool. Let's save it first. Let's create a new page. Let's call it CSS. Right, so let's save this first as page5.css. Okay, so now it's time to practice some more CSS and we'll be doing it on this page that I've created. So this page is kind of a big page, to be honest. It has quite a lot of paragraphs, quite a lot of links, a few images also, I guess. And they use a lot of the HTML5 tags that have been newly introduced, like the header tag, the nav ID, or the nav tag, the main tag, we have section tags, and a lot of other tags like these. Now these tags can also be selected with the help of, let's say, CSS3. That's what we are learning. Okay, now let me just remove this part because we won't be needing that. Now let's go ahead and save our content. And let me just show you what this actually looks like on the web page. So let's go ahead and open up page five. And this is what it looks like on a web browser rather without any CSS attached to it. So let's transform this thing with the help of some CSS. 
So firstly, we've created this page called page5.css and we've already attached it to this page out here with the link tag and the href attribute. Now let's get started. So first of all, let me just actually make use of some pseudo selectors. So we have already discussed pseudo selectors while going over the basics. Now let me just show you how they work. So a hover is going to target all the a links while we are hovering over them. Now when we are hovering over them, we want the background to become black and text to become white. Right? So let's save it. Let's reload. Now if we hover over these, the background becomes black and the text becomes white. Right now, the same thing can be done with a lot of other selectors like this is active. So when you click on a link, that means it's going to turn like that. So let's save it. Let's see. Let's reload our page. First of all, now you see when we hover, nothing happens. But once we click it, it becomes that black and white kind of thing. Right. We can also do this for visited and that will actually change the link when once it's been visited. So if we go and do this, open link in new tab. Well, it's not working out here, but if there was actually a database connected, you would actually see this too. Now, suppose we want to select our body. Let's give it a background first of all. Get out the color picker. Let's give it a nice green background. Okay, now that's going to be our background for the body. Now, we also have a div with the ID of wrapper. So, let's go ahead and select that first. So, we say wrapper. Now let's give it some CSS. So we are going to say margin is going to be zero and auto. Now whenever you say zero, you do not need to actually specify the units. So we can just do that. We'll give it a background color of white. Then we'll give it a width of around 800 pixels. We'll give it a height of around 1000 pixels. Okay, now let's save that and let's see what it looks like now. So this is what it has turned to. Now we can also do some more stuff. So let's select some HTML5 elements like the header tag and let me just show you that CSS still works as we want it to. So let's give it some simple padding around zero pixels on the top, zero pixels on the right and we want to give some 10 pixels on the bottom and zero pixels on the left too. See what changes. Now we got that little change. We can also select stuff like with the IDs as I just showed you. Now let's select the navigation, which has the ID of horse nav. Let me just check if I'm right. Yep, it's called horse nav with the N being capital. Now we can say stuff like, so there's also the display attribute. This shows how elements will be displayed. Now they can be blocked or inline block, which means it'll be converted into an inline element. Now we could say display is blocked. And you could just give it some background just to make it more apparent. So let's give it a background color of black and make the color white. Let's see. Yep, that's how it's selected. Now you can also give uh, pseudo tags like this one out here, like visited, to IDs too. So let's say once we're hovering over the nav bar, we want this to happen. So let's save it. Now if we only hover over it, Will the change happen? So that's how that works. Now let's go over and see some word spacing. Now word spacing is used for mostly specifying the words. So let me just remove some stuff from here. First of all, let's remove all this. Right, let's remove the header tags. And we just need this part where we have all these paragraphs. So I'll be targeting the first paragraph to show you all word spacing. So it's going to be this one out here, right here. Fine. Let's save it. Go ahead here. Reload the page. Now this is what it looks like. Let's remove everything that we have already created. And let's just select para 1. I hope that's what it was called out here. So it is called para 1 indeed. Now we can go word spacing and just say Let's say, let's give it 10 pixels between the words. Right, so the spacing between these words in this paragraph should change now. Now that we've saved it, let's go ahead and reload. So yeah, now you can see that the word spacing for this, this out here is much more different. Now we can also do letter spacing the same way. So let's select paragraph two for that. So for letter spacing, all we have to say is letter spacing and then we could say something like 10 pixels. Now this will specify the letters and how they are spaced. Now you can see it looks this horrible thing is having 10 pixels of letter spacing. 
I also put some word spacing into this so let's see how that looks like let's put a word spacing of 20 pixels and make this even more ugly yep so that's what it would look like with word spacing and letter spacing so that was just for experimentation purposes and you can use that whenever you feel free to okay so another property that I want to make you all aware of that is in CSS is a clear property so the clear property makes sure that nothing actually appears before it so in this case the footer tag which is right about here which says only the copyright part now it is shown here this is the footer tag that we are talking about so we want to say something like let's say so you can say clear and both so that's how you specify clears. Okay, so let's give it a background color of black. Let's also say the color of the text will be white. Just to make it a bit more prominent. Yeah, so nothing actually appears before that. So that's how you use clear now. So there's also style types, also list style types. So let me just see. We have these lists out here, first of all, which says random one, two, three, random one, two, three. Now let's say first of all let's convert this into an unordered list so find all let's gonna replace that with unordered list right I just want to show it with unordered list first so let's say let's select all the ULs and let's say list style is gonna be none now if you see out here we have these bullet points and now we don't okay so you can also do these with ordered lists so let's go back and let's do control and ul find all let's select them let's make them ols ordered lists let's see now ol doesn't work with list type none if you just realized now we can do something like alpha lower alpha so let's see that how that works okay so for lower alpha we have to say list style type please remember that that was my mistake right now okay if you have to select the ols again now you see that we have these list types that is saying with small caps now there are other stuff like lower latin also lower latin so let me just show you what that looks like save it okay that doesn't really change because i don't think i have latin installed but we can also go greek there's a bunch of stuff that you can do it's pretty fun so i have greek installed now it goes alpha beta gamma instead of abc and that's how you can change stuff you can also change the position of the list style so list style position you could say outside so let's see what that means and doesn't really change much out here but that's one of the properties that I just want to show okay now you can also place contents before an element so let me just show you how to do that let's clear all of these things now so let's say we want to select bar one and say so this is going to be a pseudo selector again so you say after you say content and your content is gonna be let's say add the rates so all these add the rates are gonna be before this little thing out here so let me just show you the change yep so since we said after it has all these add rates after but if we say before this is how it'll change so now it's all before them right okay now let's go ahead and see how we can use the nth child element so for that we're gonna select our ul again actually let me go ahead and delete everything first of all okay so let me create another html boilerplate and this is going to be called list first of all let's say we have an unordered list with a bunch of list items so allies all around let me just copy that down and paste it a few times right so now we have all these list items here let's just fill them up with some random text okay so let's just say something random like cats so let's save this let's go out here now we have these things called cats okay so what if we want them to have alternate paragraphs I mean alternate background colors so first of all let's go ahead and select the allies and give them a background let's say this gray color that I have selected f7 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 now you see we have okay this doesn't seem to be working allies looks like I've deleted my link tag that's why the CSS was not working so let's see now we have that okay so first of all let's go back and change this to f7 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 right this will give it this gray color that you see out here it's also give it the width of around 360 pixels so that'll bring it there 
let's also give it a margin of 100 pixels from the top and equal on the side let's bring it to the center right now suppose you want to say li nth child and you could say something like 2n so this will select all the even childs and you could say they have a background color of white so let's see how that changes things for us now you see that all these things out here have an alternating background color where it's gray, white, gray, white, gray, white. And that's how you select all the even childs. Now you can also select the first child by saying first child. For that we do not really need this 2n counter. And now only the first is black. You could also say last child and now the last will be white. And that's how stuff changes with CSS. Okay now you can also change the first line so let's go ahead and change our html up a bit so let's create a paragraph and it's gonna have some lorem ipsum in it so let me just show you something really cool let's delete all of this stuff let's select our paragraph and we're gonna say the serial selector called first line and let's say text transform uppercase so let's reload that first of all let me just comment this out just to show you what the page looks like without any css so this is our page without any css and let me uncomment this now save it and there you go the first line has been completely made uppercase now instead of first line you could also say last line last line and that will transform the last line to uppercase you could also say something like first letter and okay so just to show you that it does indeed work let me just reload this without any css first okay now you see that the lorem ipsum begins with the lowercase l now let me just uncom this out save it and now you see that the first thing is a capital you could also change it to say stuff like text size or rather font size and say around 100 pixels now the first letter will be 100 pixel big and that's how you can do stuff like that okay so another thing is you can also change the pointer or the cursor so let's see when you're hovering over a paragraph let's say p and hover first of all we want the background to become black we also want the color to become white and we want the cursor to become pointer so let's see so when you're hovering over it, it becomes this hand-like thing and when you go out, it becomes back to normal. So that's how you can change the cursor also. Now let me show you all something called a box shadow, first of all. So let's remove this cursor part. So without the cursor, it looks something like this. Let's remove the hover tag. So that's always there. Right. Okay, now let's also change this to that gray color that I really like. And let's also change this to black so this is what it looks like now let's give it a width of around 400 pixels so this is what it looks like now let's also center it so that i can show you some cool stuff so margin let's say zero and auto so this is going to center it from the top of the screen now that it's centered okay so this is what our thing looks like now suppose we were to give it a border so borders are really neat so 2px solid black so this is what a border looks like. But there are other stuff also, like a box shadow. So this is how box shadow works. It takes three parameters, so one is Z, X, and Y axis, and not really in that order, it's X, Y, and Z axis. And then it also takes a color. So let me just show you how that happens. So suppose we say zero X, zero Y, and let's say three pixels on the Z axis, rather five pixels to make it more prominent. And then it takes an RGBA of 0. We want to make it really, really invisible. So 0 0.5. So that gives it a half opacity. Now, you can see this really neat little shadow going all across our content. So that is what box shadow does. It's a neat little trick for when you don't want to use a border or something like that. Now, other than borders, there's also outline. Let's say an outline is black in color. So outline completely negates our box shadow and you could also say outline equals none so let's remove that now because box shadow looks really neat yep okay so now let's talk about text decorations so since we have some text already going up let's decorate it now there are a few kinds of text decoration that i want to show 
So the text decoration, let's see. So first C is line through. Just put a line through all of the content. So now it's all strike through. You can also say something like overline or underline. So let's see that. Underline will underline our text. Yep. And overline, as you might have guessed, will overline our text. Now everything has a line on top of it. Fine. Now we can also set the visibility of our text or any other tag to be honest. Visibility. So let's check out all the other visibilities that are there. So to do that. Always go on Google and type visibility and CSS. And let's see the visibility property and how it goes. So you must understand that knowing everything in CSS is kind of impossible. So you should always have a go-to or a backup. So my backup is normally W3School and they have everything regarding CSS and its properties. These are all the properties that you want to go through. And I'm mostly going through the most important ones in this tutorial that you may use in your day-to-day -day projects and topics. But sometimes you might need the rare ones like counter reset, empty cells, flex, flex bases, and all these stuff. And you can always go back to W3 schools and go through them. Now you can say visibility is visible or something like that. And it should make it visible. Yeah. Right. So that was all about the miscellaneous types of CSS that we were handling. Now let's go ahead and see some gradients and how we can create some beautiful gradients using CSS. Okay. Now before we move on to gradients, let me just show you some white spaces or some more text transformations. Right. So I already showed you all these text transformations. There's capitalize, there's lowercase, there's overline, line through, uppercase and underline. Now capitalize will just capitalize it. So I don't think I'm going to show that to you guys. Now let's close these two pages out here. Let's create our new CSS file and first of all let's set this to CSS. Let's save it and let's say it's going to be page 6.css. Now out here if you see we have a bunch of white spaces right. Now let's see how you can handle white spaces using CSS. So there is this thing called the ID called white space pre. I think that's exactly what it's called white space pre. Yep. Let's select that and you could say white space is pre. Let's see how that changes stuff. So first of all let me load up page 6 for you guys. Right. Let's remove the CSS. Save it. Let's reload it again. And what we are actually targeting is this part. White space will be preserved. Right. So white space will be preserved. Now go ahead and comment that. Save it. And let's reload. Now see the white spaces that are in the HTML is preserved. Now, white spaces can also be handled in other ways. So, there are two things that I want to show. So, let's select this thing called never wrap. Never wrap, right? And we say that the white space is going to be no wrap. So, let's see how that works. So, first of all, this is what we are actually targeting this Laura Mipson part out here. And it's somewhat like this. And let's see how it changes now. And now you see that it goes completely out to here. So no wrap. It doesn't wrap it around. So you also have pre-wrap. So let me just show you how that works. So I'm going to be targeting this part out here with these weird kind of white spacing. So let's see. Preserve wrap. So with preserve wrap, we go pre-wrap out here. And that's the property. So let's see. Yep. Lorem ipsum and the wrap has been preserved. Okay, now you can also set up the direction. So let me just show you how that's done. So we're going to select these two things out here, left, right, and right, left. So hash, left, right, and also control C. And let's make this right, left. Fine, let's remove all this stuff for now. And let's remove everything before right, left, too. Now that we've removed that, let's remove this. Let's save it. Let's see. Okay, so this is what it looks like right now. And all you have to say is direction is L2R. So that means left to right. Now here you say direction is RTL. Let's see how that changes stuff. So I prefer right to left and I prefer left to right. So that's how it's working. Fine. 
So that was all about white spacing and directions. Now let's move on to gradients and animations. So this is going to be the last part and the most interesting part in my opinion. So gradients are those beautiful backgrounds you see on most websites and to generate your gradient you can always use this thing called a gradient generator. So this gradient generator out here is a really nice gradient generator. You have to select the direction and you select the ending colors. So I've already selected a gradient out here. It's going to create this gradient. Now let's see. Go to page 7. Right. Now let's select the body tag. Let's close this off. Let's close this off. I want to save this and let's create a new page first of all and this is going to be our CSS so we have to save it and say page 7 right now we select our body and just paste in so let me just explain how this happens so there's a linear gradient and there's also another thing called radial gradient so I'll just show you that now this takes in a few parameters the first is to the right that's the direction and this is how the colors will change so let's just see how that works so first of all, let me comment this out. Let me just open page 7 for you. Now if you see, it's going to be a blank page. Okay, this is a gradient. I'm sorry. Let me save that. Right, so this is where it looks without a gradient. And you already saw where it looks with a gradient. But let me just show it to you again. This is where it looks with a gradient. Now you can also set the background with other stuff like a uh, image. So for that, you go URL and you can paste in the URL. So let's go and search for a beautiful image. I really like Dragon Ball Z. So Goku Super Saiyan 3. So that should be a good image to save as a background. So let's see. This looks like a really nice image. So you go here. Let me just save this image as. So this is going to be Goku. And it's going to be saved in desktop and in CSS tutorial. It's going to be Goku.jpeg. Right, so you can say Goku.jpeg. Right, now that's saved, let's go back to our page and it should have a picture of Goku. Okay, so that didn't work. I think I got something wrong. Let's go and analyze that. Let's open up our CSS tutorial. Okay, so it's a JPG file and not JPEG, so that was our mistake, small mistake nonetheless. And now we have this picture of Goku. Now you can also set the background repeat. Let's close this off, say background repeat, and you could say no repeat, and it will not repeat the background anymore. Or you could say background repeat is going to be, let's check out all the background repeats that are actually available. Now background and repeat so if you go into background repeat and see the properties you can just try it yourself so you can repeat it according to the y-axis you can repeat it according to the x-axis so let's see how that works so repeat x so if we say that I think it should repeat it on the x-axis like it was or you could repeat it on the y-axis I don't think that will show up out here but let's see yep it's now repeating on the y-axis so that's how background repeat also works so we've covered that too now we've also covered the gradients now it's time we do some radial gradient now if you remember let me just go back to the gradient part so if you have a radial gradient all you have to say is that it's a radial gradient out here and a radial gradient doesn't really need direction because it's going to be radial save it page and let's reload it okay now we have a gradial radius now you see all these lines going in but if I just zoom out you can see that it starts from the center and spreads out where it's white on the sides and white on the sides so that's how radial gradients work okay so now that we've covered the gradients let's go into animation so I think animation is the most interesting thing that you can do with CSS so we have selected the div so first of all let's give the div a border Mm, so this border is going to be 2 pixels solid and black now let's give it a background to begin with let's say it's going to be of red now this is how you do animations in CSS okay so before animations actually let me show you how you can move this thing around fine so there are some stuff that I want to show you guys so let this be. Let me just show you what this looks like. So let me give this a width first. It's going to be four, um, 100 pixels or rather 200 pixels. And the height will also be 200 pixels. Now let's see. 
Okay, we have this div out here. Let's make it a little bigger. Give it 500 and 500. Save it. Yep. Let's also make this much more prominent. Let's give it a 10 pixel background. I mean a 10 pixel border. And now you see we have a really prominent square out there. Now let's try some really interesting stuff. So let's say div and when we hover over the div you want to scale this. So scale and let's say we want to scale. Okay so that's not how you scale. First you say transform and how do you want to transform? You want to scale it and you want to scale it twice. So when we hover over it it should scale twice. Let's reload and as you see it's scaling twice. Now we can also transform some other stuff like this so we can rotate. So we can say rotate 45 degrees. Let's see when I hover it's rotating 45 degrees. You can also skew it. So skewing is how it works. Let's see. You can skew it 20 degrees to the x-axis and 10 degrees to the y-axis. Save it and this is how it gets skewed. This is how skewing works. You can also translate stuff. So this is, let me show you how translation works. So translate and let's see you want to translate the 20 pixels and 20 pixels. So let's see. Hover over it and it translates a little. Let's translate it around 120 pixels just to make it more clear. 120 and 120. Let's save that. Let's reload this and you see that now it's translating so much. Right? So that's how translate works. Okay. Now that I've showed you scale, rotation, skewing and translate. Let's see, we can also set up the transitions. So with transitions you can set up a lot of stuff. So now that we're done with transitions, let's go ahead and see some animation. So for animation, I'm going to be actually targeting this div out here. So let's actually style this div. I've given it the width of 100 pixels and a height of 100 pixels, and a background of red and a border of 3 pixels, solid and black, let's say, right? Let's see what that looks like. Now that's what it looks like. Fine. Let's zoom in a bit. Now all we need to do is actually set up some keyframes. So we do that by saying keyframes. Now we name our keyframes. Let's call it anime. And we have to set up actually what it will look like at different points in time. So we do that by saying 0% and it'll have, let's say, a background color of red and then it'll move no, so we want to move it in the square so let's say it'll be not padding rather it will be zero pixels from the left and from the top it's gonna be zero pixels let's save that copy that down let's paste that a bunch of times now what we want to say is this is gonna be 25 it's gonna be 50 it's gonna be 75 and this is gonna be 100. Let's save that. Let's change their colors. So this is gonna be yellow first. Then changes to green. Some pretty basic colors. Blue then. And in the end we'll change it to red. So that brings us back to the original position. Let's first also move it by 300 pixels. Then let's move it 300 pixels both ways. Now it's only going to move 300 pixels this way and in the end it comes back to the original position. Now to use this keyframes animation we have to give this animation name. It's going to be using the animation with the keyframes name anime. Now we can say the animation delay is going to be 2 seconds. You can also say how many times it's going to be iterating. So you can say that by 100. Let's save that. Okay so our animation is not working because we haven't set the positioning. So now let us just save this and let's say our position is going to be relative. Let's save that. Let's uncomment our animation. Now you see that our animation will work as we intended it to. So after two seconds our animation starts working and this will just keep going on and on. Now if you want to actually repeat that animation there's a way you can do that and that is with the animation iteration count. Let's say you want to iterate it a hundred times. Let's reload. Let's wait for two seconds and voila our animation will keep going on and on and on. So that's how you animate stuff with CSS guys. So what is JavaScript? Now the first thing that pops into your head is probably it is Java. So guys, let me tell you that JavaScript has absolutely nothing to do with Java. So why was it named JavaScript? Well, it was sort of a marketing strategy. When JavaScript was first released, it was called Mocha. It was later renamed to LiveScript and then to JavaScript 
when Netscape and Sun did a license agreement. Now let's not get into the details of that. Now what is JavaScript? In simple terms, JavaScript is the language of the web. So basically every browser, PC and mobile phone understands JavaScript. It's like a universal language. So what is JavaScript used for? It is used to make web pages more interactive. Let me tell you that majority of websites use JavaScript and all major web browsers have a JavaScript engine to execute it. Another feature is that it's an interpreted language, which means that it doesn't have to be compiled like languages such as C and Java. This makes it a lot easier for us because we can just run our code and we don't have to run it through a compiler. Now, another important feature of JavaScript is that it is mainly a client side scripting language. Thanks to JavaScript frameworks, you can now run JavaScript even on the server side. So let me tell you a few more things about JavaScript. So where does JavaScript run? JavaScript runs on a browser. So all you need to do is open up your Google Chrome or your Internet Explorer and start running your JavaScript. All right. So how do these browsers run JavaScript? So these browsers have a JavaScript engine embedded into them. Now this engine will just convert your JavaScript into machine language and then run the code. All right. Moving on. We all know that there are hundreds of programming languages and new languages are being created every single day. And among these, there are very few powerful programming languages that bring about big changes in the market. And let me tell you that JavaScript is definitely one of them. JavaScript has always been in the list of popular programming languages and developers are falling in love with this language. They practically use it everywhere. They use it on the web, mobile servers, applications, and even in IoT. Now, this is probably why it's the most popular language in the world. According to Stack Overflow, for the sixth year in a row, JavaScript has remained the most popular and commonly used programming language. Now let's look at a few common applications of JavaScript. So what can JavaScript do? JavaScript is known mainly for creating beautiful web pages and web applications. An example of this is Google Maps. So if you want to explore a region or a specific area in Google Maps, all you have to do is click and drag with the mouse. And what sort of language could do that? You guessed it, it's JavaScript. Next, JavaScript is also used in smart watches. An example of this is the popular smart watch maker called Pebble. Pebble has created Pebble.js, which is a small JavaScript framework which allows a developer to create an application for the Pebble line of watches in JavaScript. So a lot of developers have actually built smart watch applications, features and such things using the JavaScript. Up next, we have websites. Now, let me tell you that most of the popular websites like Google, Facebook, Netflix and Amazon make use of JavaScript to build their websites. I think that's enough proof for why you should be learning JavaScript. Now, among other things like mobile applications, digital art, web servers and server applications, JavaScript is also used to make games. Isn't that amazing? Now, we're all aware that the browser has not been a traditional games platform but recently it has become a robust host for games. A lot of developers are building small scale games and applications using JavaScript, and I'm sure all of you can do it too. It's quite simple. Now let's talk about some popular JavaScript frameworks, which are the most favored platforms for developers and business in today's time. AngularJS is Google's web development framework that has exploded with popularity in recent years. AngularJS provides a set of modern development and design features for rapid application development. Let me tell you that a lot of developers swear by this framework because it has a rapid development pace. Another top JavaScript framework is the ReactJS. It stands behind the user interface of Facebook and Instagram, showing off its efficiency in maintaining such high traffic applications. Despite the fact that React has a higher learning curve, it makes application development straightforward and easy to understand. It also performs very good in search engine optimization. So guys, by now all of you are aware that JavaScript is used as a universal scripting language in browsers, mainly on the client side. Using it on the back end to save time and build expertise is one of the major ideas behind the Meteor. So finally, front end developers can also work on the back end comfortably with Meteor without switching context between Java, Python, PHP and whatnot. So it basically gives the flexibility to use one language everywhere. I'm sure you all have heard of jQuery before. 
whenever someone wants to extend their website or their application and make it more attractive and interactive, they make use of jQuery. Now, this library transforms the whole web into an entertaining experience. A fun fact about jQuery is that over 70% of the world's leading websites have something to do with jQuery. Companies like WordPress, Google, and IBM rely on jQuery to provide a one-of-a-kind web browsing experience. Now, anybody who's heard of JavaScript knows that it has something to do with HTML and CSS. So what is this relationship between these three? Now, let me put it down to you in simple words. Now, think of HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language, as a skeleton of the web. So basically, HTML is used for displaying the web. Next, CSS is like our clothes. We put on fashionable clothes to look better. Similarly, the web is quite stylish. It uses CSS, which stands for cascading style sheets, to look better or for styling purpose. Then there is JavaScript. Now, JavaScript puts life into a web page. Just like how kids move around using the skateboard, the web also motions with the help of JavaScript. So JavaScript is basically for interacting with the web. Now, before getting into the advantages of JavaScript, let's look at a few common websites that are building the JavaScript and JavaScript frameworks. So we have Amazon, which is an e-commerce website. I'm sure all of you have shopped from here. Then there's PayPal. There is YouTube. We all are addicted to YouTube. There's eBay, Netflix, and Reddit. So guys, this is enough proof that JavaScript is a very important language. When such reputed companies and brands make use of JavaScript, it means that it has something really nice about it or something very advantageous about it. With this in mind, let's look at a few benefits of JavaScript. Now, it's quite easy to learn. In fact, it's one of the simplest programming languages. It does not have a strict syntax and it's totally readable. You don't have to be some hardcore programmer to learn JavaScript. Let me tell you that it is a weak type language, unlike the strong type programming languages like Java and C++, which have strict rules for coding. Now, the next feature is speed. Guys, it's all about being faster in today's world. And since JavaScript is mainly a client side programming language, it is very fast because any code functions can run immediately instead of having to contact the server, send a request, get an acknowledgement and then wait for an answer. All right. Now, JavaScript comes with a rich set of frameworks like Node.js, AngularJS, React, and there are hundreds of such frameworks. Earlier in the session, I discussed about how efficiently these frameworks are used to build web applications, server applications, and perform different tasks. JavaScript framework is one of the major reasons behind the popularity of JavaScript. Now, the next advantage is that it makes web pages more interactive. So guys, we are all attracted to beautifully designed and interactive websites and JavaScript is the reason behind such attractive websites. Building such interactive websites not only makes the web prettier, it also attracts leads and customers to e-commerce websites. So like I mentioned earlier, JavaScript is an interpreted language that does not require a compiler because the browser interprets the JavaScript. So all you need is a browser to run JavaScript and you can do all sorts of stuff in your browser without the pain of setting up environments, code editors, downloading compilers, and then learning how to use them. So instead of all of this, you can just open up your browser and start running JavaScript. So among many other advantages is the fact that JavaScript is platform independent. JavaScript is supported by all browsers like Internet Explorer, Mozilla Firefox, Google Chrome, Safari, etc. So any JavaScript enabled browser can understand and interpret JavaScript code so you can run it on any platform. All right, so now that you have a good idea about what JavaScript is and how it works, let's get on with the coding part. I'm going to cover a few basic programming concepts of JavaScript, and these concepts are quite similar to the C language. So let's get started. So guys, let me tell you that every browser has a JavaScript engine, and we can easily write JavaScript code over here without any editors or tools. So this practice is not meant for real world applications, but I'll just quickly show it to you. All right. Open up your browser, Internet Explorer or Google Chrome will also do and right click on the page. Click on inspect. So this will open up the Chrome developer page. All right. Now go to console. This is basically the JavaScript console. Now let's see how to run JavaScript on the browser itself. So let me just type a statement and then I'll explain what it does. Now, basically, this is a statement in JavaScript. 
so what i'm doing here is i'm going to log this message hello world onto the console all right so i'm going to log hello world onto the console that's what this function does okay now this hello world is enclosed within brackets and within quotation marks and in javascript we always practice to terminate our statements with a semicolon now let's press enter so here you can see that it's displaying hello world all right so this means that javascript works on our console so this is how browsers are embedded with javascript engine so that they can run javascript code now to write javascript code you require a code editor you can choose from a variety of options like visual studio code sublime text and so on but for today's demo i'll be using the visual studio code but feel free to use whichever editor you want visual studio code is basically a simple light weighted editor and guys i'll leave a link in the description box if you want to download the visual studio code you can go ahead and check the description box all right so i've already downloaded the visual studio code now let's create a folder okay we'll create a new folder to store the code that we'll be executing so create a new folder you can name it whatever you like now just drag this folder and drop it over here all right so here you can see the folders created now we've got the folder open let's add a new file index.html to this folder Now you don't need to know HTML to follow this tutorial. I'm just pasting a basic HTML code here. You don't have to care about this code. It's just for creating a simple web page. All right. Now over here, I'm just using a header in order to display JavaScript tutorial. And then within paragraph tags, I'm just displaying with Edureka. All right. You don't need to have a knowledge about HTML for this tutorial. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use this HTML page as a host for our JavaScript code. All right. Now make sure to save the changes. Now open up extensions tab over here. This is the extensions tab. Now search for live server. So guys, I've already installed the live server, but make sure you go ahead and install this right away. Live server is basically a lightweight web server that we're going to use to serve our web application. All right, install this and restart your Visual Studio Code. Once you open Visual Studio Code, go to your index.html file, okay? and right click on this and now you can see this option open with live server you're going to get this option only after you install live server so make sure you do that first so open with live server yeah you can see this page the html page is over here now you can even check the console from here this is the javascript console all right so this will just open up uh, your default browser and direct it to this address all right now this address is where our application is served from Okay, so here you can see the console as well. Now let's write our first JavaScript code. So go back to Visual Studio. Okay, now guys, let me tell you that there are two ways of adding your JavaScript code in the HTML file. First of all, you need to know that your JavaScript code is always written in the HTML file or it is at least linked to the HTML file. Okay, so like I said, there are two ways of adding your JavaScript code in the HTML file. Now the first is to use script tags in the body section and type your javascript code within this script tag so let me show you how that's done now this is the body section the body section starts here and it ends here okay so you have to make sure that your script tags are within the body section now let's open script tags now in the first method you're going to type your entire javascript over here so within the script tags you're going to type your entire javascript so let's just type a simple line so we executed this earlier let's just do that let's log a message to our console all right so let it be hello we'll see if this works guys don't forget to terminate a statement with a semicolon all right now save the file and open up your browser here you can see that it's displayed hello all right this means it works now let's go and try the second method now in real world application the javascript code will have hundreds and thousands of lines and it is not a good practice to type your entire code over here all right so what we can do is we can open up a new file from the explorer window all right let's go here open up a new file let's name it hello.js all right it's a javascript file now what we'll do is we'll copy this code and let's paste it over here now you have to reference this hello.js file in your html file so how do you do that 
Okay, so let's add an attribute over here. This attribute is SRC. All right, SRC stands for source. Now SRC equal to within the quotation marks, we're going to write down the name of the JavaScript file. So hello.js is the name of my JavaScript file. Let's close the tags. Okay, wait, this is opened up again. Okay, yeah, let's close the tags. And this is the second way. So we're basically referencing hello.js from the HTML file. Okay, now let's save the changes here. And now let's check our browser. Yeah, you can see that it's printing hello. So both the methods work. So I hope you understood that there are two ways of adding your JavaScript code to your HTML file. The first way is to write the entire code within script tags. And the second way is to reference a JavaScript file in your HTML file. So guys, I hope you have a brief idea about how JavaScript works and how you can use your browser to run JavaScript. Okay, so now let's get on with our JavaScript fundamentals. I'm going to discuss variables, constants, and a few other concepts over here. Okay, so what are variables? Variable is a name given to a memory location which acts as a container for storing data. Now, what does this mean? Let's say that I want to define a variable called name and I want to store a name in it. Let's say the name is Edureka. Okay, so I'm going to declare a variable called name and I'm going to store Edureka in that variable. So name is the name of the variable and Edureka is the value of this variable. Okay, so what's happening here is a temporary memory location is assigned to the name variable and this name variable is going to contain a value which is Edureka. Okay, now let's perform this practically so that you understand it better, which is constants. So what are constants? Constants are fixed values that do not change during execution time. Now, there are times when we don't want the value of a variable to change because it might disrupt the whole workflow. In such situations, we make use of constants instead of variables. Okay, now here you can see the syntax of constants. Now, in order to declare a constant, you use the keyword const. All right, you use this keyword. Now let's practically do this and see how it works. All right, so I'm going to create a new file to do this. I'll name it constant. Okay, now let's declare a variable. So for declaring a constant variable, make sure that you use const keyword. Okay, so I'm declaring a constant variable here. Now uh, let's say it's pi. Okay, I'm going to assign a value to pi 3.14. Now, what happens if you try to change the value of a constant variable? Let's try to do that. Okay, we change the value. Now let's, okay, let's log this to the console. Save the changes and make sure you change the path in the HTML file. So here it's still linked to variable.js. Change it to constant.js. If you're creating a new file, that is. All right, now save the changes here as well. Now open up your browser. Here you can see type error assignment to constant variable. All right, this error is because we try to change the value of the constant variable. It was declared as constant using the value 3.14. And then we try to change it to 3.12. That's why we have the error. So guys, you use constant variables only when you want to keep the value of a certain variable fixed. All right, it cannot change. So that's when you use constants, okay? I hope you all are clear. Let's get on with our next topic. Okay, primitive data type. Now guys, there are different types of values that you can assign to a variable, all right? Now in JavaScript, we have two categories of data types. One is primitive data type and the other is reference data types. Now primitive data types include numbers, strings, boolean, null, and undefined. Reference data type on the other hand includes objects, arrays, and functions, all right? So now let's look at these primitive data types from Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to create a new file again. Give it any name you like. All right. So for this, you'll have to define a variable. Now to define a variable, you use the let keyword. This is the name of my uh, variable. Now in this, I'm going to store the value Harry Potter. All right. Terminated with a semicolon. So guys, here it's a string because we are using quotation marks we are enclosing the value within quotation marks so the computer is going to consider this as a string so even if i had let's say if i have something like this what do you think this is do you think this is a string or do you think it is a number okay let's check all right now let's log this on our console and see let's log age as well as 
let's log name save the changes make sure you change the reference over here all right so it's constant let's change it to primitive save the changes here as well open up your browser so it's displaying the two values okay now let's check the type of these variables type of age it's a string even though it is one over here it's still a string why is that that is because we enclose this one within quotations so whatever is enclosed within quotations is going to be considered as a string all right so we discussed numbers and strings so far let's look at boolean let's define a variable called option okay so basically guys a boolean is used whenever uh, there is a logical situation or a logic code that needs to be executed so if a particular condition is met or if a particular condition is true then the following code will be executed in such situations you make use of boolean and boolean can have only two values true or false so this is a boolean now the next type of data type is undefined now what is undefined i'll show you let's define a variable height now let's log both of these variables and we'll see the type of these variables okay so option then let's also log height save your changes open up your browser here you can see true and you can see undefined instead of printing anything it says undefined why do you think that is it's because we've defined height without initializing it at all so we have not set it to any number or any value that's why it's undefined so this is an undefined data type so if you don't initialize a data type it's called undefined okay now the last one is null now let me show you an example all right so here i'm just uh, defining a variable called eye color and i'm setting it to null now we use null whenever we want to explicitly clear the value of a variable okay that's when we use null so i hope you guys are clear with the primitive data types now let's move on to our next topic arrays so what are arrays arrays are basically used to store multiple values in a single variable so if you have a list of items let's say that you went shopping for some art supplies and you got a paint brush you got a canvas you got some palette you got pencils and you got spray paint now you want to list these down in one variable now to understand this better let's go to visual studio code and let's execute some code so add a new file called array i'm going to define an array called shopping all right now in order to define a variable you'll have to use the let keyword and you'll have to use the square brackets over here this is how you define an array okay now square brackets are because you have to store multiple values in an array so an array is basically used to show multiple values of a single variable okay so shopping is a variable it has multiple values now let's define the values in the shopping variable so the first value let's say it's paint brush now i'm going to add a comma and add another value a comma is needed to separate two values okay let's add color palette add canvas okay so we have three items in our shopping list now let's just log this on the console save your changes make sure you change the path in the html file array all right save it open up your browser now here you can see that it's displaying the entire array now guys let me tell you that arrays are numbered from 0 so 0 is the first element 1 is the second element 2 is the third element even though there are three elements in the array the number of the last element is 2 that's because you start numbering an array from 0 okay so guys now how do you access an array element let's say you want to access color palette you want to display color palette how are you going to do that now in order to do that you are going to write the name of the array and within square brackets you're going to put the number of the array element so if you want to display color palette the number of color palette is 1 so you're going to type 1 over here okay close the parenthesis semicolon enter see it displays color palette so this is how you access array elements okay so if you want to access only one element then just mention the number of that element and that element will get displayed Now let's just play a little bit with arrays. Let's define a few other arrays. Let's see what else arrays can do. So let me show you another example. 
now i'm defining an array called numbers so guys this is how you declare an array you use the let keyword name of the array equal to square brackets and you terminate it with a semicolon okay now let's add array elements so i'm going to randomly add some numbers all right these are my array elements now let's add two numbers and display them on the console okay so how do you do that so let's add one let's add this element and this element all right so how do you access this element you just have to write the name of the array open square brackets and write the number of the array 0 plus numbers at position 1 so you're basically adding 1 and 3 all right save the changes go to your browser here you can see the answer is 4 all right now let's try some other thing let's try to sort these elements for that you use a function called sort now sort is a predefined function so this sort function is going to sort this array all right save your changes let's look at the log yeah so it's sorting this array in order one two three four five seven now we know that six is missing here so let's add an element to the array so how do you add an element to the array so first you type the name of the array dot push all right a push is a function which pushes an element to the array all right now which element you want to push is going to be written within these parentheses so six let's push okay now let's check the array save your changes go to your browser now there are seven elements all right so you can see six over here now guys let me show you another example now with arrays in javascript you can have variables with different data types in one array itself. So a single array can have variables with different data types. Let me explain this with an example. So I'm declaring a array called mix. All right, now let's list out the elements of mix. So first I'm going to list out a string, okay? Then a number, then again a string. Okay, now let's log this to our console and see what happens okay so this is the mix array so here you can see that it has four elements let's check the type of the first element how do you do that so you write the name of the array and you open up brackets and you write the number of the array which is zero so this is a string correct now similarly let's check the type of the second element this is a number so now we know that within an array we can have variables of different data types okay all right guys with this we are done with arrays now let's look at our next topic now our next topic is objects now what is an object an object in javascript is a lot like an object in real life for example let's consider a girl okay now this girl has a name she has a age she has eye color let's say her name is emily her age is 15 years old and she has brown eyes so what did I just do? I basically declared an object, which was a girl, and I list down her properties, which is her name, her age, and her eye color. So girl is the object, name, age, eye color are her property. So this is how an object works, okay? Now what are objects? Objects are variables too, but they contain many values or many properties, okay? And each property will have some value. Now let's look at this with an example. So guys, I'm going to create a new file called objects now how do you declare an object so i'm going to declare an object called pen equal to you're going to use curly brackets to define an object okay as soon as you use these curly brackets it means that you're creating an object called pen okay and this object can store a lot of properties and each property will have some type it's like key value pairs where key is a property value is a value of that property so let's say that this pen has the first property of the pen is the type okay so i'm going to write ball point now you separate different properties with a comma okay now the second property is probably the color black all right now let's define another property called cost now know that over here i haven't enclosed 10 in quotation marks because this is a number it's not a string okay guys remember that 
So guys, also terminate this with a semicolon. Now, what did I do here? I created an object called pen. This pen has three properties. Okay, the three properties are type, color, and cost. Now, the property type has the value ballpoint. Similarly, the property color has the value black, and the cost is ten. Okay, so this is how you define an object. So the object is a pen. It has three properties and values. What if I wanted to display the cost of this pen? I just want the cost of this pen, not the entire object. Okay, so how do you access an object? Now this is the syntax for accessing an object. Object name dot property name. Okay. Now there is another way of accessing. This is known as the dot notation, and the other way is like this. Object name. You use square brackets within which you write the property name. All right. This is the other way. Now I honestly prefer the dot notation because I feel it's simpler. Okay. So now let's try to display the cost of the pen. Okay, so how do you do that? First, you write the object name, which is pen, dot the property name, which is color. Sorry, then the property name, which is cost. Okay, now I want to display this, so I'm going to put this in the console dot log function. I'm going to put this in the console dot log statement. All right, now save the file. Make sure you change the reference in the index or HTML. So change this to objects. Save this. Open up your browser. Here you can see it's displaying 10. Okay, so that's how you access object properties. Okay, now let me show you another example of objects. Okay, so now let's define an object called Emily. Okay, now this object has a few properties. So properties and the value of those properties. Because it's a number, I'm not putting it in quotation marks. Then let's define cool, which is another property. Say she goes to DPS. And then there is class. Let's say tenth standard. All right. Now the next property is subjects. Now I have more than one subject. That means I have more than one value to this variable. Now how do I store more than one value in this variable? So guys, do you remember I spoke about arrays? Arrays are used to store multiple values of the same variable. So let's define this as a array. So this is how we define an array. Let's add physics. Now add comma after every value. So physics, then chemistry. Let's add biology. Let's add maths. So don't forget to terminate this over here. Now. Oh, I've typed out the wrong spelling for physics. Okay, so guys, let's say I want to display chemistry. How would I do that? So how would I do this? So like I said, first you're going to write the object name dot the name of the property. Name of the property is subjects. Now this is an array element. So in subjects, we're going to access the second element. All right, the number of the second element would be one. Okay. Now, in order to display this, let's put it in this statement. Now, save your file. Open up Chrome. All right, there is an error. What exactly is the error? Okay, guys. So the error is over here. I forgot to put a comma. So after every property, you're supposed to put a comma. So I forgot to put a comma here, and that was the error. Now let's save the file and let's open up our Chrome. So here you can see that it's displaying chemistry. Okay, so that's how it works. With this, we are done with the objects. Let's move on to our next topic. Now the next topic is functions. Functions are basic building blocks in JavaScript. It is basically a set of statements that perform some task. Now let's see this with a few examples. Let's go to our Visual Studio Code. Now let's add a new file. I'm going to name it function. Dot js. So how do you define or declare a function? So in order to declare a function, you have to use the keyboard function, space the name of the function. So let's say hello. All right. Now after this, you need to add parentheses. All right. And then curly braces. And within the curly braces, you're going to define the body of the function. Now let's just say that this is just logging some message on the console, like hello. All right. Now I've created a function for this. 
Now let's call this function. So how do you do that? You write the name of the function with the parenthesis and then you end it with a semicolon. Okay. Now save the changes. Make sure you add function over here in the HTML file. Save the changes here as well. Now here on the browser, you can see that it's printed hello. Okay. Now what's the point of this function? Let's do something better. Okay. Let's make a better function. Let's say we'll create a function for uh, multiplying uh, two variables. Okay. So let's say that we'll create a function for finding the product of two numbers. Okay. So for that, you use a keyword function. I'm going to name my function product. Now within these uh, parentheses, I'm going to declare two variables. Okay. Now these variables are called parameters. So I'm going to pass two parameters to my function. Now let me get on with it. You'll understand it better. Now what this function is going to return is the product of A and B. So A star B. All right. Now let's call this function. So how do you call a function? Name of the function. And over here, you're going to pass the value of to these variables. Now these variables have not been given any value. Here I just define these variables and they're just known as parameters. These variables are known as parameters. Okay. Now let's pass some value to these variables. Let's pass two and six. Okay. End it with a semicolon. Now these values are known as arguments. Okay. So when you call a function, you pass arguments to that function. But when you define a function, you pass parameters to that function. Okay. Let's save this and let's open our console. Wait a second. Yeah. I forgot to print it. Now let's store the product in some variable. Let's define a variable. Let's say X. Okay, so I'm storing my product in a variable called X. Now let's log this variable on my console. Save the changes. Go to your browser. Here you can see 12. All right. So this is how you pass functions with different parameters. Okay. Next we have conditional statements. Now condition statements are used to perform different actions on different conditions. So if is used to execute a block of code only if the condition is true. Okay. So basically if a condition is met, then the statements within this block will get executed. This is the syntax of the if statement. So basically if is a keyword and within brackets, you're going to define the condition. Now if this condition is met, then this statement is executed or a set of statement is executed. Okay. So this is how it works in the program and you start the program and when the execution comes to a condition, if the condition is true, the code within the if block gets executed. All right. And it ends there. But if the condition is false, you just exit from the if block. All right. Let's look at this practically. So let's create a new file called if. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to define an array. Now let's add numbers into the array. So I'm randomly going to add some numbers. Now let's add some condition over here. Now if here I'm going to define the condition which is number and zero is equal to equal to number at place two. Then just display some statement. All right. So let's say correct. Okay. So what is happening here? Now I'm basically defining a condition within the if statement over here. And this is a statement that's going to get executed if this condition is met. So the condition is that the number at location zero, which is this number, if this number is equal to number at location two, which is this number. So if these two numbers are equal, then it's going to print out correct. All right. Now these equal to equal to sign is used for comparison. So it's used to check the value of this variable and value of this variable. If these two values are the same, then the condition is met. All right. Now let's save the changes we made here. Also remember to go to your HTML file, change the reference to if.js. Okay. Save the changes, go to your browser. Here you can see that it's displaying correct. Now this was the if conditional statement. Now where do I use the else statement? Now else is used to execute a block of code if the same condition is false. Okay. So this is the syntax of if else. So if there's some condition there, if that condition is met, then this statement is executed. Now, if this condition is not met, then if you want to do something else, you use the else statement. So when this is false, 
this will happen okay so instead of exiting you're going to perform another operation let's look at the flow chart when you're executing the condition and if the condition is true you're going to execute the block of code within the if block okay now if the condition is false you're not going to exit instead you're going to execute another block of code which is in the else if block okay now let's look at this practically now within the same file itself i'm going to show you how this is done now let's define a condition if numbers at this place is equal to equal to then it's going to print correct otherwise now if this condition is false then it's going to print this console dot log wrong try again all right that's simple let's see if this works okay save your file open up your browser okay there is some problem over here let's go back to the code okay my mistake save the file open the browser now it should work let's just comment this out otherwise you'll get confused i'll just write here this is the if else block if else example all right let me save it open your browser see it says wrong try again so this is how the else statement works all right now you can even play around with a few other examples let, let me show you a few other examples okay now let's give two conditions within the if block okay now let this be the first condition so how do you add another condition you just use the and operator okay let's add another condition over here okay uh, i'm making a mistake here the array name is numbers so i've added two conditions over here now only if both of these conditions are met this statement is going to be executed okay else we are going to now let's save this okay we'll just comment this out so that you don't get confused all right so save the changes open up your console okay there is some error so it's basically something i did while naming so this is an error because i forgot to add an s everywhere okay now i'm saving the changes this should work okay so it says wrong try again now this is wrong because both of these conditions weren't met i'm using the and operator here so it's compulsory that this condition is true and this condition is true okay so if you use the or operator here instead this is the or operator okay if you use the or operator here instead this should work see it displays correct okay or means that one even if one of these statements or one of these conditions is true then this is correct okay so guys with that we are done with if else statements now let's move on to loops so what are loops loops are basically used when you want to run the same code over again each time with a different value so that's when loops are used now loops are of three kinds there is for loop there is while loop and there is do while loop okay now let's look at each loop one by one so first we have the while loop now what happens here is while basically loops through a block of code as long as the specified condition is true okay so while this condition is true this loop code is executed when you execute the condition and if the condition is true the conditional code will get executed otherwise if the condition is false you're just going to end or you're going to exit from the loop okay now let's look at a practical example of this so create a new file called while.js so guys before moving on to an example let's discuss the do while loops also a basically do while is just a variant of the while loop now this loop will execute the code block once before checking if the condition is true then it will repeat the loop as long as the condition is true okay so over here you can see the syntax within the do loop you have some code now this code is executed once and only after that the condition is checked now if the condition is true then you're going to execute it again but if the condition is false you're not going to execute it but this code is definitely executed at least once okay that's the difference between do while and while so the loop code is executed at least once in the do while loop okay now let's do this practically now let's define a variable i and initialize it to zero okay 
now within my while loop i'm going to define a condition which is while i is less than 5 it has to do this now the statement here is it has to display this the number is and it has to display i okay so plus i and let's increment the value of i okay now let's save this now let's look at the while loop now within the while loop i've defined a condition which says while i is less than five it has to perform the following code first i've set i to zero so then i is less than five meaning zero is less than five now this is true so it's going to execute these two statements so it's just going to print the number is zero and then it's going to increment the value of i so now i will become one over here it'll go back to this loop and it will check if one is less than five which is true so it will execute these two commands similarly it'll keep going till i is equal to four i is equal to four it will execute this but when i becomes five five is not less than five so this will not be executed okay now let's just save this and let's change our path in the index.html to while. Save this as well. Open up your browser. See, it prints till number 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. It does not print number 5 because 5 is not less than 5. Okay. Now let's do the same thing using the do while loop. Now for the do while loop, first you're going to define the do block. Now over here, let's copy paste this code over here. Okay. Now after the do loop, you're going to put the while condition. Okay. So let's give the condition as i greater than 5. Let's see what happens. Okay. So what is going to happen here is first, it's going to execute these two statements. Okay. It's going to print the number is 0 over here because we've initialized i to 0 over here. Okay. Then it's going to increment i to 1. Okay. Then it's going to come out of the loop. And then it's going to check the condition is one greater than five. Now that is false, so it's going to end over here itself. Okay, now let's just comment this out so that you don't get confused. Okay, we'll comment this whole thing out. Now save the changes, open up your browser. See, the number is zero, it's printed only once. Okay, now that's the difference between while and do while loop. Now next we have for loop. Let's look at for loop. So what is for loop? So for loop basically repeatedly executes the loop code while a given condition is true. So it tests the conditions before executing the loop body. Now here you can see the syntax of for loop. Within the for loop, there is a condition which is begin separated with a semicolon. Then there is condition semicolon and this step. And then there is loop code. Okay. Now this begin statement is executed one time before the execution of this code block okay so before this loop code is executed this condition will be executed once okay now let's look at the syntax for the for loop now this for loop has three statements within the parenthesis okay now begin is executed one time before the execution of this code okay now this condition defines a condition for executing this loop code the next is the step. This is executed every time after the code block has been executed. Okay, so after this is being executed, this is executed. So guys, I know this is sort of confusing. Let's practically do this. You'll understand it better. So now I'm going to create a new file called for. Now let's declare a for loop. So use the keyword for and then you put the first statement or the first condition, which is i is equal to zero okay now the next one is i is less than five next one is i plus plus make sure you separate these conditions or these statements with a semicolon okay you have to put a semicolon over here now open up your loop code now within the loop code just let's perform the same thing that we did in the while loop all right so the number is Oh, we've actually forgotten to declare i over here so let's declare i first let i so yeah i've declared i over here so guys you don't have to declare it over here specifically you can do that of course but you can just declare i over here itself let i is equal to zero you're initializing i and you're declaring it okay so what happens here is first i is equal to zero you're defining a variable i and you're initializing it to zero once you initialize i to zero it's going to execute this statement once 
okay so it's going to execute the statement once after that it will go to this condition is i less than 5 is 0 less than 5 which is true so it's going to execute this statement okay now after this is executed it's going to execute this third statement which is i plus plus okay so the value of i is going to become 1 and the same thing is going to happen again and again let me explain this one more time so first you're initializing i to 0 when you execute the first statement this code block is executed once all right after this it checks this condition is i less than 5 if the condition and only if the condition is true this statement will get executed now after this statement is executed this third statement over here will get executed all right i hope that is clear let's save the changes and let's also change the reference over here all right save the changes here as well yeah here you can see that it's displaying it five times okay so that is how for loop works okay now you can do a lot of things with for loop so let's say that your teacher has punished you because you talk too much in class and she's asked you to write i'm sorry 50 times so can you use for loop to do that well you can definitely use for loop to do that let's try and see how that works okay now we're going to do the same thing set i to zero then i is less than 50. well only if your teacher is kind enough she'll ask you to write it 50 times otherwise 100 times is the minimum all right now within the code block let's log this message okay so first we're going to i'm sorry and let's put a smiley as well okay so i made a mistake over here okay so this is how it works let's save this code and you know let's comment this out okay now let's check our browser so you can see that i'm sorry is displayed so many times <laughs> so guys that's a simple hack with this we complete our for loop now the last topic of discussion is switch cases so switch statements are used to perform different actions based on different conditions okay now how does switch statement work now here you can see that this is a syntax now after the switch there is an expression and there are few cases case one case two case three and default and so on okay whenever case one is true the code block one will get executed similarly if case two is true code block three will get executed now how does this work now what happens is the expression within this switch statement is executed once. okay after that the value of the expression is compared with the value of each of these cases okay so this is the value of the cases this expression is compared with the value of the cases so if there is a match this block will get executed so basically the value of the expression is compared with the value of the cases so if there is a match then the associated block will be executed so if the value of this expression and the value of this case is the same then this code block will be executed okay let's try this with an example so let's create a new file called switch okay let me type out the code and then you'll understand what i'm saying okay okay so that's a long code but this is very simple now what i've done here is i've defined a variable called games and the value of that variable is football okay now i'm passing this variable into the switch statement so basically the value of games is football over here now if the value of this expression matches with any case then that block will get executed now here the value of games is football correct so you're going to look for football now the case over here is football so basically this is going to get executed okay now let's just save and let's run the code you'll understand what i'm talking about so guys make sure to change the reference over here save it and let's check the logs see it prints i love football so why did it do this exactly now it did this because the value of this expression matched with this case okay because it matched with this case the statement within that case got executed okay now if i change the value to foosball okay let's see what happens we'll save it 
it says i like other games now this was the default statement now this default statement is executed whenever this expression does not match with any case okay because i'm not given foosball anywhere over here it executes the default statement so this is how the switch statement works now before i move on i wanted to tell you that i'll be making use of visual studio code which is basically a code editor to run code snippets that i'll be explaining in this session so if you don't have visual studio code y'all can go ahead and download it or use any other editor of your choice now guys before i start off with the session let me show you how visual studio code looks so i'm just going to open up this editor now guys this is a very simple editor and you know i think it's my most favorite editor you can use sublime text or any other editor that you are comfortable with all right so this is how it looks now what i've done is i've already copied a folder called jquery all you have to do is create a folder on your desktop and then drag it and paste it over here okay so i've already created a folder because i think it's a good practice to have a folder that contains all your code snippets all right now guys if you downloaded visual studio code you need to make sure that you have uh, installed an extension called live server all right so i've already installed this live server now this will basically host our web page so whatever we type out or whatever code we have over here it will get hosted using this live server so make sure you install the live server in order to host your uh, web page or whatever you create okay so that's about visual studio code now without any further ado let's get started with our first topic so what is javascript now in simple words javascript is a universal language of the web which every pc every mobile phone and browser understands now javascript is mainly used to make a web page or an application look more alive and interactive so every time you see a really cool web page with a lot of motions and graphics it's because javascript was used to design it Now another important feature of JavaScript is that it is an interpreted language unlike the high level languages such as C C++ and Java. Now these high level languages require a compiler. Now when it comes to JavaScript you don't need a compiler because JavaScript runs on the web and most of the web browsers like Google Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer, Mozilla Firefox already have a JavaScript engine embedded into them. Apart from that JavaScript is mainly a client side scripting language. So guys I hope with this you're clear with what is javascript I hope you have a brief idea about javascript now if you want to learn more about javascript I'm going to leave a link in the description you can check out our content on javascript so you can learn more about it all right so why you jquery now we all know that there are hundreds of javascript frameworks and libraries out there but why must you use jquery well for starters jquery makes it extremely easy to manipulate the dom now dom basically stands for document object model Guys don't get intimidated by the name I know it sounds like it's a very complex concept but it's very easy all right I'll be explaining the dom in the further slides so stay tuned Now dom is basically like a tree structure of the html elements Now in order to make a web page interactive web developers manipulate the dom and jquery makes it extremely easy to do that Now apart from that the community of its contributors is more diverse and bigger than any other javascript library It has detailed and comprehensive documentation which gets better every day. Now another bonus point is that jquery has thousands of plugins available for free and they can easily be added to our projects. So these plugins add value by enhancing user experience. Now one such example is the Ajax technology which develops a responsive and feature rich site. Okay? Moving on jquery also provides cross browser support. So basically every time you write a code on your local machine and you want to run it on a browser like Google Chrome, Safari and all of that, you don't have to worry about whether your code will run on different browsers because jquery takes care of the dependency issues. Now this is because it supports almost all the commonly used browsers. All right? Now guys, I hope all of you are clear with why we should use jquery. Now let's look at what is jquery. Now jquery is basically a fast concise javascript library with a nice motto which says write less and do more. Now that is very apt because its entire functionality revolves around simplifying each and every line of code. It simplifies the dom manipulation, event handling and basically every other thing. Now jquery offers a very effective way to capture wide variety of events such as a user clicking on a link without the need to clutter the html code. jquery takes care of all the complex things in between 
Also, an add-on is that jQuery is a lightweight library of about 19 kilobytes in size after compression. So this makes it faster to load the library and also takes up minimal resources. Now jQuery also comes with hundreds of built-in animation effects which you can use in your website to make it more interactive. Alright, so guys, I hope all of you are clear with what is jQuery. Now let's move on to installing jQuery. Now there is no installation per se, this is just downloading jQuery. Now let me tell you that there are two ways of doing this. Alright, the first is a local installation wherein you copy the jQuery library on your local machine and you include it in your HTML code. And the other one is linked to a CDN. Now CDN stands for Content Delivery Network. So you can include jQuery library into your HTML code directly from the CDN. So basically this is like a link to your jQuery library. Okay, now let me show you how you can do this. All right, so this is how the official website of jQuery looks like. Now here you can go on download. So over here you can see download the compressed production jQuery 3.3.1. So this is probably the latest version of jQuery. So what you can do is you can either click on this and you can copy this entire library. This is basically the jQuery library. You can copy this entire library and you can paste it within a file over here. Okay, so I'm going to paste it within this jQuery folder that I created. Okay, you can paste it in a file. Let's name it jQuery. So what you can do is you can copy that entire code and paste it in this file. But this is not something that we're going to do because let me tell you that if you copy this entire thing and you paste it in your folder, you can easily go and edit it by mistake. Let's say by accident, you click on something and a small line gets deleted or a small element gets deleted. So your entire code is going to get messed up because your jQuery library was tinkered with. Okay. All right. So we're not going to follow the first method. Instead, we're going to do the link to a CDN method. Now I've created an index.html file within which I have the link copied over here. Now this is basically the jQuery library. You can see the version is 3.3.1. And also I have another link which is for the UI, jQuery UI. All right. Now guys, this integrity and cross origin is just so that nobody manipulates the contents of these libraries. All right. So I've copied this link from somewhere on the web. I don't remember, but I'm just going to paste this link in my description box. So y'all can go ahead and use this. Otherwise, if you find a better link, then y'all can use that as well. Okay. So this is basically my HTML file. So guys, I'm not going to obviously discuss the basics of HTML and CSS because that's not under the scope of this session. So I hope all of you have a basic understanding. If y'all don't have a basic understanding of HTML, CSS and JavaScript, like I said earlier, I'll leave a link in the description box. You all can go and check out that video and then come back to this video. All right. So guys, that's how you download jQuery. It's not like an installation. It's basically downloading the jQuery. Okay. So now let's look at the document object model. Now the document object model is a tree structure of the various elements of HTML. Here you can see that it begins with document. This is basically this. This document is basically the ancestor of every other element in this file. And this HTML again is the ancestor of all of these other elements. Okay. Now the head and the body elements are children of the HTML element. So this is basically like a tree structure. So basically title is a descendant of head. Similarly H1 and the P tags are children of body. Okay. So they are just descendants. Now guys, this is a simple tree structure and this is what document object model is. It's not any complex concept. It's a very simple structure of your HTML file. Now let's move on to jQuery selectors. Now the first thing we're going to learn in jQuery is the selectors. Now why do we need selectors? These selectors allow you to select and then manipulate the HTML elements or the DOM elements. Now all that a web developer has to do in order to make a web page more interactive or just create a web page for that matter is to make sure that the DOM is easily manipulated. Only when you add effects into the DOM, you can make any changes on your web. So that's why we use selectors. So basically selectors will select a particular HTML element and then you can use other functions on this HTML element and manipulate that element. All right. So what we're going to do is we look at examples. We'll type out codes and we look at examples. So don't get too confused. Okay, so I'm going to open up my file. So let's open a body tag. Now within the body tag, I'll have a header. I'm going to have a H1 tag, which will basically say jQuery tutorial. Okay, guys, the Q is always caps in jQuery. 
So we'll have a header which says jQuery tutorial and let's have a simple paragraph by Edureka. All right. In order to make things a little more interesting, I'm going to create an unordered list. Now within which I'm going to have a few elements in the list tag. So let's say I'm going to list my favorite dogs. I know there are no favorites when it comes to dogs because all dogs are really cute. But uh, if I had to list down three favorites, I would definitely go with these three. Okay, golden retriever. I'm quite old fashioned when it comes to dogs. I really like golden retriever, even though there are new breeds right now. But I think this one's really cute. And then uh, Siberian Husky. So guys, you can make it interesting and put in a list of whatever you'd like. Like you can put in list of your favorite fruits or your favorite colors, anything like that. Okay. And let's say boxer. Close the HTML tag. So I'm just going to save this file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reveal an explorer. So basically, this is how our web page looks. Now, like I mentioned earlier, most of the browsers like Google Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer have a JavaScript engine embedded into them. So this is a Google Chrome browser like you all can see. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on anywhere on the page and I'm going to click on inspect over here. OK, so this opens up my JavaScript engine. Now, this is basically the file. All right, one second. Okay, there was a small error because I had opened up a CSS file which I had linked. Okay, guys, just ignore that error. So now what I did here was I opened up the JavaScript engine. We have a JavaScript console over here. It says JavaScript contexts. Now what you can do is you can manipulate the DOM elements through this console. So basically you can run different commands over here. You can type something and you can run it. Now just like in the vanilla JavaScript, we need to select things and manipulate them. In jQuery, we can select anything we want by using this dollar sign. All right, so this is the dollar sign or the dollar function that you can use to select anything. Now, in regular JavaScript, we have functions like document dot get element by ID, query selector all. Then there is get element by class, get element by tag, and there are hundreds of such functions. But when it comes to jQuery, the dollar function basically replaces all of these other functions. Okay, now let's look at an example. So let's say I want to select this header, header one. This is H1 tag, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type the dollar sign first. We'll open up brackets and within quotation marks, we're going to type whatever we want to select. All right. So what I'm doing over here is I've used the selector function and within the quotation marks, I mentioned H1. So what this does is it will basically select the H1 tag for me. Okay. So let's click on enter. Now, when I click on H1, you can see that it highlights my header one tag. OK, it also shows me the dimensions of the tag. And this is how the selector basically works. Now, let's try selecting the body. Now that I've selected the body, you can see that it highlights the entire body and it shows me the dimensions of the body as well. OK, so guys, this is how the selector works. Now, let's make things a little more interesting. OK, let's just go back to our Visual Studio code. Now what I'm going to do here is within my first list element, I'm going to add an anchor tag. OK, let's say we randomly add an anchor tag and we're basically directing this to Google.com and let's call it Google. So guys, I hope you all understand basic HTML because I'm not going to explain the HTML. It's going to be a very lengthy video if I sit and explain HTML to you all. So for that, I told you all that I'm going to leave a link in the description. You all can refer that link and you all can understand HTML. So I saved the file. Now I'm just going to refresh. OK, so here you can see the anchor tag, which is Google. Now let's say that I wanted to select this anchor tag. OK, now we previously saw how to select the H1 tag. We saw how to select the body. OK, but what if I want to select this particular anchor tag? So what I can do is I'm first going to type out unordered list. You have to type out the path to your anchor tag. Now in order to specify the anchor tag, what I'm going to do is I'm going to specify that the anchor tag is within a list li and in turn this list is within an unordered list. OK, so it's basically like specifying the path to this anchor tag. Now because there's only one anchor tag in this entire list, it's going to select this anchor tag only. So let's see how that's done. So you simply type out ul li and a. So this is your unordered list. This is your list item and this is your anchor tag. Now let's click on enter. So when I click on a, you can see that it highlights my anchor tag 
it also gives me the dimensions along with it so guys this is how it works now let's make it a little more interesting now let me just type out this code first and then i'll explain what it's doing so what i'm going to do first is i'm going to select the header okay h1 tag and then i'm going to apply a method to this i'll just type it out first and then you all can understand what i'm saying so what i'm doing here is i'm selecting the h1 tag using this dollar function after that to this h1 tag i'm going to apply this method dot css method now within this method i've passed a parameter and a value to that parameter so the parameter is color or the property is color and the value of the property is red so what this line is going to do is it's going to change the color of the h1 tag to red okay let's see if that works all right you saw that this turned to red so guys this is how you can play with the selector it basically manipulates the dom okay so this is what i meant when i say manipulating the dom now let's make it a little more fun and let's say we change the background color also okay we'll change the background color to black so here you can see the result so guys basically the selector is just to select a dom element and then manipulate it in whichever way you want okay so this is the most basic concept of jquery understanding the selector is very important because you're going to use selector at every line of jquery so with that we're done with our selectors now let's look at our next topic now we're going to discuss a few jquery methods now one of the methods that i already discussed is the css method i just showed you all how css is used to style a particular header okay but we'll come back to this later on now similar to that we have other jquery methods like the before method after method now what does a before method do now this method inserts a specified content before the selected element now this is the selected element now before the selected element it's going to add this content so whatever content you want to add before a particular element you mention that content within these parentheses okay now let's look at it practically i'm going to open up my browser all right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to select my unordered list and before my unordered list i want to add something before my unordered list so how i can do that is i'm just going to mention whatever i want to do so within h2 tags i want let's say my favorite dogs and let's close the h2 tag so what i did here was i basically selected my unordered list first and on my unordered list i'm going to perform this function now what this does is it adds whatever i type within these quotation marks before my unordered list okay let's just see how it works so here you can see that right before my unordered list i have my favorite dogs now similar to this is the after method okay let's go back to the slides now the jquery after method inserts a specified content after the selected elements okay so this is the selected elements and after the selected elements it's going to enter this content okay let's look at how this works we'll look at the same example so what i'm going to do is i'm going to change this to after okay and let's say i type are adorable enter okay so you saw that it says my favorite dogs blah 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 are adorable okay so guys this is how before and after functions work so these are just simple examples of how before and after work so up next we have text now a text function is used to set or return the text contents of the selected element so let's say we have a selected element over here and if we pass this text method on that selected element it's just going to return the text of this element you can also set or replace the text of a particular element by using the text function okay let's not get too confused i'll just open up my browser and show you how this is done let me just refresh my page okay let's look at an example so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use a selector and i'm going to select the list of elements within the unordered list so i've selected li and i'm going to use a text function over here okay let's see what this returns okay so over here you can see that it's returned golden retriever google siberian husky and boxer okay let's do one thing first let's remove this anchor tag because it does not make sense okay so i'm just going to save my file and let's open up the browser refresh and let's run this command okay 
So here you saw that it returned golden retriever, Siberian husky, and boxer. Okay. Similarly, let's say I just want to return the first element of my list. Then I would do something like this. So what I did here was I selected list, and in that I mentioned first. Okay. So I basically mentioned the first element of the list. Now this returned only the golden retriever to me, which is exactly the first element of my list. Here you can see that golden retriever. Now let's say that I want to replace some content. Okay, let's say I want to replace this by Edureka with something else. Okay, let me just refresh. All right. So how I'm going to do this is first always start off with the selector. So I'm selecting my P, which is my paragraph tag. Now since I have only one paragraph within this entire HTML file, it knows that it's this paragraph. Okay, so let's say there was another paragraph over here. Then what you would do is you would mention paragraph colon first and you'd uh, perform an action on it. Okay, so yeah, let's coming back to this. I'm going to say text. Welcome to this fun tutorial. So what I've done here is I've selected the paragraph tag and then I've applied the dot text function on this tag. Now let's see what this does. Okay, let's click on enter. What happened here was by Edureka was replaced by welcome to this fun jquery tutorial so this is how you use the text function to either set or to return some content all right so guys i hope all of you are clear with this now let's look at our next function okay the next one here is html now the html method is very similar to the text it is used to set or return the html content of the selected elements now let's look at the difference between the two now first let's look at an example of how HTML is used to return the content of a particular element. So let's say li last dot HTML. So what I've done here is I've selected the list and from the list I've selected the last element and I'm running HTML tag on it. So this returns boxer. Y'all can see that it returns boxer. Now let's see how you can set the content using HTML. Now what we're going to do is we're going to change this last element over here which says boxer. We'll change it to something else. So guys, bear with me when I type the code. So I'm going to replace boxer with German shepherd. Now let's click enter. Here you saw that it got changed to German shepherd. Okay, so this is how you set the content using HTML. Now what is the difference between HTML and text? Okay, let me show you what the difference is. Let's say I'm going to select the entire unordered list. And I want to return the value using text. Now, when I return the value using text, you see I get this. But when I do the exact same thing using HTML, let's see what happens. So I'm selecting the unordered list and I'm running the HTML function on this. Now, here you saw that it's returning the HTML tags to me along with the text content. Over here, it just returns the text content, but over here, it will return the HTML content as well. Okay, so you can see that li and nli is not there over here that's because it returns only the text content this will return the html content as well okay so guys i hope all of you are clear with the difference between html and text moving on to our next function is the css function now i already showed you an example of this css function but what exactly this function does is it styles a particular element so whatever element you select is styled using css so if you see any color or any pop in your page or any sort of design, very pretty design on a web page, it's because CSS was used. Okay. Now what this jQuery CSS method does is it sets or returns one or more style properties for the selected elements. Now let's quickly look at an example. So what I'm going to do is let's clear this unordered list. What I'm doing here is I'm creating a script tag. Now guys script tag is always used uh, in order to run some javascript or some jquery script so over here i'm going to create an object using the let keyword so i'm using the let keyword to create an object and the name of the object is design and let's define some properties of this object let's say that the color is blue and let's define another property like background Let's set background to green. Let's define another property which is border. We'll set this to let's say three pixels solid black. 
what I did here was I created an object. I created an object called design and I've given this object three properties color background and border. Okay. Now these three uh, properties have particular values. So colors value is blue. Similarly background color is green and the border is so on. Now let's just save this file. I know you all are confused wondering why I'm doing this, but just give me a second. So what I did was I saved this file. Now let's open up our terminal and we'll select. Let's say we'll select the header one tag. Sorry, I forgot to add the selector function. So we've selected the header one tag and on this we're going to apply a CSS function. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass an argument to this CSS function. Now what we're going to pass is we're going to pass the object that we just defined. So we created an object called design wherein we had three different set of properties which had different values. So we're just going to apply these values and properties to this H1 tag. So let's click on enter and see what happens. So you saw that the background color, the font color and a border was added to this. Now this happened because we had created an object with color, background color and border. So we just applied all of these properties to our H1 tag. Okay, it's as simple as that. So guys, this is how the CSS function works. It's basically for styling your web page. Okay, so your web page looks more prettier with the help of CSS. Now let's look at our next topic, which is attributes. All right, now the attribute method is used to set or return attribute values of the selected element. So let's say you select a HTML element and that HTML element may have hundreds of attributes. So you're going to select a particular attribute of that HTML element and you can return it using the attribute function. You can also use this attribute function to set an attribute to the element that you selected. So let's not get too confused with definitions over here. Let's just execute this and see how it works. All right, let's go back to the Visual Studio code. Now, in order to make it a little more interesting, let me just clear this entire thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to display pictures of three puppies and we're going to work on those three puppies. Okay, we're going to work on the images. We're going to try and add borders to those images. Okay. All right. So first thing what I've done is I've created a folder called puppy where I have three cute pictures of a golden retriever, a boxer and a husky. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this folder and I'm going to paste it over here within the jQuery folder. All right, so here you can see that I've added the puppy folder which has three different images. Now what we're going to do is we're going to display these images. Now in order to do that, I'm creating a div and I'm assigning a class to this. Let's name it puppers. So now I'm just going to add these three images. So I'm going to use the IMG tag. I'm going to set the source. So the name of the folder is puppy slash, let's say, goldie.jpg. It's a JPG image. So let me just copy paste this. And similarly, I'm going to add the other two images also. So the other image is husky. And then there is a boxer as well. Now let's go ahead and save this first and okay so what I've done is I've moved this to the root folder so let's just save this and let's refresh all right so guys I was facing a problem it wasn't loading for some reason so I just opened my jQuery folder on my computer and I just copied the puppy folder into that okay so this is basically the index.html file we're writing and I've also copied the puppy folder within this which has three images. Okay, now this should work. So here you can see that within jQuery folder, I have a puppy folder and I have the HTML file. Okay, let's save this. Now this should definitely run. Let's uh, reveal an explorer. So you, now you see that we get three cute puppies. Guys, how adorable are they? To make it look a little more presentable, I'm just going to align these images uh, horizontally. Okay, so that it's clearly visible. So in order to align them to the left and also I'm going to set their uh, width and their dimension. So what I'm going to do is I'll open another file. So guys, like I told you all earlier that CSS is used for styling purpose. So I'm going to open a CSS file over here. Okay, so this is the symbol. Uh, this means that it's a CSS file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the class puppers and within this class, I'm going to say float um, left. So what I did was I selected the puppers class which I had defined within the HTML file. 
So here you can see that the class of the div was puppers. So I'm just selecting this entire div and I'm just floating it to the left, meaning that I'm going to align it to the left. And also let's set the dimension of the images. So I'm going to mention the image tag over here. I'll set the width. Let's set it to 300 pixels and also the height. All right, let's say 250. So let's save this file and we need to link this CSS file in our HTML file. So guys, don't forget to do that. A lot of people miss out on the step and then they wonder why their code is not working. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to add a link of my CSS over here. So it is a style sheet. So for those of you who don't know, CSS stands for cascading style sheet. I'm also going to write the type. It's a good practice to mention the type. So it is text slash CSS. And uh, also let's mention the path. So the name of my file is index.css, correct? So that's about it. Now let's save this file and let's open it up. All right. So guys, now you can see that they're beautifully aligned to the left and they all look so adorable. So guys, don't get distracted. Let's focus on our task over here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the console over here. So let's apply this attribute function to these images. Now, first of all, let's select these images. For that, you're going to use the selector function. And within the quotations, I'm going to write img dot attribute function. So what I've done here is I've selected all of these images and uh, I'm applying the attribute function with the following properties. The attribute that I'm going to change is the border. So I'm adding a border and I am setting the border to this value. So it's a five pixel solid black border okay so guys this is how the attribute works now let's click on enter let's see what happens so here you can clearly see that i have added a black border one second let me make it more visible yeah see it looks much better so what i've done is i've added a border black border of five pixels and a solid border okay so guys this is how the attribute function works now let's go back to our next method all right so our next uh, method is the value method now this is basically used to set or return the values of the selected elements. Okay, so here you're just going to return the value. You're not going to return the attribute or you know, you're just specifying the value of the attribute and you're going to return this. So we're going to try something different over here. So in order to run a code on this val method, I'll have to tell you what is a click function. Okay, so what is a click event? So let's go to the click slide. All right. So here is the jQuery events list and the first one is a click event. Now this event is executed when the user clicks on the HTML element. Okay, so you basically select an element using the dollar function. And then when you click on this element, some function is performed. So I'm briefly telling you what this does because I'm going to be using the click function. Now let's open up our file. So we're going to type in something different over here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear this entire thing. Let's clear the div element and I'm just going to add script over here. Now script tag is used to add your jQuery or your JavaScript code. So I've just opened up my script tag. Now over here, I'm going to type a function. All right. So what I'm doing is I'm selecting the entire document dot ready. And then there's a function over here. All right. So guys, before moving on, let me tell you what this document dot ready function does. Now it's a very good practice to have this function in every file of yours, but I forgot to mention it earlier. So it's a very good practice. Now a page cannot be manipulated safely until the entire document is ready. So basically what jQuery does is it detects the state of readiness. Now whatever code you include inside this document dot ready function. So whatever code I'm going to type over here basically in these lines, it will run only once the page is ready. Okay, so basically the code that you include within this function. So let's say I type something over here. Okay, whatever code I'm typing over here, all of this code will be executed only after all of this is executed. So only after loading all of these jQuery libraries and frameworks, only after that, whatever is mentioned within this document dot ready function will get executed. Because let's say that I wanted to run a jQuery function over here. Okay, some jQuery function and I just ignored this line and I didn't have a document dot ready function. 
Now what happened was, let's say that for some reason, this library took a lot of time to load. And by the time it loaded, this jQuery function was already executed. Now obviously that's gonna return an error because it's gonna say that there is no jQuery library or something like that. Because this library was not entirely loaded. Okay, so that's why you need a document.ready function. Okay, so guys, I hope you all are clear. Now this is a good practice to include. It's not mandatory, of course but it's always good to have document.ready function at the beginning itself okay so after your title after you load the libraries you should always add in this document.ready function it's a good practice all right so before we type out the code over here i'm just going to create a button and an input type okay now input type will basically create space for user input so my input type is going to be text so the people who are familiar with um, HTML, CSS know what I'm doing exactly. So I'm giving some ID to this input and also let's give it some value. Okay, it's blank value. So whatever you enter here is going to be saved. Okay, so I created an input type over here. Now also I'm going to create a button. Okay, so you use the simple keyword button and you just type the name of the button. Let's say submit. Now let's come back to this function. Now what I'm going to type here is I'm going to start off with selecting the button. Okay, so it's selecting the button and now I'm adding the click function over here. So guys pay close attention to what I'm doing here. Okay, so basically I'm selecting the button using the dollar function. What I'm saying is when you click this button, a particular function will get executed. Now let's type out the function that gets executed on the click of the button. So click is basically an event. So on executing this click function, some event occurs and that event I'm going to type over here. Okay. So what it's going to do on the click of a button is it's going to give out an alert with the value dot val. So this is where I'm using the value function. All right. Now let's close. All right, so what I'm doing here is on the click of the button, this event is going to occur. Okay, so you're going to get an alert saying value and wherein the value is going to be this some text identifier. So whatever value the user types in is going to get passed over here. Okay, and then this dot value function is going to return that value to you. Now don't get too confused. Let's save this and we'll run this and you'll understand exactly what I'm saying. All right, so what I'm going to do here is see this is the input wherein the user types input and this is the submit button that we created. So let's say hello. Now let's click on submit. Okay, so when I clicked on submit, this is what happens using the click event. So basically an alert is shown wherein the value is returned. So whatever input is given by the user is returned using the val function over here. Okay, so you see it says hello. Let's say Edureka. How are you doing? Okay, submit. So this is just returning the value that I'm typing in the input. So guys, this is how the value function works. All right, it's very simple. It just returns the value. Similarly, you can set the value as well. So I want you all to try something with setting the value. And please comment down whatever you've tried or any new program that you've run using the val function or any other function. We'll be very interested to know how you have used these functions to build your own program. Now the next function I'm going to talk about is the add class method. Now this basically adds one or more class to the selected elements. So you're going to select an element using the dollar function and whatever element you select, you're going to add a class to it by simply using the add class method. Now let's look at this through an example. So first of all, let's just clear this entire thing. Okay, so now similar to the previous example, we're going to load the images of all the puppies. So it has a class called puppers. Okay, and we're going to add all the images. Okay, so puppy, coldie. Okay, similarly, I'm going to have the other two images over here. Okay, and the last image, which is a boxer. So I'm selecting the puppy folder and then the boxer image all right so i created a div similar to what we did in the previous examples now i'm going to open a script tag before i type out the entire script i'm going to have a button right so let's add a button over here 
okay let's name it try add class now that we have the script all right now within the script what i'm going to do is i'm going to start off with the document dot ready function now earlier i already explained the use of this ready function so um, that's exactly what i'm doing here all right now over here i'm going to first start off with selecting the button on the click of the button some function is going to be performed okay and what is that function so basically on the click of a button an event is going to occur and i'm going to type out that event over here okay now before i type out the event let's define a style class okay now the style tag is used if you want to uh, specify some css code now you can obviously open another file called css and enter the entire thing but uh, it's a small code so i'm just going to type it over here itself so i'm creating a class called style class all right and what i'm going to do is i'm going to define some property called border and i'm going to assign a value to this property let's say 5px solid green so this is what is there in the style tag okay now coming back to this function so on the click of this button an event has to occur and i'm going to type out that event over here so what i'm doing is i'm selecting all the images first and then i'm using the add class method and i'm passing this style class function that we just created okay all right now let's close our parentheses over here so what i'm doing here is on the click of this button and on these images you're going to run the add class method now to this method i've passed a class called style class and within this style class i have created a border of 5 pixel solid green okay so don't get too confused let's save and open the file okay so what happened was on the click of this button all these images were selected and a border was applied to all of these images okay now this border was specified within a class called style class which we had created over here okay so guys this is how the add class method works now let's go back over here and let's refresh first okay now along with add class we have remove class and we have toggle class as well now remove class will basically remove that class which you just added and toggle class will toggle between adding and removing the class okay let's just look at how this works okay to the same example let's open up the console all right now what i'm going to do is i'm going to select all of these images okay and then i'm going to do remove class style class now what i did here was i selected all of these images i'm running the remove class method on all of these images and i'm passing the style class as an argument to this method so first of all let's add it and then we'll see how the remove class works and uh, you can see that every image has a green border now let's do remove class okay so you saw that the border was removed now let's do toggle class okay so when i did toggle class it got added again okay so if i do toggle again it will remove the border similarly again it will add remove okay so guys this is how add class remove class and toggle class works now let's get back to our next topic which is jquery events okay now i've already explained the click event to you but we're still going to run a program and see how this works now what the click method does is it's basically an event when you apply the click event to a selector some function occurs or some event occurs okay and that event is specified within this function now let's look at an example so first of all i'll just remove the style which is not needed and then this button is also not needed so we do require these images let's just keep this as it is now what we're going to do is we're going to edit this script path so instead of having button over here we're going to select images so on the click of images some event is going to occur that event is specified within this function so let's type out that event what i'm doing is i'm using a this keyword and i'm adding an effect called hide all right now let me tell you what this does so basically on the click of an image this event is going to occur 
Now this basically denotes whatever element you're currently selecting and that element will be hidden using the hide effect. Now hide is basically a jQuery effect. Now this is used to hide a particular element. So whichever element you've selected over here is going to get hidden using this hide effect. Now I'll be explaining hide show and all of these other effects in my further slides. So for basic understanding, just know that this hide effect is just going to hide a particular element that you've selected. Okay, so I've saved the file. Now let's just open it up. So what I'm going to do is let's click on each of these images because we've added an event on each of these images, right? So let's click on this image. So you saw that it got hidden. Similarly, the other two images also get hidden. Now this is happening because on the click of an image, I'm going to hide that image. Okay, now this is just used to record my current event. So basically on the click of the images, those images are going to get hidden. Okay, that's exactly what we did here. Let me show it to you once again. So I'm clicking this image, it gets hidden. Similarly, this and this. So guys, I hope all of you are clear with the click event. Now, similarly, we have on. Okay, now this method attaches one or more event handlers to the selected elements. Now, whenever you have on, a lot of people get confused between click and the on event. Now, on is used to specify other event handlers. So you can use on along with click and along with key press. Now, key press is the next method that I'm going to discuss. So I'm going to be running an example where I'll show you how to use key press and how to use the on event as well. Now, key press basically executes whenever a character is entered. So basically, whenever you press a key on the keyboard, some event is going to occur with the help of key press. Okay, so guys, it's quite explainable. If you just read the name of the event itself, you'll understand what it says. Okay, now key press is a combination of key down and key up. Let's not get into too much detail. So I'm just going to create an example where I'll be showing you how to use key press and how to use this on event. Okay, so let's open up our Visual Studio code. Okay, so what I'm going to do is let's clear this entire div. We do not require this for this example. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a input. We're going to give it an ID. Let's say press. All right. And also it will have a type. Okay. And the type is text. And we'll also set some size to this. Okay. And let's say 10. All right. Now here we have a script. Now within the script, instead of selecting images, we're going to select the input. First of all, let's clear this entire block. So we have the document dot ready function. Now after this, let's select the input. So here we're selecting the input using the dollar function and I'm going to add the on event here. So here I'm also going to add the key press event and some function is going to be performed. Okay, so guys, let me just type this out. Don't worry. I'll explain what I'm doing. P dot height. So what is happening here is on key press. So as soon as you start typing on this input, some function is going to get performed. This P is going to get hidden. So let's create a paragraph, another paragraph. Let's call it. Let's enter this code here. Start typing. OK, now there are two paragraphs here. So I want to edit this paragraph. So I'm going to pass in a parameter called last. OK, so this is basically going to select the last paragraph, which is this one. OK, now, guys, I know this is sort of confusing. OK, there's a small error somewhere over here. OK, so I haven't closed this. Now let's just save the file. I'll show you what's happening. So don't worry if you haven't understood anything. OK, now basically I define an input there. And what I'm going to do is when I start typing. So when I start typing, this paragraph is going to get hidden. So let's see how that works. Let's say hello. Yeah, see as soon as I press the first character, the whole paragraph got hidden. Now, how does that happen? That happens because we use the key press function. So on the press of a particular character on your keyboard, this last paragraph will get hidden. So guys, this is how the on and the key press work. Now on is used to specify other events as well. So on is an event and key press is also an event. OK, so this is how on works and this is the difference between click and on. So with this, we're done with events. Now we have to discuss jQuery effects. 
All right, guys. So now let's discuss the hide effects. Now there are a lot of effects over here. We have hide, we have show, toggle, fade out, fade in, fade toggle, and similarly we have a few other effects. Now, like the name says, it's sort of an effect. So basically, hide is like an effect. So it'll select a particular element and it'll hide it. Okay. You can have parameters for how long you want to hide an element or for how long you want to fade an element. Now we've already seen several examples of hide. So let me just show you a basic example wherein we'll discuss hide, we'll discuss show, we'll discuss toggle. Okay. Now show will just make that particular element visible and toggle will toggle between hide and show. So don't get too confused. Let's just open up our Visual Studio code. So what I'm going to do is I'll just clear this entire thing. Okay. So we'll remove any sort of confusion. Now within the body, I'm going to have two buttons over here. Now each of these buttons will have a class called button. And I'm going to give an ID to each of these buttons. So the first ID is hide and the name of this button is also hide. Okay. Now let's just copy this entire thing and we're going to create another button and we're going to give it an ID called show and let's name the button show. All right. So here I've just created two buttons and I've given a different ID to each of these buttons. Now what I'm going to do is let's load a single image. Okay. So let's not waste time and load three images. So we're just going to load the same puppy images. So the name of the class is puppers. All right. And let's add an image. Okay. So puppy and let's select anyone. Let's say Goldie. Okay. So yeah, let's close this. And this is our div section. Okay, so now let's add a script tag. Now over here, we're going to begin with the document dot ready function. Okay, so let's select the document. I've already explained what this does. Now within this, let's define some code. Now first what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the ID hide. So wait, sorry, I forgot to put this in quotation marks. So what I'm doing here is I'm selecting this hide identifier. So basically this button hide. Okay. So we have two buttons here. That's why I've given each of them an identifier so that you know you can differentiate between these two buttons. So basically this is selecting the hide button. Okay. I'm selecting the hide button and on click of this hide button some event is going to occur. Now that event I'm going to specify in this function. So what is going to happen is I'm going to select the image over here first. Now I've selected the image and I'm just going to hide that image. So on clicking the hide button, the image gets hidden. Now let's close this. Now similarly for show, we're going to do the exact same thing. Okay, let me just copy paste this. It's going to be easier. So instead of selecting the hide button, we're going to select the show button. And on click of the show button, the image will get visible. So we're using the show function over here. So guys, it's as simple as that. All right. So I hope all of you understood what I'm doing here. So let me just run you through what I did. So first of all, I created two buttons. I gave a different identifier to each of these buttons, hide and show. Okay. And then I'm displaying this image, a single image. So what's happening over here is on clicking the hide button, that image is going to get hidden. Okay. And on clicking the show button, the image is going to get visible. All right, let's save and let's just run it and see how this works. So let's click on hide. It gets hidden. Let's click on show. It's visible. Okay. Now what we can do is we can also use the toggle function over here. So let's just select the images. Sorry, the only image that we have and I'm going to perform toggle on it. So it gets hidden. Now, if I click on toggle, it's visible. Similarly, it gets hidden and visible. So toggle toggles between hide and show. Okay. So guys, that was about hide, show and toggle. So we covered all of these three in that example. Now let's look at fade out, fade in and fade toggle. Now, just like the name says, it basically fades a particular element. So either it'll fade out that element or it'll fade in or it'll fade toggle. Okay. Now let's just execute an example and see how this works. All right. So first of all, let's clear this entire script path. 
I'm clearing this entire thing and also we don't need buttons so let's clear these two lines as well now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the other images over here as well now for each of these images I'm going to give a ID okay so let's define the ID of these images okay let's say this image has an ID one and similarly I'm going to do it for the other two images as well so this image has an ID two and we'll change this to husky okay and in this third image I'm going to give it an ID three and I'm going to change this to boxer all right so basically I've assigned an ID to all of these images now in a short while you'll understand why I'm doing that now let's create a script tag script and we're going to have some code in this so we're going to start off with the document dot ready function okay so document dot ready and some function all right so i forgot to create a button let's create a button so over here only i'll create a button let's say the name of the button is buy because we're fading out okay so i'm going to create a button called buy okay and now what we're going to do is on the click of the button so we're selecting the button over here and on click of the button some event is going to occur which we are going to mention in this function okay so what is the event i'm basically going to select all of the images one by one so first i'm selecting this image all right so basically it's the goldie image that i'm selecting and i'm going to fade it out i'm going to use the fade out effect over here so we can also pass parameters to these methods so if i say fade out slow then it will slowly fade out okay then uh, similarly i'm going to do it for my other two images all right so here let's select the second image and you know let's keep it fast over here okay it will fade out really quick and then i'll select the third image and we'll say slow okay for this let's just keep it slow okay now just close the parentheses and we are done with the code over here all right so what i'm doing here is i'm loading three images uh, and i'm giving an identifier to each of these images okay then i'm selecting each of these images and i'm fading them out okay now let's see how this works so let's open it up all right now let's say bye so here you can see that the first one and the last one fade out slowly so the first one to fade out was this image because we passed a fast parameter okay for these two we mentioned slow okay let's look at it again yeah so guys this is how fade out works okay now let's look at an example for fade in okay so what we're going to do here is we're going to clear this div so let's not use puppy images anymore even though that's sad name but yeah okay so what we're going to do is we're going to have a script function now within this we're going to have three divs okay so instead of keeping this as fade out let's keep it fade in so we'll make it fade in over here similarly for this also we'll make it fade in and for this also fade in now what are we going to fade out and fade in let's look at what we're going to fade out now first of all let me create a button i'm gonna let's say namaste okay we have typical indians over here all right now um, what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a div and i'm going to create a class called let's say fade okay now what i'm going to do is within this div i'll have three different boxes or squares and we'll give id to each of these divs so that is one now this is the id that i've mentioned over here okay so id one we're going to style it and we'll give it some sort of width okay let's say width is so much and similarly we'll give it some height and let's say 60 pixels we'll keep the display as none for now because initially nothing should be visible when you're fading in it starts with nothing to everything gets visible okay so that's why we're keeping the display as none and also we'll set the background color we'll set it to orange for this one all right so you can see that i've set the display to none because we're fading in the image okay 
then the background color i've set to orange all right now what we're going to do is that's the end of this div just close the div over here and we're going to add another division now within the div i'm going to give a small break so you can use the br to give a break now let me just copy this entire thing we're going to have three divisions like these so i'm just copying this whole thing now for the second div, what we're going to do is we're only going to change the background color. So I'm sort of trying to display our flag, the Indian flag. I won't be able to get the uh, chakra in between, but apart from that, I think it should work. Okay, and this I'm going to change it to green. So we've created three divs over here and on these three divs, we're going to fade in. Okay, this is slowly going to appear on the screen. So for this also I've set slow, fast and all of that. Let me just change this. So the first one can appear by default. Okay, we're not going to pass any parameter. The second one we'll put slow. And the third one, let's actually give it some value. Okay, so this is basically time in terms of milliseconds. So I'm going to give this value. Let's save the file and let's see how this runs. Okay, so I forgot to remove the buy button. Let's take that off. Okay, we have the namaste button. Let's save the file and now let's check. Okay, let's say namaste. So I made a stupid mistake over here. I forgot to change the ID. So this is two and this is three. Okay, so now it should definitely work. Let's save the changes and I'm just going to open up my browser. All right, let's refresh. Okay, so here you can't see the white one because it's totally white, it's not visible. But here you can see that there is this looks sort of looks like the Indian flag. So obviously, I couldn't get the chakra over here, but yeah, so this is how it works. So, guys, that was about fade in and fade out. So, I hope all of you understood how fade in, fade out works. Okay, now let's move on to our next topic, which is slide down, slide up. And similarly, we're going to do slide toggle as well. Now, just like the name says, this effect is used to slide down a selected element. And it similarly has a speed and a callback parameter. Similar to that is slide up, wherein the selected element slides up. And then we have slide toggle, which toggles between slide up and slide down. So let's look at an example. Okay, so first of all, let me just clear this entire thing. Okay, I'm going to clear this whole thing and so i'm going to start off with having a button so let's say the name of the button is we can name it slide all right and then we can what we're going to do is we're going to add a div over here okay a division we're going to have an id for that let's call it div one okay this is not necessary but it's a good practice to have an id over here it's not necessary because there's going to be only one div so we're going to style it. Let's say we have the width. We'll set the width to 90 pixels. Okay. Similarly, we'll have height parameter and we'll set that to 60. And we'll also give it a good background color. We'll give it pink. Okay. And okay, I have misspelled background. So basically, this is the div. Um, let's close the div. It ends over here. All right, so we basically created a div over here. It's basically a small square or a rectangle, okay, of color pink. Now let's have a script tag. Now within the script tag, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the button over here and we're also going to add on event over here and let's also add click, okay? So on click, an event is going to occur and that event is defined within this function. Now, what we're going to do is we'll select the div, okay, using the identifier that we gave it, div1, okay, and we're going to apply the slide up or the slide down function to this, okay, let's apply slide up first, okay, we can also pass a parameter, say slow, let's close this up, and this should work, okay, let's save, so what I did here was I created a small rectangle using this div and i styled it okay so i created a small rectangle over here and i have a button called slide and on click of that button this square is going to slide up slowly okay 
So let's see how it works. Okay, let's see slide. So let's see it again. So it's slowly sliding up. Okay, so guys, this is how slide up works. Now for it to slide down, what we're going to do is if it has to slide down, then initially the display has to be none. So we're going to set the display to none. And we're going to change this to slide down. Okay, let's save and let's see if this works. Okay, let's click on slide. See, it's sliding down slowly. So guys, this is how slide up and slide down works. Okay, you can also toggle it in the same manner. Okay, so if you toggle this, it will either slide up or slide down. Okay, so guys, with that, we are done with jQuery effects. Now let's finally move on to our last topic, which is jQuery user interface. Okay, this is just the UI. Now I'm just going to discuss three functions over here, which is draggable, droppable, and date picker. Now, like the name suggests, you can drag any selected element using the draggable method. And similarly, the droppable method is used to drop the selected element at a specified target. This is how draggable and droppable work. Now let's look at an example. All right, so I'm going to begin with clearing everything over here. Oh, guys, I don't know why I removed the first header. Okay, let's just keep it as jQuery tutorial. Now what we're going to do is first of all, we're going to begin with a style tag. So basically we're going to style an element that we're going to drag around. So this is just going to be a small square or something like that. So I'm going to give this style a ID called drag. All right. Now within this, we're going to have a few properties like width. Let's have it 150 pixels. Then we'll have height similarly. So we're just going to design an element that we're going to drag around over here. Okay, 60 pixels. And then we have, we'll give it a background, a background color. Let's say blue. Let's click on blue violet. All right. So this is basically the style tag. Now, basically, we have a rectangle over here with the background color blue violet. And we've given it an identifier called drag. Okay. So guys, one thing I forgot to mention was if you know CSS, then you know that when you use a hash, it's basically for an identifier. But whenever I mentioned dot with some name, it means that I'm selecting a class. Okay, that was just extra information. So yeah, now let's just open up a script tag. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have a function over here. All right. Now guys, you can use function as a shorthand for document dot ready function. Okay, so this is like a shorthand for function. I forgot to mention this earlier, but you can use this. Now, what you're going to do here is I'm going to select the drag identifier and to that element, whatever we designed over here. Sorry, I forgot to put quotation marks. Now, this drag identifier basically selects this rectangle that we created. So that rectangle is getting selected and we're going to make it draggable. Okay, we're going to use the draggable function and yeah all right okay so this is the script now what i'm doing here is i'm creating a div of id drag okay so basically this drag and i'm creating a div of id drag so it's basically the same division and i'm just going to have some text on it let's say drag me around okay so yes let's save this and this should definitely work all right, so this is basically what we styled. We created a rectangle of violet blue color and now you can just drag it around. Okay, you can see that I can simply drag it around the entire HTML page over here. Okay, so guys, this is how draggable works. I know it looks really cool to drag it. It's like a small game. So this is how draggable works. Okay, now let's look at droppable. Now, let me just clear this entire thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to have an image of a puppy whom we want to drop off at his house. So basically, we're going to have an image of a puppy and we're going to drag it and drop it into his house. So we're going to involve draggable and droppable over here. It's a cute concept. So guys, yeah, I'm first of all going to start with displaying the image. So, okay, I'm going to select Goldie and all right. So now that I've selected the image, now let's have a style function. Okay, now we need a house for this puppy so we're going to design the house now i'm going to give an identifier to this let's call it drop 
now within this i'm gonna have a width okay we'll set it to 400 pixels similarly height 400 and we'll make it float to the right because i'll tell you why right, so when i display this you'll understand why i'm floating it to the right background color as let's give it aquamarine okay so this is the end of style so what we did here is we basically created a square of the color aquamarine now let's add the script tag over here where all the work happens now over here i'm going to begin with function all right uh, now i'm going to start off by selecting the image there's only one image here you can either say image or you can give the identifier of the image it's the same thing and this image should be draggable okay draggable all right now i'm going to select this square that we created which has an identifier called drop so i'm going to select that square and i'm going to make it droppable all right let's just close the parentheses over here all right so this is it for script now let's also add a small text over here so i'm creating a div with the id drop okay within this div let's have a small paragraph which says my home all right okay so what we did here was we started off by uh, displaying this image and then we created a square with the following properties after that we're going to assign the draggable method to the image and the droppable method to this square that we created over here okay now let's just look at the output you'll understand it much better all right so basically this guy wants to go home all right give me a second okay so the reason it wasn't getting dragged was because i did not mention a hash over here when you give an identifier you have to mention hashtag over here okay so let's save this and let's open that up it should work refresh now see it's draggable so this guy wants to go home and this is his house so it's droppable over here okay it does not move around or go back it's droppable so his house is droppable so just we're just taking him to his house i know this is silly but this was a good way of showing you how draggable and droppable works all right so i hope you all understood draggable droppable now lastly we're going to look at date picker so guys this is an inbuilt function it's an inbuilt widget in jquery wherein you can enter a date and then you can easily visualize the date we're not going to go into detail with this i'm just going to show you a simple example of how the date picker works okay let me just start off by clearing this entire thing okay right up to here okay uh, now what i'm going to do is i'm going to have an input wherein the user will enter the date let's give it an id let's say date is the id and the type is text we'll also assign it some size okay say 10 all right now what we're going to do is we're going to open up a script tag now within the script tag it's very simple guys what i'm going to do is i'm going to select the input so i'm typing the input id over here and on that we're going to call the date picker widget okay so let's save this so guys this is all all right so i'm just creating an input and as soon as you type the input you're going to get a date picker okay so this is an inbuilt widget there's not much to code over here all right so as soon as i clicked on it the date picker got visible so let's say i give some date you can give some date randomly or if you select on some particular date that date is visible over here okay so it just works normally like this all right so guys i hope all of you are clear with the date picker What is Angular? So it only makes sense to start with what exactly is Angular. So for viewers who are watching any Angular video for the first time, you deserve an introduction to what you are learning. Now, most of you, I assume, actually already have done your research before coming onto YouTube and typing out Angular tutorial. So it's only mandatory that I give you this introduction. So first of all, Angular is a front-end development framework. Now that's out of the way. Let's get into what front-end development framework means. 
So when if you have any web developer friends, you will constantly hear two words backend and front end backend and front end. So what do these two words mean? Well, uh, the roles of a web developer are forked into two very distinct branches in this industry. The first is that of a backend developer and the second is that of a front end developer. Now a backend developer is responsible for mostly everything that happens on the back end. So basically stuff like routing. Well, routing is also done by front end developers, but that's another thing. But routing is basically the job of a back end developer uh, fetching things from a server, writing the JavaScript for all that things. That is a complete back end developer thing, setting up the server for in fact, setting up the database schema. That's everything a back end developer does. What the front end developer does mostly entails what you see on your screen right now. So the way you see Facebook, the way it's designed, how everything, how the news feed is actually placed like that. That is the job of a front end developer. He makes sure that everything on a website looks tip top and smack perfect. And he does this with a lot of optimization. So mostly back in the day, front end mostly used to be done by HTML and CSS. And CSS used to get very complicated in this fashion. It still is a little complicated if you want to present a very polished website, but creating the HTML and making it much more reactive is what the framework does for you. So most online sites will say that front end development framework is also referred to as a CSS framework. Well, while this is very true, it's not so perfect of a thing to say that is a CSS framework. It is more of a reactive HTML framework and I will explain just now how so the second thing that you should know about angular is that it is maintained and developed by Google. So angular JS is a JavaScript based open source front end framework mainly maintained by Google and by a community of individuals and corporations to address many of the challenges encountered in developing single page applications. We'll also get to what single page applications mean in a moment. It aims to simplify both development and the testing of such applications by providing a framework for client side model view controller. That is the MVC architecture on the model view view model controller or the MVVM architectures as you might know it. So basically it's maintained and developed by Google. Now if you know Google, you know things they give you as a product is amazing. Things like Flutter really took off Android. We know what it is today and Angular JS has been out there since a long time. It's got an amazing community. If you have any sort of doubt, you can go ahead and post it out on Stack Overflow under the Angular tab and you will probably get an answer almost immediately. Other than that, your problems might already be there posted by somebody else who is developing and face the same problem. So basically you have a great community, great support from Google and it's a breeze to work with Angular today. The third thing that you need to know about Angular is that it is a JavaScript based framework. Now if that was not already obvious from Angular 1 which is named Angular JS, well I'm just putting it out there, it is JavaScript based. So why is it a good thing that it is JavaScript based? Well JavaScript is commonly known as the language of the web. So if you are interacting with any part of the web, you're probably going to use JavaScript or the JavaScript engine. You might be doing unknowingly, but you are definitely doing it. For example, you're watching this video on YouTube right now. You are using a JavaScript engine that runs a video framework. So yeah, so if you know JavaScript, you basically know how to talk to the web. So when you're trying to learn Angular, you don't really have to learn a new language. For example, when you're learning Flutter, you have to learn about Dart. So Dart is a new language that is developed by Google and is used in Flutter. That is their mobile application development framework. If you want to go learn Flutter, you can check out my Flutter tutorial on Edureka. Uh, but for now, you need to know that Angular is based on JavaScript. Well, not exactly JavaScript. It is based on TypeScript. TypeScript is the main language that is used in Angular scripts and TypeScript is basically a superset of JavaScript. And we'll get into what TypeScript is later on. So basically the fact that it is made up of it is based on JavaScript makes it much more common and easy to reach out for developers like us. After that we just discussed that Angular is main for single page applications. So we are not trying to create multi page applications with Angular. Angular is made for making single page applications. So what exactly is a single page application? Well it does not re require a page reloading. So for example Gmail is a wonderful single page application. So let me just go ahead and show it to you. So if you go ahead and open up your Gmail account and let's say you are straight up going to open on the inbox page. Now if you were to go into drafts, uh, let the site stop loading. Okay, so if you were to go into drafts, you see 
that there is basically no load out here. Your screen isn't going into that whole whoop de whoop of loading. But if you are not on a single page application, for example, go to webinar, which is a recording service. So out here we are on the My Webinar tab. And if I were to go to my recording out here, you see that this goes into a loading fashion. This is loading up a new page. So this means that GoToWebinar is not a single page application while Google is a single page application. And you just saw how much faster Google can be. My God, this is still loading and Google was done with it already. So yeah, single page applications certainly have the performance and speed that you require today to do all your things very seamlessly. So it's great to have a framework that lets you create single page applications with so much ease. So with that out of the way, this is all the theory part. Let's go ahead and start up with our own Angular project. So the first thing that you need to do is to start up with Angular is go ahead to your browser, open up a new tab and search for Node.js. Now I am assuming that you don't have Node.js installed on your computer. So click on the first link and go ahead and download the one that is recommended for most users. After you download it, you'll get a setup file. Go ahead, click the setup file and just follow the instruction. It's a pretty easy install and I don't think there should be much problems with it. But just in case out there you get a problem with it, some configuration problem goes wrong, please go ahead and check out another video that actually explains how to install Node.js on your computer because this video is meant for Angular. I have a lot to do and I can't waste time with stuff like how to install Node. There are a lot of videos out there, including EduRecas itself, and you can go ahead and check them out. Now, once you have installed Node on your computer, you can go ahead and check if Node is installed by just typing Node on your command prompt, and this should open up a JavaScript console. You can say stuff like print, or let's say var x equals five, and if you just call x, it'll say five out there. I know my text isn't very clear because I have this weird blue background in my command prompt, but yeah, if you can open up a JavaScript console with just typing node, you have installed node in proper fashion. Now to exit from this console, you can just type dot exit and that will exit you from that console. So now let's go ahead and clear up our command prompt. And the next thing that we are gonna do is install Angular on our computer. So to install Angular, let's see what we have to do. So the best place that you have for any doubts of this sort is the Angular documentation. So go ahead and search for the Angular docs. So this will open up the Angular docs. It's at angular.io slash docs. Go ahead and check the setup part. So out here you see that you need Node.js. Now that you have done it, you can go ahead and install Angular through an NPM command. So NPM is a node package manager and all you have to say to NPM is that you need to install. So install or you can just simply say I and then hyphen G which basically means that it is going to be a global install and not pertaining to any particular folder or any project setup. So we are going to be installing this globally so that you can access the Angular CLI from almost anywhere on your computer. So after that, all you have to say is Angular slash CLI. If I'm correct. Okay, it's at the rate Angular. So for stuff like this, always keep the documentation open and you should go ahead and press enter after that. So this command will go ahead and install Angular on your local machine. So let's just wait for this to finish. Okay, so as you guys know, I already had Angular installed on my computer. So nothing new has actually been changed. It just says it updated one package, so that doesn't really matter. So this means that Angular has been installed on our computer. And you can go ahead and check that by just creating an Angular project. Now I'm in my default user directory, so let me just go ahead and change it to the desktop directory. And out in the desktop directory, I want to make a folder called Angular Tutorial. So Angular underscore tutorial. So this is where I'm going to be saving all the projects and all the setups that we will be needing for the various assignments and simple applications that we will be looking at and the concepts. So this is going to be the folder for the day. So let's go ahead and quickly change into that folder. And so Angular Tutorial and we are in our Angular Tutorial folder. So out here, what you can do to start up a new Angular project is, as you guys can see, out here it, is, it says to create a workspace and initial application, you can use the ng new command. So ng new basically tells Angular CLI that you want to start a new project and then you basically give your project a name. Okay, so ng new and what do we name our project? Well, let's think of some appropriate name. Let's go back and see what are we actually gonna do next. 
So we are going to be writing our first app. So it's very simple that we are going to be calling this our first app. So NGNU will go ahead and create folder which has everything that you need to create your first app. So you can opt out for routing for now because we will not be going for routing in this tutorial and we will also be using CSS for our file. So just press enter twice and that will be using the default settings for setting up your angular project and there it goes. So that completes our project setup and for this project setup we are also missing out one thing. So firstly we are missing out our code editor. So I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code but you can use other paid applications like WebStorm out there. WebStorm is amazing. If you can pay for it, please go for it. But for now, for a very free way of making a tutorial, I'm going to be sticking to my cheap ways and just use Visual Studio Code. Now, just because Visual Studio Code is free doesn't mean it takes away from any of the functionalities that come from the paid apps. It has all the functionalities like syntax highlighting, for creating and generating components. It's really good. You even get a built-in terminal to actually run your Angular CLI commands. Okay, so let's just wait for this project to get set up. It kind of takes a couple of minutes from some time. So let's just give it some time. Okay, so now that our Angular app is set up and up and running, all we need to do now is go ahead and just download Visual Studio Code. So to download Visual Studio Code, go ahead and type in Visual Studio Code on your browser. Go to the first link and also the second link out here that download Visual Studio Code. That should give you a set of file and you should just go ahead and set it up. That's very easy to do. So let's not waste more time and get started with writing our first app. Okay. So out here, if you were to go to your desktop and if you made a folder like me, like Angular Tutorial, you will see that there's a folder that says first app. Now, if you were to open the folder, you see a lot of things you probably don't understand out here. So there is a TS lint, which is a JSON source file. There's also the package file. There's a package lock. There's also this imp very important angular.json file, which basically includes all your dependencies. Now, this E2E file is not really going to be useful for us in this Angular tutorial. E2E basically means end-to-end -end, and this is made for end-to-end -end testing of Angular apps. What we are going to be interested in is mostly the node modules and the SRC. So out here in SRC, you see that there is this index page. There is an index page which is your HTML file. There's also this style sheet which is your basic styling of the web app that comes built in when you basically make any Angular app. So first of all, let's go back and let's open this folder particularly with Visual Studio Code. So as you guys can see, I have opened up our first app and we can go into our SRC and we can see that there's an app folder and we get a lot of files out here. So we have an app component.css file, we have an app component.html file, we have an app component.spec.ts file. So all of these .spec.ts files are basically used for testing purposes. You're not going to be concentrating on testing, but rather more on developing an app. So this is none of our concern for now. You can feel free to actually go ahead and delete it. Now, if you go ahead and open up app.component.ts, you can go ahead and see that there is a bit of code written out here. So there's an import line from the first thing. We can see that it's importing something called components from a library called Angular slash core. There's also this decorator out here that tells Angular that this is a component. It has a selector, it has a template URLs, it has styles URLs. And in the class, you can see that there is a variable that says title and it says first app. Now, this really doesn't make sense to a beginner, but just wait on when we will know what all of these things mean from components to a class and everything else. So first of all, let's go ahead and see what this app that Angular ships with looks like. So to do that, go ahead and open up your terminal. You can simply do that by dragging it up and down. And out here, what you want to say is ng hyphen hyphen open, uh, which basically makes your default browser open up. And all you want to say is serve. So this command basically serves the app that is in the development mode right now, and it will serve it on a local host at port number 4200. So it's compiling at the moment. So let's go ahead and see what it actually looks like. Let's give it some time to compile 
and should open up the app for us automatically. Let's close off this one. Let's keep the documentation open. Let's close off the Node.js. Let's close off my mail. Okay, so this is the first app. Okay, so as you guys can see, we are greeted with a welcome screen. As you guys can also see, it's on a local server. This is not hosted at a global scale. This is just for your testing purposes as a developer. So you can see that it says, welcome to the first app. Now, if you go ahead and see out here, it says title equals first app. Now, if you go ahead in the HTML part, you can also see that there is this little place where title is referenced back again. So as a developer, I think you can make some sense that these three files, the appcomponent.es, the appcomponent.html, and the appcomponent.css is kind of interconnected with each other. So yeah, this is basically what an Angular app looks like. Okay, so this is basically the application that Angular ships with. It's a very welcoming application. It says, welcome to first app. It has some useful links such as the tour of heroes link it has a link to the command line interface documentation and a few of the angular blogs now this is of really no use to us if you want to learn so let's go ahead and actually fiddle around with this file that comes along with angular when you create your app so if you go ahead and look at the app component.html page it looks deceivingly similar to what we see on our screen out here when with this app that angular ships with so as you guys can see it has an H1 that says welcome to and title and out here you can see welcome to first app. So basically we can say that the title out here which we saw in the TypeScript file which is said title equals to first app and that gets converted out here. Above that we also have a few links and basically it's an unordered list. And also if necessary there is some styling that goes along too. But at this moment there is no styling that is available. So let's go ahead and tinker around with this application just to give you an idea um, how Angular actually works. So Angular is basically divided into components in Angular app. So out here what you see is the app component. So every component has three files. It's basically, it's, it's a template. So it has its own styling. So that is app.component.css. It also has its template. So the styling is CSS. The template is app.component.html. And the logic, the business logic that goes inside this thing is in the app.component.ts file. Now, there is also this app.module.ts file, and I'll get to that just in a moment. But for now, what you want to do is go ahead and just delete all the stuff that is there in the app.component.html file. Now, don't forget to keep your terminal running, which is serving this application. So every time you go ahead and save, it basically saves it. And you can go ahead and see that it has reloaded it and we have nothing out here to be honest. So let's make this page a little more interesting. So firstly, let's give this just an input, let's say. So we want a div and in this div, we are gonna have an input of type text. Now every input should also go with a label and this label is for name. So we can give this type name equals name out here. Right, so let's make this a little less confusing for you guys. Let's call this first name. Right, and out here you see if we go ahead and save it, we should get an input out here. We can type stuff out here, but it really does nothing even if we press enter and stuff like that. So we can also have um, a paragraph out here, which an outputs out our name for us. Please don't pay much attention to the syntax for now. Just try and understand what is happening in the background because we will get to the syntax just in a few moments. So we wanna display the name out here. So to display the name, we need to create a variable called name. So go ahead and go to your app.component.ts file and change this name, the title to name. And out here, let's change it to my name. So we're gonna say Aria. So let's save that. Let's go back and save our HTML file. And as you guys can see, Aria is coming out here. But if we still type something in the input, nothing actually happens. Now what I wanna do is, Whatever I type in the input should automatically be reflected in this paragraph below it. So we can do that very simply with so-called tool that Angular ships with. Now these tools are called directives and we will get into directives just in this tutorial. I'll be teaching you how to make use of inbuilt directives like the one I'm gonna be using right now. So let's go ahead and use this directive. Now pay no attention to the way I am writing this because syntax is something that can be dealt with later on. 
So for now, what we want to do is start up square bracket and then an open parentheses bracket. That is the normal bracket. And all we want to say is ng model is equals to name. So name should be in your double quotes. Now this will tell Angular that whatever is being typed out here is going to be stored in a property called name. And we are also going to be displaying the same name down here in this paragraph. So let's go ahead and save this. And let's go ahead and reload our file. And you surprisingly see that the input part that we had has suddenly disappeared. Now what we want to do to realize our mistake is go ahead and say inspect. If you go into the console, it says uncut error, template parse error. So it can't bind to ng model since it isn't known property of input. Okay, so basically Angular can't figure out what ng model is. Now this is because we have not imported the functionalities of ng model. Now I said that this is an input model and it comes shipped with Angular. But the way TypeScript works is that you have to go and tell TypeScript everything you are importing that you will be needing for your app to be running. Now all your imports to this is actually done in the module file. So things that need to be imported when you are running this is done in the modules file. So as you guys can see, we are importing a few stuff already that is by default. So we are importing the ng module from angular slash core and uh, we are also importing the browser module from angular slash platform browser. Now to actually make the magic of ng model happen, we need to import something and this is at the rate angular slash forms. So everything ends with the semicolon. So basically in TypeScript, you need to tell TypeScript where everything is particularly. So angular slash forms and what we need to import is the forms module. Now this was telling TypeScript that we are going to be using this, but you also need to tell angular that your forms module needs to be imported. So you can do that by just copying this name and putting it in the imports array out here. So put a comma here press enter and type in forms module. Go ahead and save your HTML page also just in case. And now what we see out here is we do not get any error first of all and we have this nice little input box. So let's close this. We also have this nice little input box. It says aria in the paragraph. It also says aria in the input box. Now if I were to delete that everything in the paragraph also automatically gets deleted. So if this was not a single page application for example Reflecting the changes you made to the input would probably take you to reload the page, but that is not with angular You can go ahead and simply type your name and everything will happen like it's magic and it'll appear down in the paragraph below So that was all about installing angular setting up your project and we set up our project We saw how the shipping app actually looks like and then we kind of fiddle with it And this is how an angular app basically works you have components and then you also have modules. So modules are like sub packages like any app would be divided into sub packages An angular app is divided into modules. Now modules contain components and this is the component out here that we worked with just now. It is called the app component. Also another thing that I want to bring to your notice is if we go ahead and open up the source code what you see out here is it's basically an HTML page, but there's this weird app root element out here. It almost seems like we have built our own custom element. Below that what you see is a bunch of script imports that Angular does for you so that Angular works properly. But the main interesting part is this app root element. Now if you remember we had seen this app root element in our app.component.ts file and we see that we have a selector called app root. Now the page that gets loaded into the browser is actually this index.html page. Now out there you see that we have created this app root thing. So basically app root out here is like a selector. So basically this will help you understand how an angular app gets loaded when we get to that. So index.html is basically the file or the source code that you see out here. It also happens to have this app root custom element. Now we built this custom element using our components and we told our component that the selector for this custom element will be app root and the template of that component is stored in app.component.html. 
which is basically this file and also the component has some styling which it at the moment doesn't have any if it would have any styling it would be in this app.component.css file and basically that's it and we have our app.component.ts file which makes sure of the logic that is working properly so basically this is how angular works it's a bunch of components now let's go ahead and this was our first app that we created now let's go ahead with our next topic and that is what is typescript now you really saw that we are using something a little different from javascript it's basically not javascript it's typescript so what exactly is typescript well typescript is just a superset of javascript it is a strongly typed object oriented compiled language it was designed uh, by microsoft and it is basically a superset to javascript so anything that is included in javascript is definitely included in typescript but the reverse can't be actually said so everything in javascript is there in typescript because it is a superset but everything in typescript is not there in javascript so typescript is basically used when you want to create a javascript based application that can actually scale at an industrial level because when we're talking about typescript it basically compiles down to javascript and this compilation is done by the angular cli so if you want to go ahead and uh, learn the nitty gritties of typescript you can go ahead and check out typescript tutorial out there on the web there are plenty of them typescript is really easy to learn and even if you don't want to learn typescript i think it's easy enough if you know javascript you can catch it up along the way it's basically like javascript but having classes interfaces and stuff like that so with that out of the way we can move ahead to our next topic and that is integrating external css into our angular application okay so for the purpose of integrating an external CSS, we are going to be working with Bootstrap 3. So Bootstrap, if you don't know, is a CSS framework. So let's go and see what Bootstrap does. So this is Bootstrap. Uh, we are on Bootstrap version 4 right now, but I will be using version 3 for this purpose of this demo. So you can go ahead and see what Bootstrap does out here on Bootstrap's official site. I also have a Bootstrap tutorial. You can go ahead and check that out too. It's basically will show you how to use bootstrap in its various forms and formats. Okay, so now we are only going to integrate bootstrap into our project. So to do that, all you have to do is go out here and open up another PowerShell command. Out here, what you want to do is type in the commands npm install and dash dash save and you want to say bootstrap at the rate 3. What this will do is download all the files of Bootstrap 3 and store it in this node modules folder. So node modules folder is anything that you use from the node package manager. If you download some external package, it will be saved in your node modules. After that, after it's downloaded, I will show you how you can integrate it into your project that you are working on. Let's give it some time to actually download the node modules or what we have here that is Bootstrap 3. Okay, so we have actually downloaded Bootstrap 3. Now you can check that by actually opening the node modules folder and going down to B double O. So A B C D B M should be somewhere here. Okay, it seems I can now find it there. Let's go ahead and check it out on our desktop. So we have Angular tutorial, first app, known modules, and there should be a bootstrap out here. Yep, below bonjour. So it should be below bonjour. So let's go ahead and find bonjour out here. So this is our bootstrap folder that we had just downloaded. Now out here, we have a few folders so under this bootstrap folder go into the dist folder that stands for distribution go to css and all you have to do is copy this right click on it and copy the relative path now all you have to do is go into let's let's minimize this a little so that it becomes easier to work with now all you have to do is go out here go into styles this is the angular.json file on almost line number 27 you will see that there is a styles array so out here all you do is put a comma press enter and put in the address of 
the bootstrap.css file. Now beware that when you copy the relative path, you have to actually go ahead and change this all to a backslash. So just change all of these to backslashes and you should be ready to go. So let me just show you guys. This is without actually having bootstrap installed. So this is the app that we have created. Now, if we were to just go ahead and inspect, we can go ahead and see that in the head part, there is only one style that so it says text slash CSS. This other styles is just a way of telling Angular that there's a source mapping of all the CSS styles. Now, at this moment, you can see that this is the global styles to this file. Now, once we actually go ahead and save our angular.json file, and then what we have to do is actually go ahead and node where we were actually serving, hit control C, and then what you want to do again is serve it again. So basically, save your angular.json file, stop serving your application onto the server, and then save all your files, and then start up a new fresh serve process again. So to start a new fresh serving process, all you have to do is go ahead and type ng uh, new, or you can just say n. Oh wait, we're not creating a new component. All we want to do is say ng hyphen o and serve. So remember, this has only one style at this moment. So now let's see how we can actually integrate Bootstrap if we actually could integrate Bootstrap into our project. Okay, so our application has actually compiled and let's go ahead and see let's go ahead and inspect our page and if you go into your head part you will see that there is a new style that has been added so this says that bootstrap version 3.4.1 has been added and now you can use all the styling that comes along with bootstrap for example if i were to put this division inside a class called jumbotron this would give it a specific type of styling a jumbotron is not exactly meant to be used like that so Let's go ahead and change it to a container. Now, if you want to know about all these bootstrap classes that I'm using, you can very well go ahead and check out my bootstrap tutorial that I have up on Edureka's site. Okay, so let's remove this. We are not doing the styling properly at this moment. Let's get back to this. Okay, looks like we have actually broken something, but what I wanted to show you is that we actually have bootstrap going at and our bootstrap is completely working so this is bootstrap version 3.4.1 for us so that is guys how you would add an external css file to your project okay so our next topic for today is how angular actually loads so if we go back to our code editor and uh, we analyze all the files that we've seen so first of all you have three component files that is the component styling file the component template file and the component um, TypeScript file. Now, if you were to go back to your page where your application is loaded, and you were to inspect it, or to be honest, you have to go and see the source. So in the source, you see that there is, is this app root element. Now, how does the app root element know that it has to insert an input box and a paragraph out here? Well, let me just explain that first, because this is a very important concept. This will help you how in learning angular because you're getting to the root and fundamentals of how angular is working so firstly the page that is getting served by the ng serve process is this index.html file now in this index.html file we have somewhat of a custom element with the selector of app root now if you were to realize we have tied in this app root selector out here in this app.component.ts file in this app.component.ts file, we have a decorator method. We have a decorator class, I'm sorry. And in this decorator class, we have said that the selector is going to be app root. Basically, it saves a string as a selector and it gives it a value that it, this is going to be used for recognizing an element on an HTML page. We have then also said that the element will have its templating in an app.component.html file. So, very basically, when an app root component is present on your HTML file, Angular knows that it has to serve these three files out here. These three files out here, the app component files, it knows because it's tied in with the selector. Now, if you go ahead and see it out here, there is a module file also. 
Now, before we get to the module file, I'd like to tell you that the first piece of code that is actually run is always the main file. So out here, the main file is the main.ts file. And out here, you see this line out here. So out here in this file, basically there are a few imports. To, one is to enable production mode for development purposes. But the most important line out here is platform browser dynamic and it's a bootstrap module. So in this bootstrap module, we are passing in the app module as an argument. So since the app module is being passed as an argument, the app module part is actually invoked out here. And out here you see it has another bootstrap array. So this bootstrap doesn't actually refer to our bootstrap CSS framework we just included. Bootstrap means what should be run first when you are actually running an application. So out here we are saying that we want to run the app component and the app component here happens to have this HTML file, the CSS file and this TypeScript file which are also tied into the index.html which is app root selector. So whenever this app root selector is found on this HTML page, it is going to actually serve these three files and that is exactly how an Angular app is loaded onto your screen. So this workflow is very important for you to understand such that uh, you know where you are going wrong just in case in future debugging processes. We will be having a very detailed lecture on debugging in the future, so please hang on for that. So this part that I just explained will act as a precursor of knowledge for the future videos which will need you to understand how an Angular application is actually being presented to you on your screen. Now moving ahead, we are gonna go ahead to our next topic and that is components. Now what we have here under this app folder is a component. Now components are the building blocks of Angular. Everything that you see on your screen using Angular is basically a component. So imagine there is this website that you see on your mobile phone and it is a website built by Angular. Now everything on Angular will be starting with the root component and they will obviously contain subcomponents and even more subcomponents after that. So basically it is a tree of components. Now if you were to remember my Flutter tutorial if you haven't watched that, please go ahead and check that out. Flutter is amazing and you should be learning it today. Well, in Flutter, I had said that application built using Flutter is a tree of widgets. Now, the same analogy can be put to a web page that is built using Angular as a tree of components. It's basically a unit or a building block and each framework gives it, it gives its building blocks a different name. So for Flutter, it's a widget and for Angular, it's a root component or just components in himself. So what we did out here is that we had a component. Now let's say that we want to create another component. How do we do that? Well, all you have to do is go ahead and right click on your applications folder. And what you want to say is you want to put in a new folder. Now let's call this folder. Um, let's say we want to have a component called servers. So let's call the servers. And out here what we want to do is we want to create the server files. So out here we are going to create a new file. So we are going to create a new file and this file is going to be called the server.component.html. So why did we choose this naming process? Well, when you are building an industry level applications, you tend to forget what is what. So naming something appropriately. So out here, you know that this is the server.component.html file. This gives us very good information. For example, it is a server, it is a component, and this is the template HTML file. Now in this template HTML file, we could be putting anything. For example, let's just put an H3, and we could say that this is the server component that you are viewing. So if this is coming on our screen, we will know that there this is a server component. Now we can we also need to add a new file out here. So to serve this file, we need a TypeScript file first of all. So what we need to do is create a new file and this will be the server.component.ts file. So ts stands for TypeScript. Now if you were to go ahead and check out the app component.ts file out here, you see that there is an import and then there's a class. So first of all, we are gonna try and replicate this because that is also a component and we are making our component manually. So we will know what we wanna do. So first of all, we wanna say export class 
let's say server out here let's see the naming fashion of what how it is used so it says app component so to make it more clear that this is a component we could just use something of a naming structure like server component Those are brackets now we said export because we want to be using this class everywhere else so this was your way of telling angular that this is a component but this is not where it actually ends you also need to tell angular by actually putting a decorator so add rate component will tell angular that this is indeed a decorator so out here if you were to go ahead and again look into your components file out here you see that we have to open the components part and type in the selectors now basically we what we want to put in in this component is we want to say how we want to select this so we're going to say selector and our selector will be let's say a server i'm sorry that's not how you do it let's just go back and as you guys can see our things are becoming much more easier because of this ide things are getting imported into our file system now what we want to say out here is our selector will be if we have to pass a string so it is going to be server now we can actually call this a server but that is not the proper naming fashion so just to make sure your selector doesn't actually go ahead and clash with any inbuilt selector or some selector that might probably ship with angular what you want to do is call this app server so you just put a hyphen in between and you call this app server now another thing that we need to do is pass the html file so we can say template url so let's see how we can actually use the template url part so you see that it is a template url and we have to pass in the components.html so out here let's go back and let's say template url and all we have to do is pass server.component.html now let's see if we are missing out on anything you can always go back and check there so we have to do put the dot and the slash just to tell it that it is in the same parent directory so dot slash server.component.html and for now we can skip on the styling because there is no styling involved so we do not put a semicolon here because this is basically like an array so let's go ahead and save that so that saved successfully and now what we can do is go back into our app component file an html file let's go ahead and delete all this now what we can say is let's put an h1 to know that we are in the app component file so this is app component that we are looking at now if you guys remember we have used a selector out here that our selector for this will be app server so whenever we put an app server type of selector then h3 should be rendered which says this is the server component that you are viewing so let's go ahead and do that so let's go back to our app component and let's say app server so since we have put our app server here what we should be able to do is so since we have put an app server there an h3 should be actually rendered there now let's go ahead and check if that actually happens let's save all our files let's save that let's save this now what you see out here is nothing is actually getting loaded there is no h1 and there is no s3 either now this is because we have forgotten to actually put it in our modules so if we see that nothing is actually getting loaded there is no h1 there is no h3 so let's go ahead and inspect and let's go into the console and if you go ahead there you'll see that app server is not a known element and the beautiful part of angular is that it also gives you a solution most of the time so if app server is an angular component then verify that it is a part of this module so this gives us an idea that there is something missing in the app modules part out here to know that what this actually does so if we were to look at our app modules typescript file we would see that there it kind of looks like a normal typescript file there are a bunch of imports in the beginning then there is a decorator which is the ng module decorator and it has a bunch of arrays now in these arrays we have understood what the bootstrap part does it basically tells which component should be loaded or which service should be loaded when our app is loading for the first time 
now we also need to tell angular that there is another component that you should be aware of this is not done automatically if you are creating your servers and components manually so what we need to do is go ahead and tell angular that there is a server component so if we put a server component we also see that there is another import line that has been added so out here this is typescript this is the way you tell typescript that there is a server component and this is the way you tell angular that there is a server component now if we were to go ahead and save that we can now see that there is two parts loaded one says that app component and the other said this is the server component that you are viewing if you were to go ahead and inspect you would see that this is a head then this is a body and inside the app root we will have the app server component that is running inside the app server we see that there is an h3 which is basically this part so this is how you can create your components manually and then add them to your project and add them successfully too so that angular and typescript both understand how your components are being made now you can also add a styling to your components by just adding a styling folder I mean a styling file so you will be calling this the server dot component dot CSS so this is going to be a CSS file and out here we can just say since we have an h3 you can say color will be let's say blue let's go ahead and save that and now what we need to do is go into the TypeScript file and we also need to give the styles URL and this is going to be so let's go ahead and see how styles are actually put this is put in an array so that's exactly what we're going to do out here so what we want to say is let's just copy this out because it's going to be the css file in the similar fashion let's go ahead and paste that in and just change this to css let's go ahead and save that and now if we go ahead and load it we will see that our styling has also been applied to our component so this is the server component this is the app component which makes it very clear now if you are actually a guy who likes things to be much more automatic and seamless like me worry not because angular gives you the power to create components and not worry about if they're included in your module and everything just through the cli so if we were to go to our powershell part and we were to actually run a command that says ng generate component and we could say let's say so we have a server so we need somebody to let's say sub server so sub server now what the cli will do is it will go ahead and create everything that you need for your component so we see we have a sub server folder out here this sub server has a sub server.css file and this also has a sub component file now only we can go and put this so it has a component file has a paragraph that said sub server works there's also the testing file which we didn't create there's also the components file out here i mean the typescript file and as you guys can see it says app sub server so that is a selector that you use it with so let's go ahead and use this so we go ahead and put this into our servers html file and we can just say app sub server let's go ahead and save that and now what you should see is that there is a sub server works out here so basically what you did was you created a component through the cli and you basically just used it this is how you are going to be using most of your components creating most of your components and that is through the cli I just wanted to show you how you can do it manually too, just so that you know how a server is written, I mean, how a component is written, and what each line of code means when a component is also written. Now, if you were to go ahead and compare this, there is a constructor function and there is this ng on in it. We will get to these parts later in our playlist. Because for now, if I were to go into the nuances of ng on in it and a constructor, it would only create chaos and confusion in your mind. So that was about components for now. So it's time for our first assignment. Okay guys, so that is how you use and create components using the Angular CLI. Now, 
coming back to the server component that we created I would like to bring to your notice a few different things that you can do so first of all let's go ahead and analyze the selector part so if you have any experience with web development you will know that a selector is basically a way of selecting stuff or elements on your HTML page now when we say app server like this out here this could be anything this could be a property this could be a class or this could be an HTML element too for now this is an HTML element but let me just show you this can also be used as a class so let's see we say it's dot app server and let's go ahead and save that so this is going to be dot app server now let's go ahead and find where we actually used our server so we have used it app server like this now if you were to comment this out and let's say we put in a div that had a class and it said app server now as you see this is the server component that you are viewing and the sub server works so let's go ahead and inspect that let's go into the body that's the app root and then there's a div which has a class app server instead of an app server component so what we did was that we created an app server and we made the class a selector so the selector is basically a class now now that class can also have its own styling and that is basically how you do it now instead of actually writing your template urls like this you could also let's command this out you could also say something like a template so your template could be just a template and you are going to put your template in these quotes now this could be something like subserver okay so this will basically put the app subserver in this template so instead of a template url you could be using a template too and instead of a styles url basically you can do some inline styling now before we go ahead with our next topic what i would like you all to do is solve an assignment for me so this assignment will test how good you are at creating your components so let's go back and just change everything back to the way it was so let's save it let's save this let's save this save everything so out here we can just say app server again and now that creates an app server for us okay so this is save and now i want you guys to do a basic assignment actually so let me just write down the instructions for the assignment okay so for your first assignment this is exactly what you are going to do so as you guys can see on the screen i have put down three instructions so first of all what you have to do is create three components called red green and yellow now we have to use them in the app component part and then we have to give them some appropriate styling and probably an appropriate message so you guys can pause the video out here and go ahead and try and create these three components and then come back if you actually are successful or not also and check out the solution that i will provide you guys okay guys so that was the first assignment i just gave you all so i hope you guys had paused the screen when i told you that i'm giving you guys an assignment and i hope you guys actually try to solve it because in this part we are going to try and solve the assignment i just gave you so this part you can use to see how correct you were well it was a pretty easy assignment so i hope most of you guys got it because that means i could successfully teach you how to actually use components so for the solution we have created out here angular folder that says assignment one and it has nothing in it so let me just go ahead and open it with visual studio code out here if i were to go ahead and go to my source folder into the app folder and just go ahead into the spec.ts into the typescript file rather and we were to go ahead out here and i were to serve this you would see that there is nothing okay so if we were to just serve this file out here you would see that it is the normal application that ships with angular so let's just ng open and serve okay so as you guys can see it says welcome to assignment one and this is the basic application that angular ships with now what we're going to do is we're going to delete everything and we are going to start from scratch now let's go back and see what we actually wanted to do so what we have to do is create three components called red green and yellow so let's go ahead and do that first 
So to do create these elements first of all, let's go ahead and delete all this garbage that we do not need save it again and Let's just keep the title so to keep the title just pay attention to what I'm doing keep the title This is very you don't need to do this to get the assignment. Correct. All you need to do is Make the components. So this is just me being fancy with you guys. So this or we could say welcome to Assignment one make this an h1 so that it looks better Yeah, so welcome to assignment one So that's it now what we have to do is create three components So to create three components what we want to do is create a new Terminal in visual studio code so that we can create the components really easily and out here. We want to type ng generate component red and we're going to do this for three different times so we're going to have the red component. We are also going to have the blue component. And we are also going to have the yellow component. Now since we are doing this with the CLI, our app dot module automatically gets updated with red, blue and yellow. Now all we need to do out here is use them because that is the second part. We have to use them in app component. So our app component is out here. This is our app component. So what we can do is say app red this will produce the red part this will produce the app and blue part and this will produce the app yellow let's go ahead and save this now what we see is red works blue works yellow works so we have successfully created three components and we have put them in our app component part now what we need to do is give them their styling so let's go ahead and go into these separate components Let's open up their styling files. We want to say because we already know that it's a paragraph that works there. So paragraph will have border of. So since this is a blue component, we'll give it a blue border. So it'll be one px solid and blue. And maybe we can also turn the color to sky blue. I'm using very basic colors out here. Let's also copy this. Uh, because we are going to be using a very similar type of styling for red and yellow. So let's go into red and let's face that we want this to be red and this to be crimson. And let's go into yellow and let's say the same thing. This is going to be yellow. We could use here and we could also use another color, maybe a much more paler yellow. Let's keep it dark because fonts need to be dark actually. So let's save these. Let's save this file. Let's save this file. And let's save this file. Now let's go back and see how it actually is working. So blue works, yellow works. Um, we need to go and um, put up some more styling for the yellow part because that seems to be kind of going haywire. So let's go to yellow.css. Let's go here. So we have actually done this in the app component. Let's save this, go back to yellow, go back to yellow.css, paste this out here, and let's save it. So now our yellow is yellow, our blue is blue, and our red are red. We can also add some new styling to them by adding a background color. So this is also going to be a yellow, or we can rather choose some different yellow maybe. Let's make it much paler on the yellow side. Let's copy this line, put in red component.css. Okay, so for red, we can choose something of pale red sorts that makes it like that. And in blue, we can choose something of a blue sort. So for blue, we could go for a paler blue, and that should be much more paler. Let's save all of this. Now let's see. So yeah. We have a blue background, a yellow background. Why isn't our red background working? We haven't saved it, it seems. And our red background is working too. So we have successfully completed our assignment one. So I hope you guys are satisfied with the solution. I hope you guys could do it on your own too. So because that's exactly what matters. Okay, so now that we have learned about how components are the building blocks, we even made our own custom components and we even did an assignment on one. So it's time we move on to the next topic and that is data binding. So data binding is like communication. Well, what are we communicating? It's communication between your TypeScript 
file and your template so basically your business logic and your and what basically the user sees so suppose you click a button on a screen and you want to take some action according to that or you are retrieving some information from a calculation or from a server and you want to output that on a screen well you do that with the help of data binding now there are two types of data binding the first one is string interpolation and the second one is property binding so this is the way of you outputting something onto the screen so string interpolation and property binding so let's go ahead and see how we can do them so let's go back to our assignment that we had just done so first of all what we want to do out here is go to the modules and we actually want to remove all these components let's go ahead and just remove these components let's go ahead and remove these imports and then we can go ahead and just delete these files out let's delete that let's delete this let's also delete this now let's go back to our app component and we have to remove these so app module we have to actually save this too now that we have saved it we go ahead and see that it's just uh, it says welcome to assignment one now out here you see that we are using this double curly braces and this is string interpolation so what does string interpolation mean well it converts anything any variable any string like this into an interpolated format and it shows it to you on the screen so let me just give you a rather better example of a usage of string interpolation so let's go back to our app component.html and out here we want to say there is a paragraph and in this paragraph we are outputting some server status so let's say server is server with pid is go offline so we want to actually put out something like this so at this moment it will just simply say server with pid is offline right but what if our server had a certain name so server name let's say dash 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 with pid dash 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 is at a status of dash 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 let's see now what we need to do is go ahead and go into our app component.ts file so that is our typescript file and now what we are going to do is create a few of what of these variables that we need so first of all is server name and let's say the server name is apollo okay and we also need a server pid so server PID is going to be, let's say, 11. And we also need a server status. And then we can set the server status to offline. So this will be a string. So that's why we just surround them with our single quotes. So now we can say something like this on our components.html page. So if you remember, we were getting the title of our general application that ships in with Angular when you make a new Angular project. You see that it says, welcome to so-and-so application. So that was done with string interpolation, if you remember. It was the curly braces that held something like title in there, right? So out here, what we can do is put some variable or even a function that will return a string or anything basically that can be converted into a string and that will be displayed out here between these curly braces so what we can do is we can reference the server name so our server name is basically kept in like this and then with pid so we can put the pid out here so this is a number so the number can also be converted into a string so therefore string interpolation will work in this process and we can also put in the server status of course so we put in the server status by referencing the variable that holds the server status. OK, so now we have done the string interpolation. So let's go ahead and see what our output looks like. So server name Apollo with PID 11, that is process ID 11, is offline. Now, I had also said that we could put in a function out here. So let's go ahead and create a function. So in this function, we will basically toggle the server ID. So we can say toggle. So in this function, we will basically be toggling the 
server status so we will say something like toggle server status and this will return this dot server status equals to not okay so what we do out here is for toggling this we will say equals to false so if it's false let's just understand that it is going to be offline we could put in some logic to say that false will print out offline but let's not get into that for now so we can say something like or rather let's not deal with this let's do it the way it should be done not be lazy people now we can say there is a status flag and it is set to true or false in this case because it is offline now this dot server status flag will be made true out here so status equals to true so we're going to make it true or rather we could make it not of this dot server status status flag and status flag now that will work properly because this will basically convert it and there should be no spaces out there and we can say if this dot server status flag equals to true so we can say if this dot status flag equals true we have to open more braces and we'll say server status this dot server status will be set to online okay and there we go and after this has been done we can just return this dot server status right so basically what is happening out here is we have set a flag okay missing white space quick fix so we can put in a triple equals just to make sure it's exactly true and not only check the equivalence that is and also check the value so out here what we are doing is we are setting a status flag to false and according to that status flag we are changing the server status to online or offline okay so now that we have put in this function we can use that function by calling it in our string interpolation method so just instead of putting a variable we can put in the function and this will change the server status to online now basically what we are doing here is really simple is it's returning a string and it's being converted into a string okay so now that we have toggled the server status to online and we did that through passing a function in the string interpolation so now let's understand how we can do property binding so every HTML element has some property or the other. These properties list can be easily found on MDN, that is the Mozilla Developer Network. So let me just give you an example of a property. So let's say we had a button to toggle the server status further from offline to online again and again, instead of just being toggled from offline to online hard coded into the code. So let's say we had a button and let's say this said toggle server status, right? So if we had something like a button like toggle server status, so we have a button like this out here, but it really doesn't do much at this moment. But let's say just for the sake of showing property binding, let's say the button was disabled and you wanted this button to be actually enabled after two seconds that your website has loaded up just so that there are no discrepancies in the button press. OK, so we can achieve that by writing a constructor function in our class component. So out here you can make a constructor so we can say set timeout so we have to first give the time after which it will be enabled so let's say two and a half seconds so it's two and a half seconds and now we have to put in a logic of actually turning this button to be enabled so let's say we have a variable called button state so button state at this moment should be true because our button is disabled first it should stay disabled and then it should get enabled so we have to say this dot button state equals to false right so now that we have done that all we have to do is go ahead and bind this property so we do property binding by putting the property in between this square bracket and then binding it to the outcome of a variable or a function so out here we can say we are going to bind it to button state okay we need double quotes for this i'm sorry not single quotes so button state now what is happening out here after the constructor is going to get executed our button state is going to become false so disabled will become false and first of all it will be true because the button state being true for the first two and a half seconds 
and actually let's see this in action so our page is loading and after two and a half seconds our button becomes active so let me just show that to you again it's inactive for two and a half seconds and then it suddenly becomes active so this is how you perform property binding so what we just saw here is we saw string interpolation in action we passed a string interpolation arguments with variable names and we even did a function then following that we did property binding so for property binding we first created a button so that we can toggle the server status but we haven't really added that functionality yet we are yet to do that but what we did was we binded the disabled property of the button to a certain variable now this could have also been a function and it will be the same way you just pass in the function with the brackets and it'll work and now what we will see is something that is our next topic and that is event binding so event binding is basically um, binding dom events to certain logic that will reside in your typescript so we want to bind our toggle server status that we had created out here because we are basically toggling the server status and then returning the server status so we can basically do that by passing an event so every button has an event called click and to click we will pass the event toggle server status with the brackets now this will become active after 2.5 seconds and basically it's not working as we wanted it to so let's go ahead and inspect it okay so it's not working because we are toggling the server status out here and what we want to do is return the server status so it should actually work to be honest so this dot server status so if we were to just output the server status out here okay so we do not have a logic out here so to make it back to go offline so else we can just add something like else this dot server status equals offline so now that we have set up our function to even display offline and because we were first changing it back to online and there was no real logic to change it back to offline again so now that let's do that and now we can have a toggling happening out here so we can change it to online, we can change it offline. So now we have a button that can actually toggle our server status from online to offline and so forth and so on. So that was event binding and property binding. And we also saw string interpolation. So with the help of event binding and property binding, now we have a button that can actually make it offline and online. But there's another way that we can do this and that is two-way binding. So for two-way binding, what we are going to see is basically we are going to combine property binding and event binding. So let's try and do that. So for event binding, let's go back to our code editor and out here, let's go to our HTML page and what we want to say out here. Okay, so let's remove all this. So we can make this server information. So first of all, we can have a form. So basically, we can have an input of type text and this will take in let's say let's put a placeholder and let's put in server name let's also put a button below this and this will be a submit button or rather instead of a button what we can do to show two-way binding is put in a paragraph and we are going to type out our server name out here and we are going to put in the server name here so server name is going to be here so this is basically string interpolation and what I am interpolating is the server name that we had created. Okay, so this has a capital S, so let's not forget that. So our capital S should be out here. And what we are gonna do is basically use ng model. So to use ng model, what you need to do is go into your app module out here. So in your app module, what you need to import is basically the forms module. So to import the forms module, you have to say import forms module from other rate angular slash forms. So that's it. And we have to put this in single quotes. And out here, what we need to do is let's go ahead and see what is saying disable rule import spacing. So we basically imported the forms module and this forms module will have a functionality called ng model. 
So NT model will let us bind whatever is being typed to be actually binded to a certain variable. So we can put that ng model property to our input. So this ng model will be binded as an event and also as a property. So we need to pass in the server name. So let's see, we have a server name called Apollo out here. So it's already pre-filled with Apollo. And let's say we want to name our server something else. So let's call it the Jigsaw. So Jigsaw could be the name of a server. And as you guys can see, it is being automatically updated out here. So that is two-way binding. So just to give you guys the difference between two-way binding and one-way binding, what we can do out here is say, put a placeholder. So this is the same part. We will have server name. So what we can do is make another input. And this time around, we are going to put ng model as just a property. So ng model with camel casing. And we are going to say it will be binded to server name. So let's bind it to server name and let's see what happens. So now we have two inputs and everything is filled with Apollo. Now, if you see out here, if I go ahead and change Apollo out here, it is not automatically changing in the paragraph two because it is only one way binded. While out here, if we were to give the name Paul to our server, it would automatically update it everywhere. But if you were to go ahead and delete a little bit, it's not really updating it out here because it's not two way binding. You need a event to actually go ahead and submit this so that your event and your property gets binded together. And basically you have two way binding then. Okay, so that does it. And just to make this a little more interesting, let's make this something like H1. So we can put an H2 and let's say input server information. Okay, so once we have that ready, so we can say server name and the server ID will be the PID basically. So we have an input server name part and then we can display server information out here. So display, display server information. What we can do is let's just copy this out. So server PID. Is it the server PID? I constantly forget. It's server PID. So that's why server PID will be presented and server status. So now we basically have a small little server page going on. And we have a button that can toggle the server status. We have a place where we can input the server name. So what we just saw out here is basically we saw string interpolation. So all this output is being shown to you through string interpolation. We are binding a property to this button and with the help of that we are toggling it for the first 2.5 seconds. This is disabled now and this will become enabled. Then we saw event binding where we actually toggle the server status with the help of a button. And then we also saw two way event binding where we put in an input method or an input element and we are constantly displaying what is there in the input with the help of um, two way binding. So this brings us to our second assignment for today. And in this video, I would like to say that again, please try and solve the assignment on your own. And these are the instructions for your second assignment. So for assignment two, what you have to do is create a page that can take the input of a first name using two-way data binding. And you have to output the name using string interpolation. So again, for using two-way data binding, remember you have to use ng model. And to use ng model, you have to go and import the forms module and to your app into your apps.module.ts file and in that apps.module.ts file you will also have to declare it out there so don't forget to do all that and in the output you have to actually use string interpolation then you have to add a button to reset the name to a blank string so this should be something like property binding i guess i won't know until i solve it myself and again this button should be disabled if the name field is currently empty so I would suggest that you pause the video right here and you go ahead and solve this. And if you can't solve it, you can always follow along with me because I will be coding to the solution of this assignment right now. So let's go back to our code editor. And what we're going to do now is try and solve assignment number two. So I'm going to keep on editing the assignment project that we had made. I'm not going to make new assignment project. So what we're going to do is basically remove everything from here. Let's remove everything. We will also be needing some new logic. So this is not going to work for us. So let's go ahead and remove that. 
we also don't need a constructor function we don't need anything we just need the class to be there and that's all at this moment i will also let ng module be there in our apps.module because we will be needing it so i'm not going to edit this out so let me just say that i have saved everything and now all we have is a blank canvas that we can start developing on so our first instruction says that we have to create a page that can take the input of a first name using two-way data binding so let's see we want the user to know that he is inputting his first name so label and this is going to be for so going to be for first name so we can say f name something like this and then we can say first name and out here what we can do is put an input that has type text and it also has a name of f name so the label is now binded to our input this is how you should properly always code we also should put in a placeholder even though we have a label because that is just good practice so we are going to say first name in the placeholder and now we have a place that we can put in our first name in so we can also put in a space out here so first name is going to be here right and we also need to input our first name in a paragraph according to the second instruction so we can put it out in a paragraph and we can use string interpolation for this and we can just use variable called name because we are only dealing with one name there's no last name so we can just create a variable called name now we go back to our typescript and we create a variable called name and let's keep it blank for now okay we are not going to use double quotes we are going to use single quotes and let's keep it blank for now so now we can say our name which should be displayed out here so basically what we need to do is do a binding so that is pretty simple we learned that really easily that we can do this to the ng model and we can bind it to the property of name or rather the variable name that we just created so out here we will have a name and we can just go ahead and start typing now and our name gets typed out here now the other thing that we need to do is we need to add a button to reset the name to a blank string so first let's go ahead and create that button for ourselves so we need a button and this button should set reset name and basically it should have a function or an event whenever it's clicked so whenever it's clicked it should have a function that basically goes ahead and turns the name blank again so we can have a function called reset name so reset name is going to be our function so let's go ahead and create that function now so reset name is going to be our function and what we want to do is set this dot name equals to blank again we can actually do this without the event i guess so we can fix the missing white space let's see if we are actually if you do reset name it goes ahead and resets the name to blank so we have binded it to an event and that is the click event and we need reset name out here we are not passing anything because it is directly being binded to the property or rather the event out here so now we need to bind it to a property so the property that we are going to bind it to is disabled so the disabled property is going to now check a function basically to see if the name has any value or not so this can be really easily done by actually saying something like name dot length zero but we are not going to try and add code out here so let's just stick to the functions actually we could actually have done a tertiary operation and basically done it in one line but why do that so let's see check name so check name is either going to return true or false so now we have check name and what we can say is if this dot name equals to equals to and we can also set state so state is true we are going to need the state variable to actually handle the disabled functionality so if this dot name is equals to equals to equals to blank what we want to say is this dot state will remain true or what we can do is if it is unequals to this what we can do is say this dot state equals to so let's go over our logic again so if our state is true and if it is not an empty string rather we are going to turn our disable to false so if it is false out there what we need to do out here is say check name 
okay so we made a mistake we can't do that let's see inspect console and template can't bind to disable since it isn't a known property of button okay so disable is not the known property because it's disabled so that was the silly error that we had made now let's see let's go ahead and load it okay so check name is not a function okay so let's go ahead and use check name we actually forgotten to save this out here go ahead and put the white space there so now we have a button that can actually set the string to a blank string again but according to our assignment it says that this button should be disabled if the name is empty so this way we can actually practice our property binding so basically we have to bind the property disabled to a function that will basically return the state so let's say it is a function that is called check name and now let's go ahead and create this function so check name is going to be our function and put that in double quotes now let's go back to our app module out here so let's create a state first now the state is going to be false first of all and let's say we are going to have another function called check name and in check name what we want to do is check whether so we can do the checking part with an if statement so this dot name we are checking for the name if it is empty string and if it is an empty string what we want to do is make our button disabled and that can be done by just returning true in our state variable so we're going to set it to true and we are going to return it so return this dot state so if we return this dot state out here we are going to have a button now that is basically disabled okay first of all we need to go ahead and check what we have done wrong so we need to go ahead and save this so check name is actually being passed now let's go ahead and reload that so now we see that we have a button that is disabled but as soon as we start typing the button gets enabled and we can click it to basically put it back into disabled state and also making the first name string into a blank string so this is the solution to assignment number two i hope you guys had followed along with me and if you had any doubts when solving it on your own the doubts have been cleared now now let's move ahead and let's look at the last topic for our angular basics today and that is directives so what exactly are directives well let's head over to angular's site and let's see what they are saying about directives well it says that there are two kinds of directives out here so one is attribute directive and one is a structural directive so an attribute directive changes the appearance or behavior of a dom element so in short a directive is basically an instruction to the dom now this instruction may be to change the dom due to some attribute or it could structurally change the dom too so that is a structural directive so structural directives are basically used in places where you want to input a certain let's say a division like out here a division is being used with the directive ng if and we are outputting hero dot name out here so what this is is basically there is an if statement and we will get to what ng if means just in a moment but this is a directive and this has instructions written in a module which we will also get into future lectures about directives where we take a much much deeper look into what directives are and how custom directives can be built by you but for now we are just going to understand what a directive does so in short a directive is a structure and this structure gives instructions to the dom so let's look what a directive looks like and how directives can be made by just reading the documentation so to build a directive what we have to say is let's say we give a directive as app highlight so we have to create a directive say ng generate directive so this is a cli command out here so we can generate directives like that but for now what we are going to do is we are going to use some built-in directives to understand how attribute directives and how structural directives are actually working so the directives that we are going to be using are ng if ng else so basically if and else and ng4 so these are the three directives that we are going to be using today and after i show you how to use these directives i will also be giving you an assignment and that will be your last assignment for this angular tutorial and we will wrap it up after that in the future we will be actually discussing 
every single bit that we have learned about today that is components data binding two way data binding directives everything will be done in much more detail and when we are doing this in detail we will have an overarching project so we will be building a project through the course of this playlist and by the end you will feel pretty confident that you can go out there and pretty much crack angular interview job out there because we will be teaching you how to build an app and in the end we will also train you for angular interview questions okay but for now let's just focus on how to use the built-in directives that ship with angular so to use the built-in directives let's see what we can do so the first directive that we want to use is basically an ng if directive so let's see what we can do to show ng if so ng if is basically to show something structurally let's put up an h1 that says this is an example of ng if now we want to show something if a variable is true and we want to show something else if it is false right so we can do that by simply saying p so we will show a paragraph and let's say ng if so we are going to tie it up to an expression and we are going to call this expression a flag and we are going to say flag is true and we are going to say flag is false otherwise so out here to show flag is false otherwise we are going to use something called a local reference so a local reference is used within the ng template so for the ng template we have to give a local reference name so let's call it the else block and in the else block we want to put out a paragraph that says flag is false now we need some way to actually toggle this flag so let's create a button so we are going to say something like toggle flag and out here for toggling flag we are going to put an event and we are going to bind this event to a function that toggles our flag so we are going to call this function toggle flag okay so we have our template created now all we need to do is add the business logic for this so for all the logic that we need to do is create a variable called flag first of all so let's go ahead and delete all this that we don't need so we are going to have a variable called flag and flag will be first of all set to true now there is also going to be a function called toggle flag and in this function what we are going to do is we are just going to toggle it now to toggle this all we can do is this dot flag equals to not of this dot flag so this is a really easy way to toggle a variable and just now we can just return this dot flag so since we are doing that so now what we can do is save this and let's see how that actually works so it says flag is true and flag is false so flag is false is actually not being displayed because we have not referenced this local reference that we have created so we have a local reference and we need to create it and we do that by saying else we create the else block now let's go ahead and save that let's see flag is true and now flag is false flag is true flag is false so to make sure that we are actually putting up two different paragraphs so let's go ahead and inspect this let's go into our body let's go into app root and let's see this button so this has a paragraph created out here so let's toggle this and a new paragraph gets created which says flag is false now flag is true flag is false flag is true flag is false so this is a brilliant way to actually show something very conditionally now I can show you this is a uh, other block that we are actually showing instead of one block being constantly just modified it is a separate block in itself so that is a very important thing to note so let's go ahead and do that again so let's save it and now let's go ahead and see what we can get so in our head or rather in the body we have the app root and now we have paragraph that says flag is true and now there is another paragraph with the id flash which is a very wrong way to spell false but it proves the point that this is a new block in itself so this is how you can use ng if now let's look at another interesting inbuilt directive that ships with angular and that is ng style so with ng style what you can do is you can give dynamic styling depending on a certain condition now if you analyze what we have out here we do have a certain condition which is whether flag is true or flag is false 
Now what we want to do is we want to color this. This is an example of NGIF into red or green if flag is true or false respectively. So we can do that very easily with the help of something called ng style. So with ng style what we do is we give a property. Now this property may not be in single quotation marks. So you can say color and what you can do is you can put an expression. Now you can say something like a function that is get color and you could execute that. Now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and create this function called get color. So we are going to get the color and we are going to return a color that is probably a string according to the flag. So if so what we want to say is if this dot flag is equals to equals to true we want to return we want to return green and if it is false we want to return red so let's go ahead and see so as you guys can see this is green right now and this turns red and then turns green and red again so what we did basically we passed an expression and in this expression we are putting in a color and the get color method is returning a string which either says red or green so this is how you can dynamically add styles to your elements on your html page now another way to do dynamic styling is with the help of ng class so what we can do out here is we can add a class to an element dynamically so let's say we have another h2 and let's say this is just an example of ng class now what i want to do is we want to turn this so the class we want to add is basically let's call it white and we want to add this when get color returns true let's say so we just want to go ahead and paste that logic out there and now what we have to do is go into the app component css file and create a class called white and this class will basically put a black border border 1px solid black it will rather let's make it a red and then we want a background color of let's say black and we want the font color to go white so this is a bunch of styling that we are adding which is basically the real reason you use classes in css so that you can use a bunch of styling together now that we have created the class let's go ahead and save all our files and let's go ahead and see what it looks like so this is what it looks like this is just an example of ng class now when this is set to false the class is removed let me just show that to you so if we go ahead in the body part and go into app root and just look at this class that will be added so we add a class called white and then we remove a class called white class called white and this is how ng class can be used to put in all sorts of dynamic styling into your html elements with the help of ng class okay so the next directive that we are going to have a look at is called ng4 so let me just give you guys a quick example of how to use ng4 before i dive into the last assignment of this tutorial so ng4 is used when you actually want to iterate through an array so let me just show you what i mean so let's say you had a bunch of names or let's make something very viable so first of all let's call this something like the student roster so h1 so this is called the student roster now suppose you had a method so input and what we are going to say is placeholder is name and out here we also want to display the name so all the name of the students we will want to display so student roster and there will be a button to say submit so this will say submit student name and this will have a function so whenever we click it we want to add the name that we just entered into let's say an array so we can say add is the name of the function now what we want to do is go ahead and first of all create a student roster so student roster is equals to let's say let's add some pre-built students so aria and let's say rohit and let's say opasana now what we want to do is let me just fix these white spaces up 
Now what we want to do is we want to display the student roster and then we also want to add to the student roster every time the button is clicked. So we have a function for that and it's called add. And basically what we want to do is we want to push an element. So that could be a current name. So current name could be blank for now. And let's leave it like that. And what we want to say is this dot student roster dot push. We want to push in this dot current name. So what this will do is this will push in the current name. Let's go ahead and make a place so that we can display it. Now the whole point is that we want to display it in one single item. We do not want to create, let's say, a paragraph for every time this list has to be populated. So what we can do is we can simply create a list item and out here we can just say ng4, let's say names in the student roster. So student roster. So is that how we had named it? Student roster, and it's exactly how we had named it. And what we want to display out is the names. So what we have done right now is we are pushing in something, but what exactly are we pushing in? Well, we need to add that to our input. So what we need to do is say ng model, and we are going to ng model this into the current name. So now that we have done that, now what we want to do is we just want to interpolate the name out here. So this will just display the names. So this is going to be names. Let's go ahead and save that. Let's see that if it displays the names. So we have the names Arya, Rohit, and Upasana. So let's say someone like Rahul also joins the class. And we can say submit student and Rahul is now added to the student roster. Okay, so this is how you can basically use ng4. We have one list item and basically it is going around and circulating through everything that is there in this array just out here. So now that we have seen the usage of ng if, ng if else, and ng for, let's go ahead and do our last assignment. Let's not forget we also saw how we can use dynamic styling. So we are also going to incorporate that into our assignment. So let me just go ahead and type out the instructions for your assignment. Okay guys, so this is your last assignment. I will again remind you that for assignments, you have to pause the screen and try and do the assignment on your own. And then you can compare your solution with the code along part that comes after the assignment. So for assignment number three, we have create a button to toggle a paragraph display. The paragraph could be saying anything. So after that, we have to lock the number of times the button was clicked. Okay, so it says button out here, but its button was clicked. And after the fifth click, we have to give some specific style to the log. Okay, so this seems like a pretty easy thing to do. What we have to do out here is basically get rid of everything that is here. And let's first create a button that says toggle display. And then we can add a paragraph that says lorem ipsum. So lorem ipsum is just a random paragraph. So let's go ahead and see this. So this says toggle display, but toggle display at this moment does nothing. So we have to put a functionality into the click. So click will basically return true or false. So we can bind this to a function that let's say toggle display. So this will return true or false. So we have to go ahead and create the toggle display method first. So toggle display. And what we want to say is this dot state, let's say. So let's create a state variable first. So state is going to be true. And toggling is basically what we had learned that we have to turn it into something that it is not. So this dot state equals to not of this dot state. And that should do it for us. So this will toggle the display. So now that we have toggled the display, now all we have to do is bind this logic. So we say ng if, and we only want to show this if state is equals to equals to true. So if that is what we have done correctly, we are toggling the display and this is true. Now what we need to do another thing is according to the instructions of the assignment is that we have to log the number of times the button was clicked. So what we need is basically a counter to count the number of times we have clicked the button. Now every time the button is clicked, we want to actually increase the counter and we can simply do that with an incremental statement. 
so this dot counter now what we want to do is we want to say out here we want to create a paragraph and this will have ng4 and so click of clicks so rather counter so for ng4 this needs to be pushed into an array so we are going to say button click okay so there's another way to do this we don't really need a counter or rather we can make counter into an array itself and when this is clicked all we need to do is say this dot counter dot push a counter dot length plus one so we are going to say this dot counter dot length plus one so the length initially is zero so this should just go ahead and add it to this counter now what we want to do is we also want to cycle through this array of counters so clicks in counters and what we want to do is we want to print out the click information so let's see so now that we have actually put the logic to push the length of a counter into our array we need to do and cycle this array so to cycle the array we are going to create a paragraph and we're going to say ng4 and we're going to say clicks of counter and what we are going to try and interpolate out here is the counter or rather the clicks and let's see if that works so out here we have our display we're going to click it once click it twice and we can see it goes on and on and on and we have kind of created a counter and this is kind of logging it all down now that we have set up our counter for our toggling all we need to do is follow the last instruction and that is after the fifth click we have to give some specific style to the log okay so we can do this with the help of ng styles so ng styles let's see we want to make the color of our font blue only when get length is more than five so get length is a function so this will return some value or the other so let's go ahead and create that too so get length is going to react and create if let's see this dot counter dot length is greater than four then we want to return the string blue else we want to return the string black so now we have a function that returns something and we have binded that function with the color style with the use of ng style directive so let's go ahead and see if this works for us so let's toggle the display one two three four five and that has turned our list into a blue list just after five so this is how you would approach the solution to assignment three Before understanding what exactly is React, let's see why it is important to learn React. Now, there are so many JavaScript frameworks that are available in the market, but still, React comes into picture. Let's dive a little deeper and find out the reason why React.js was needed. The previous frameworks were using a traditional data flow model, just as you can see on the screen. Here, the data is received from various sources like initial data, real time data, and user input data, which is passed to the dispatcher. The dispatcher then forwards the data to the store from where it ultimately comes to the view. Now the view is the part where the user interacts with the application. So whatever you see on the browser as a web page is nothing but the view itself. So what exactly happens at the back end of the frameworks using this traditional data flow? Each time new data is added or any data is updated at the back end, the browser reloads the web page and repeats the whole process all over again. Only after this, we can see the updated data on the view. But this traditional data flow has one major drawback. That is, it uses the DOM or the document object model. DOM is basically an object that is created by the browser each time a web page is loaded, which can dynamically add or remove the data at the back end. But each time any modifications were done, a new DOM is created for the same page. This repeated creation of DOM results in unnecessary memory wastage and a decrease in application's performance. Moreover, manipulating the DOM was very expensive. Therefore, there was a search for new technology which could save us from this trouble. So this is where React.js comes into picture. 
With React.js, you can divide your entire application into various independent components. React.js applications still use the same traditional data flow, but something has changed at the back end. Take a look at the diagram that is shown on your screens. So now, each time any data is added or updated from the back end, React.js uses a new tactic to deal with it. Instead of reloading the entire page, what React does is it destroys the old view. After that, it renders the view components with updates or the new data and then places the new view in place of the old one. As a solution to the memory wastage due to DOM, React introduced the virtual DOM concept. You might be curious about what virtual DOM is and how it solves the problem. Do not worry, guys, because I'll be discussing that later on in the session. For now, let's understand what exactly is React. React is a component-based library which is used to develop interactive UI or user interfaces. It is currently one of the most popular JavaScript front-end libraries, which has a strong foundation and a large community supporting it. Please make a note over here that React.js is only a front-end library and it is not a whole framework. It basically deals with the view component of the MVC or the model view controller architecture. In React.js, everything is a component. Consider a one Lego house as an entire application. Then compare each of these Lego blocks to a component which acts as a building block. These blocks or components are integrated together to build one bigger and dynamic application. The biggest advantage of using components is that you can change any component at any time without affecting the rest of the application. This feature is most effective when implemented with larger and real-time applications where data changes frequently. Each time any data is added or updated, React.js automatically updates the specific component whose state has actually changed. This saves the browser from the task of reloading the whole application to reflect the changes. React.js was developed by Jordan Walk, a software engineer working at Facebook. Facebook implemented React.js in 2011 in the newsfeed section. However, it was released to the public in May 2013. After the implementation of React.js, Facebook's UI underwent a drastic improvement. This in turn resulted in satisfied users and a sudden boost in Facebook's popularity. So now that you have a basic idea of what is React, let's move on and take a look at the features of React. JSX. JSX stands for JavaScript XML. It's an XML or HTML-like syntax used by React. It extends the ECMAScript so that XML and HTML-like text can coexist along with JavaScript React code. This syntax is used by the preprocessors like Babel to transform HTML-like text found in JavaScript files into standard JavaScript objects. With JSX, we can go a step further by again embedding the HTML code inside the JavaScript. This makes HTML codes easy to understand and boosts JavaScript's performance while making our application robust. A virtual DOM. Like an actual DOM, a virtual DOM is also a node tree that lists the elements and their attributes and content as objects and their properties. React's render function creates a node tree out of the React components. It then updates this tree in response to the mutations in data model caused by various actions done either by the user or by the system itself. The virtual DOM basically works in three steps. First, Whenever any of the underlying data changes, the entire UI is re-rendered in the virtual DOM representation. Then, the difference between the previous DOM representation and the new one is calculated. Once the calculations are completed, the real DOM will be updated with only those changes that have actually been made. You can think of this as a patch. In a virtual DOM, the changes are applied only to those elements which have actually changed or updated. This will not just make our application faster, but also there is no memory wastage. Testability. React views can be used as functions of the state. Here, state is basically an object which determines how a component will render and behave. Thus, we can easily manipulate with the state of the components, which we pass to the React.js view and take a look at the output and triggered actions, events, functions, etc. This makes React applications quite easy to test and debug. Server-side rendering or SSR. Server-side rendering allows you to pre-render the initial state of your React components at the server-side itself. 
with SSR, the server's response to the browser becomes only the HTML of the page which is now ready to be rendered. Thus, the browser can now start rendering without having to wait for all the JavaScript to be loaded and executed. As a result, the web page loads faster. Here, the user will be able to see the web page in spite of React still downloading the JavaScript, creating the virtual DOM, linking events, etc. at the backend. One way data binding. Unlike other frameworks, React.js follows the unidirectional data flow or one way data binding. A major advantage of one way data binding is that throughout the application, the data flows in a single direction, which gives you better control over it. Because of this, application state is contained in specific stores, and as a result, rest of the components remain loosely coupled. This makes our application more flexible, leading to increased efficiency. Simplicity. The use of JSX files makes the application really simple, easy to code and understand as well. Even though you can use plain JavaScript over here, using JSX is much easier. React's component-based approach along with the distinct lifestyle methods also makes it very much simple to learn. So that was about the features of React. Okay, so now that you've understood the features of React, let's move on and take a look at the prerequisites that are required in order to learn React. The first and foremost prerequisite is HTML. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and it is the standard markup language for creating web pages and web applications. A markup language is a computer language that is used to apply layout and formatting conventions to a text document. Markup languages make the text more interactive and dynamic. It can also turn text into images, tables, links, etc. The next prerequisite that you will need to know is CSS. CSS basically stands for cascading style sheets. CSS is a technology that is proposed and developed by the World Wide Web Consortium, or the W3C for short. It was released to help free web developers from the tedious process of inline styling and make styling a separate entity in itself. Next up is JavaScript. JavaScript is a lightweight interpreted programming language with object-oriented capabilities that allows you to build interactivity into otherwise static HTML pages. The general purpose core of this language has been embedded in Netscape, Internet Explorer, and almost all of the web browsers. Following JavaScript is NPM. NPM stands for Node Packet Manager. It is the default packet manager of Node.js that is completely written in JavaScript. It was developed by Isaac Z. Schluter. It was released in 2010, and since then, it is responsible for managing all the Node.js packages and modules. NPM is the world's largest software registry, which is completely free and open sourced. Developers all over the world make use of NPM for sharing software. Code editors are IDEs. Code editors and IDEs or integrated development environments are platforms where programmers write their code and produce their final products. Some examples are Sublime Text, Atom, Visual Studio Code, etc. So basically, if you want to write your React code, you will need to make use of any of the code editors or IDEs. Okay, so now moving on towards the next topic, which is the React architecture. As mentioned earlier, React is the V in the MVC architecture. The M or model architecture is provided by Flux. Flux is an architectural pattern that enforces a unidirectional data flow. It controls derived data and enables the communication between multiple components using a central store which has authority over all the data. Any update in data throughout the application must occur here itself. Flux provides stability to the application and reduces runtime errors. So now let's take a look at some of the important concepts in React. The first thing that you should be aware of is components. In React.js, everything is a component. If you guys remember, I've already given the one Lego house application example earlier on in the session. Just like the Lego blocks are combined together to make a single structure, components in React are integrated together to build one bigger and dynamic application. So therefore, in React, the entire application can be modeled as a set of independent components. These components basically serve different purposes. Components also enable us to keep the logic and the view separate. In React, multiple components are rendered simultaneously. State and props. 
state is the heart of react components. They are basically the source of data and must be kept as simple as possible. Basically, states are the objects which determine the components rendering and behavior. They are mutable and can create dynamic and interactive components. States in react are accessed via this state function. States also have something called as state lifecycle. So basically, we need to initialize resources to components according to the requirements. This is called as mounting in react. It is critical to clear these resources taken by components whenever they are destroyed. This is done in order to manage the performance and is called as unmounting in react. It is not essential to use state lifecycle methods, but you can use them if you wish to control the complete resource allocation and retrieval process. Props. Props is the shorthand for properties in React. They are read-only components that must be kept pure or immutable. Props are always passed down from the parent to the child components throughout the application. So therefore, all the user needs to do is change the parent component state while the changes are passed down to the child component through props. On the other hand, a child component can never send a prop back to the parent component. This helps in maintaining the unidirectional data flow and is generally used to render the dynamically generated data. Keys. Keys in React provide identity to components. Keys are the means by which React identifies components uniquely. While working with individual components, we do not require keys as React takes care of key assignment according to their rendering order. However, we need a strategy to differentiate between thousands of elements in a list. So this is where keys come into picture. If we need to access the last component in a list using keys, it saves us from traversing the entire list sequentially. Keys also serve to keep a track of which items have been manipulated. They should be given elements inside the array to give elements a stable identity. Debugging in React. Now there will be a point when a developer goes through a roadblock. It could be as simple as a missing bucket or as tricky as segmentation falls. In any case, the earlier the exception is caught, the lesser is the cost overhead. React uses compile time debugging and detects errors at an early stage. This ensures that errors don't silently turn up at the runtime. Facebook's unidirectional data flow allows clean and smooth debugging, fewer stack traces, lesser clutter, and an organized flux architecture for bigger applications. Event handling and manipulation of state. Whenever an event such as a button click or a mouse hover occurs, we need to handle these events and perform the appropriate actions. This is done using event handlers. So those were some of the important concepts of React that you should know when you're learning React. So now, talking about the learning curve of React. React, unlike Angular, has a shallow learning curve and it is very much suitable for beginners. The ES6 syntax is easier to manage, especially for smaller to-do applications. In React, you code in the JavaScript way, giving you the freedom to choose your tool depending upon your need. On the other hand, Angular expects you to learn one additional tool that is TypeScript, which can be viewed as the Angular way of doing things. In Angular, you need to learn the entire framework if you're just building a simple UI application. Now let's move on. So once you're done with learning the basic concepts of React, you will have to adopt the project-oriented learning approach. This is because whenever you create a project, you will have a 360-degree learning. This is because when you create a project, you will have to do everything by yourself. Therefore, you'll make use of all the programming concepts, resulting in better understanding and implementation. Remember that you do not have to master the world in your first project itself. So start off by choosing a very simple one. Complete it by yourself and try your best not to copy anything from anywhere else. As you proceed, you can take up bigger applications and work on them. It is sure that you will face difficulties while making your applications. However, it comes with the reward of learning. If you are stuck at some point in your project, try to break down your problem into minor parts and then work on each of them one at a time. Now, once you've decided to learn React, remember that you're not alone. There are a number of developer communities that will help you along the road. In this session, I'm going to be discussing about GitHub, 
Stack Overflow and Edureka community. GitHub, as many of you would be aware of, is the world's leading software platform that brings together developers from all over the world. It allows you to build your programs, share your work, or discover what you are looking for. You can also engage with other programmers by asking them your doubts, etc. Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is another open community that entertains anyone who wants to code. It will provide you with some of the best answers for even the most trickiest questions and errors and will also help you share your knowledge with others using Stack Overflow. Not to forget, if you have any doubts or queries regarding any of the technologies, you guys can also check out the Edureka community website and get all your queries answered by experts. Also make a note that the key to remember what you learn is to share. So make sure you share what you learn with others. Last but not the least, stay updated. Technology sees new heights every day. The version that you learn today will get modified in the upcoming days. So make sure you keep yourself updated with all the latest React versions and update your projects accordingly. Now, React.js installation. How you install the React.js in your application? This is very, very important to understand. Now, when I talk about React.js installation, so you can use it or you can install it in your environment by using the script tags either in a new HTML file or in your existing HTML file in an existing project. So if you are interested in playing around with React, what I want to give you that you can use online code playgrounds. So I will show you that. So what you can do is that you can use online playgrounds. For example, you can use glitch. You can use code pen. You can use code sandbox also. So these are some of the you can say open playgrounds which allows you to write code in react JS. If I talk about this particular code pen .io website. So what you can do here is that you can write the HTML part. You can write your CSS and you can write your JavaScript as well. But to configure this environment, what you have to do that you have to click on this gear sign in JS besides the JS. Once you click over it, you have to select the React libraries, which is first is React JS and second is React DOM .development .js. These two libraries you have to search from here and then add it. And another is JavaScript preprocessor, which you have to add. So once this is done, so that you are ready to play around the React.js code in these, you can say online editors, which allows you to write code in React.js. But if I talk about the actual installation in your project or in your website, how you can add React to a website. So you can add React to an HTML page. So you can add React to an HTML page. So when starting a React project, a simple HTML page with a script tag might still be the best option. Okay. It only takes a minute to set up. It will take just a minute to set up the React JS in your existing HTML file. Now I will show you how to add a React component to an existing HTML page. You can follow along with your own website or create an empty HTML file for your practice. But before that, if I talk about React JS installation, you have to download some of the dependencies in your environment. So first one is download and install the NPM. You can open the command prompt and go to a folder. You can write the command npm start installation and then you have to install the webpack using npm. You have to install react and then Babel. Babel is used for JSX because internally JavaScript needs to be rendered on the browser. So what are the things which are required for react JS installation? So the first and foremost file is webpack.config.js. Now what is this file all about? It contains the information about the dependencies. What are the all dependencies is there and the files from where browser should start rendering from. So it allows you to give the information of your startup file and then you will have a HTML file which contains a complete HTML template which is used by the browser to render the elements and then there will be a JSX file which contains the description of what all components we want to display on our web page and how they will behave. So let's get started and we will see that how we can use React JS in an empty HTML file, how we can add the dependencies. And before starting that thing, let me tell you one thing that before learning React JS, you should install Node.js in your environment. This is official 
website of Node.js from where you can download the Node.js version. The left hand side is the LTS version that is long term support version and the right one is the current version. You can install any version you want while working with React.js. That's not a problem at all. At the same time for the beginners for learning the JavaScript. This is a very good URL. Uh, I would recommend that it allows you to understand complete JavaScript. From here you can learn JavaScript if you are a beginner and you want to learn then React.js concepts. OK, so let's get started. So what I'm going to do is that I have created a file. So first of all, you have to add a DOM container to the HTML. So what I have done is that in the plain HTML file, I have added two script tags. So you can uh, just like this add the script tags in your HTML file. One script tag is for React JS library and another is for React DOM. So first of all, you have to add a DOM container to the HTML and add the script tags. OK. So what I have done is that I have open HTML page where I want to add it added. A, you can say a div which is having a root div which is having an ID as root. So once this is completely set up, then I have added the script tags. So what are the script tags I have added? One is react.js and react.dom.js. Another script tag which is required for react.js application is babel.min.js which is acts just like a preprocessor. Once it is done, then I am ready to create a React component. OK, so what I have done is that in the script tag, I have just used React DOM dot render. Now, what is this React DOM? React DOM is a class or you can say API which contains a method called render. So React DOM dot render and this particular React DOM dot render methods takes two arguments. It is very important to note that React DOM dot render methods takes two arguments. The first argument is your HTML or you can say JSX element. The second argument is the placeholder where you want to render your data or you want to render your element. So that is how we write react dom dot render. So let me save this file and let's run this file. So if I run this file on the web browser. So here is the output of this file. Hello world. This is a simple plain react JS file where I have added the script tags for react JS. One is for react JS. Another is for react DOM and the third one is required for the preprocessing of the JSX component which is used over here in the H1 tag. I have just written hello world and that is how it is rendered on the browser. OK, now let's check another example. So I have one more example to show over here. So I have created two files index.html and a JS file. So let's see this index.html file what I have done. So in this index.html file, I have added some h2 tags p tags and then there is a div tag having a ID and then there are two script tags for react JS and react dom.js and in this particular HTML file, what I'm doing is that I'm creating a react component in a custom JS file. So what I have done is that I have created a file like button.js. This is a custom file which will be next to my HTML page. And after the started code in the like button.js, if you see like button.js, what I have done that I have created a component. So this is class component or you can say ES6 standard component. OK, so what I have done that I have created a class like button which extends from react.component. As we said that it should have a constructor and super passing the props to this class. I have set the initial state this dot state equal to like false and every component should have a render method and a return statement. So in the render method, I'm just checking that if this dot state dot like it will return me that you like this and return in the on click calling a handler this dot set state where I'm setting the state that liked equal to true. So initially liked was false. And finally it is clicked the button is clicked the state will be set as true. Similarly react dom dot render as we mentioned that it takes two arguments. One is your element and another is your placeholder where you want to render the output. OK, so let's see the output of this particular demo. So you see here it is giving me the desired output. What is the output? So see what I have done is that in the HTML first of all I wrote add react in one minute. This page demonstrates so this is just a simple static tag or you can say static text which is shown on the screen. Now the important part there is a button. OK, so on the click of that button 
what I am doing is that I am setting the state. So I am setting the state from false to true. So if you see in this example, if I click on this button like this uh, state has been telling me that you like this. So that is how we can create components or you can say class based components in react JS. So let's go ahead and see what Node.js is actually. So if we speak about Node.js, it's a powerful JavaScript framework, or I might say it's a runtime where you can run JavaScript on the console. It is developed on Chrome's V8 engine. So if anyone doesn't know what a V8 engine is, let me just tell you what it is. So if I check out the v8.dev, the official website of Chrome's V8 engine, you would see that it is an open source high performance JavaScript and WebAssembly engine written in C++. And you know, more or less, this is the engine that runs on the Chrome browser. So you would see that whatever your Chrome browser understands, it would be the same thing that Node.js also understands. So the creator of Node.js thought that, okay, this is an open source JavaScript engine. Why not implement that in a platform which enables you to run JavaScript on the server? So this is the reason why Node.js understands JavaScript. So that is one thing that we would like to also keep in mind. So it's something that runs on Chrome's V8 engine and it compiles JavaScript natively into the machine code. That is all because of Chrome's V8 compiler that we have. And it is basically used for creating server-side web applications and also network applications actually. So mainly Node.js is used for. And basically if it is a data intensive application, Node.js is something that is specifically made for that. Let's see how that happens basically. If we talk about the features of Node.js, it is open source. It is simple and fast. It is asynchronous, highly scalable. You would face no problems in scaling your Node.js application. It basically works on something called a microservice architecture as well. And it facilitates that microservice architecture really well. It is a single threaded model, which means it is not resource intensive. And yet it is fast, you know, yet it allows things to be done in parallel. We'll see how that is done. And then there is no buffering. Basically, there is no waiting as far as Node.js is concerned. And that is because of a concept in JavaScript, which is called event loop. We'll see more about that as well. And it works on so many platforms. So that is some brief of the feature. Let's see Node.js architecture. And before going into the architecture of Node.js, we would also like to see the traditional architecture. So traditional architecture, if we speak about traditional server architecture is basically where every client request is managed by separate threads. So there is a multi-threaded model going on in normal server architectures like Java, for example, it's a multi-threaded application or a multi-threaded setup altogether. So where your web application runs on multiple threads and various client requests are processed parallelly. Now, there is nothing to take away from this model because it is really good and it has been working throughout years when Java is at this point of time, Java is actually one of the best languages and secure languages to be programmed in. However, this is resource intensive because you can see that there are so many threads going on in parallel, which means your server or your machine should be something which is capable of running these many threads. However, if you talk about Node.js, it only runs on single thread and still it processes requests in parallel. So one thing that I would also like to clarify here is in the background or maybe under the hood, if you may say, Node.js doesn't process any request in parallel, but it goes through an event loop where once the request comes, it goes into the process and Node.js doesn't wait for the output of the request to come in while it takes in the next request. So as and when the first request, for example, gets the output, it would just respond for the output or with the output to the respective client, basically. So, you know, in the background or under the hood, it is basically running only one thread, which is not resource intensive. And it is at the same time processing requests from so many clients. And it provides a virtual feel that everything is running in parallel, but everything is not. So that is all because of event loop that is going on. So that is basically the architecture. And then we talk about something very important as far as Node.js is concerned, which is called Node Package Manager. Now it is called NPM in short, and it was primarily known as Node Package Manager. But nowadays it is not known as Node Package Manager because it is doing so many things than package management. It's doing so many other things as well. We'll see what it is. 
So if we talk about the official definition, it's a package manager for Node.js packages or modules, which has been added as a default installation from Node.js version 6 or 0.6 onwards, and then it's stuck. It is already there in any installation that you do in Node.js. If you are a Java programmer, you can relate this with Maven. And if you are a PHP programmer, you can relate it with uh, Composer. So it is the same mechanism where NPM has a repository of so many libraries and then the repository serves whatever the package you need for your project. And if we talk about the features, it provides and hosts online repositories for Node.js, which can easily be downloaded in our project using a command line. So it provides a command line utility as well. And it also allows you to manage the repositories or the versions of libraries that your project may use. So we'll see what are the versions and what are the libraries that we are talking about. So the libraries that I'm talking about, when I say libraries, it is just Node.js modules. So Node.js modules, or if we talk about the module system, there are core modules, there are local modules, and then there are third party modules. So core modules are the ones that are actually available in the default installation of Node.js. You don't have to program anything. You don't have to install anything else. Just Node.js to get the core modules working. Few of them are listed in here like HTTP, URL, query string. We'll be using them. And there are some others as well, which we'll be using today. And then local modules. It is something that a programmer builds. It could be a function. It could be an object. It could be anything. The programmer builds and the programmer exports so that other team members or other programmers can import that module and use them. So it's something that a programmer would build. It's like a custom module and then third party module. This would be installed through the NPM repository. So if we speak about NPM in this particular case, let me just also open up the NPM website. So it is basically npmjs.com. And you can see that it has so many repositories there are so many companies that it is serving and all. There are so many repositories available as well. Let's just search a few repositories in this particular case. I'll search one of them. If we talk about React, you might have heard of React. React is one of the repositories that is available in NPM. You might have heard of Angular. That is also one of the libraries that is available in the NPM repository. You might have heard of jQuery. You might have heard of Bootstrap. These are like naming just a few of them. There are so many, so many repositories that are available. Even Express that we are going to use is one of the libraries that is available in this particular repository of NPM. So you can see here that Express is one of the libraries that is to be used. So we'll be installing Express and seeing. By the way, this is the way you install any third party library from the NPM repository. All right. So that is the third party module and you would be using NPM install or NPM I to be in short to install this particular repository. Now, let us see the package.json file. Package.json file in Node.js is the heart of the entire application. It's basically the manifest file that contains the metadata of the project. Now, at this point of time, let me just create a Node.js project and see what this package.json file looks like. And then we'll analyze what this file actually is. So, let me just create a folder here, Edureka. And in this folder, I'm willing to, you know, initialize a Node.js project. So let's say I'll call it Node.js demo, or maybe I'll call it task manager, even better. We'll try to create some of the task manager functionalities in here, and it'll be an API that will be creating or a web service that will be creating. We'll see what it is. So in this task manager, I'm going to initialize a Node.js project. And in order to initialize a Node.js project, you need to have Node.js installed in your computer which means you have to go to the nodejs.org website and you can download this LTS version. This is a current release, which is basically experimental. It'll have all the latest features, but it is prone to be erroneous at some time. So, you know, generally for development, you don't use this one, but you use this one. But say if you want to check out the new features, you can also install the current release, but we'll always go with the LTS. And I already have this installed. You know, clicking on this, will allow you to download the MSI file that is a setup file and then you can just double click on that setup and just install it on Windows. And in Mac as well, the setup is really simple. And in Linux as well, probably it'll give you a deb file, for example, if you're going for Ubuntu. So the setup of Node.js would be really straightforward. But after the setup is done, what you have to do is 
you have to just check whether Node.js is installed in your computer or not. And you'd be checking it this way, Node hyphen V. That'll give you the version of Node.js. And you can see that I already have it installed and I have the version 10.15.3, that is the LTS. And then I'd also check NPM. If you recall, we saw that NPM is something that comes in inherently with Node.js altogether. So we'll be going for NPM hyphen V. That will give you the NPM version. So we're all set and we're all ready to go. So let's go for creating or initializing a Node.js project. It is something like this, npm init dot, which means current directory. So if we just hit enter, I think dot is something that is not to be done, right? So this would ask you certain questions like what is the package name? Let's say I want the same package name as task manager. I want the version to be one, okay? The description, let's say this is a task manager project, all right? Entry point would not be significant at this point of time. So we'll just keep it as it is. No test command as of now, no Git repositories. I'm not going to even commit that to a Git repository and no keywords as well. Author, I can say Edureka and license, no meaning as of now for a license because we are not going to make it public or anything. So it tells us that is it okay and also it tells you that it's about to write to this particular file package.json inside our task manager folder. So which means after I say yes, there is a possibility of this being written into a file called package.json inside my project. So let's go for hitting enter. Let's say yes. And if I now check out my folder, you see that the package.json file is in. Let's just open this up in our editor. You see that here is the package.json available with every information that we provided. Now, this is a very basic package.json. There'll be so many things inside a package.json file and a normal or a real world package.json might look something like this, where there are so many things like the name of the project is there. Then there is something called version as well, description of the project. What is the starting point of the project, which is your main script to run first. There are certain scripts. We saw that we didn't provide any test command. And then there are certain engines. What all tools do you use to run this project? Who is the author? What is the license? There are certain third party modules that we would like to have. You can see in this particular example that there is Express that is there as a third party module which we'll be using. And then there is dev dependencies. Like when you go into a development environment, like for example, our computer, there'll be certain dependencies that will be there and that will be registered inside the dev dependency. Then there is repository related information, which we didn't provide actually. If you want to see what are the bugs and all, there has to be a separate URL and the homepage. So that is your package.json file, which got created by the way, when we initialized the Node.js project. And you can also manually create it, but it's better that we go for npm init as a process. So now let's go for Node.js basics. So if we talk about basics, it's like any language basics. And the main thing that we need to check out as a basic is the data types. So there are certain primitive data types, there are certain abstract data types like non-primitive data types. So primitive data types are string, number, boolean, null and undefined. Abstract data types are object, array and date to name a few by the way. There are so many others but these are to name a few. So say for example if I create an application let's just create a string as a variable and let's see how that works. So let me just create an app.js file and in this I'll create a variable and I'll be very specific. I'll say first name and I'll say first name to be Edureka. So this is a variable that we declared. And if I want to show this variable in my console, I'll just do console.log first name. So when I do this, the main perception is basically if I want to run this app.js, I might have to create an HTML file where I might have to include this app as a script file. And then I might have to execute the HTML file and open the console to see this particular output. But if you have installed Node.js on your computer, which we have, you'd actually be able to run this particular app.js really easily. Let's run this one. For that, I would have to go into my project. Let me just clear the screen and run this one. And really simple to run a Node.js application. It's simply Node and the file name that is app.js. And you can see that it displays the first name in my console. So whatever I do as console.log gets displayed in my terminal. That is something that I would like to keep in mind. And remember, this is a string that we have created, but there's no concept of a strict data type. 
So basically the first name can also be something like this. A first name can be reassigned to let's say a number and that will not be a problem for JavaScript. That is the core nature of JavaScript. It's not strictly typed. So that is something that I would also like you to keep in mind. So there are so many data types that are available which we have created a string and then there are so many others. This is how you create a variable that we already saw and then there are operators. Now as I said like there is something that is already similar to all the other programming languages. Variables are one of them, operators as well. However, there is one operator that is pretty unique and that is the triple equal to sign. So say for example, if I go for something like this, var let's say age one is equal to 30 and var age two is equal to 30. And then let's say var result is equal to age one, double equal to age two. Now I'm using this double equal to similar to any other binary operator. Like I might go for plus and similarly I'm going for double equal to now. This is because this is a comparison operator. This would return either true or false and this would get stored inside the result variable. So this time I know that you might have guessed it. It would be returning us true. And if I do the result, if I go for console log of result and if I execute this app.js, you see that it returns us true. Now. If I go for a string, all right, and when I declared a variable in the previous example, we saw that there's no strict data type. So this would not actually check for the data type. This will just check the value. And though it may seem that it should give us false, this would give us true. And the fact is like JavaScript doesn't care about data types. So if say, for example, you want to also compare the data types along with the value, instead of double equal to use triple equal to. And that way, this would give us false. There is so much going on inside or in this particular two examples that we have. But for now, you can remember that double equal to doesn't compare the data types while triple equal to also checks the data types. But then again, there is so much going on under the hood, which it's not in the scope of this particular session. But just keep this in mind. There's a unique operator that is available for JavaScript specifically. And then there are certain other languages that might have these operator. But JavaScript is the one that came up with this. All right, so this is one thing. And by this time, you might have got an idea on how we run an application or how we run a file in Node.js. So this is one other thing that I would also like to mention where functions are created. Say for example, if I have a function to create, let's say function say hello, and I pass in name inside it, and I return, let's say hello, plus name. Now plus here is a concatenation operator and that would return us a name or a hello message with the name whatever we have passed in. So I can do this like console.log say hello and let's say hello to Ravi. All right. So if I run this particular file, it will give me whatever output we expect which is fine. Now one thing I would also like to tell you is in JavaScript there is a provision where you can create a function without a name, an anonymous function which is also something that JavaScript came up with, a function with no name. And if this is the case, then how would you call the function? So for that, you can do something like this, var say hello is equal to a function, something like this. And then the rest of the thing remains the same. Function gets called as, as normal. What we have done is we have created a variable and inside this variable, we have assigned a function rather than a value. So, and then we are calling the variable as a function. So again, if I run this particular code, the output would be the same. Just keep in mind that function here can be anonymous in JavaScript, all right? And then objects. Now object, there are two ways you can create objects. One is through object literals like var, let's say student is equal to a constant object, which has, let's say name Ravi and email Ravi at gmail.com for example, right? And then we can do a, something like this console.log student.name, right? And then student.email and so on. And that would display whatever the name is basically. So an object.property can be done. And then there is a constructor pattern as well available. But it's okay if you don't go for that. But then there is another pattern which uses object constructor to create an object. Now going into Node.js core modules. One of the modules is file system, that is the FS module. FS module, if you want to include, or any module, if you want to include, you go for this syntax. A variable is equal to require and the module name. And this would be something like this, for example, var fs is equal to require 
FS. Now for this FS module, you don't have to install anything else, but Node.js has to be there and which is there and uh, FS module would be available. It's a core module in Node.js. So let's say for example, if I have a file called hello.txt and it has some data, all right? And if I want to read this file, I'd be able to do this like fs.read file and it asks me the path of the particular file. So let's just give the path basically. I can try with the relative path first. So it'll be basically hello.txt. Let's see what it gets. And the second argument that we need to pass is the callback function. So Node.js or any JavaScript platform would work more on the basis of callback function. That's how it creates the virtualization of so many things working at the same time. All right, so I would go for a callback function and this function, anonymous function, would go for two arguments. One is error and one is data. Let's see, if there is no error, then we'd go for logging the data inside the console. Let's see what data we get, all right? So if I run this file now, hopefully I should get the contents of hello.txt file. Let's see. Here, I don't get the content, but I get something called a buffer. That buffer is basically some container that contains raw data. Out of this buffer, I can get the string basically. So let's say if we go for buffer dot to string, which is a function which will convert the data to a string. So now it will give me whatever the content hello world has. And similarly, if I, for example, have to write something inside a file, let's say if I want to write something inside a file and then once the file is written, I would like to read out the file. We do something like this fs dot write file and write file would again go for the path and I would be going for the data as well and the data is something like something like this and once I go for the data data could be any data type by the way could be boolean could be object could be any data type and then I go for a callback function Now the callback function would have something only one argument here which is error if there is no error, like if no error, then I would like to read the file, right? So then I can go for fs.read file. So I can just take this whole thing and I can put it in here. So what I have done is I have written something into the file. And if there is no error after writing whatever I have written, I would be trying to read that file. And in here, if there is no error, I would like to display the content. So hopefully this should give me how are you? Or maybe let's see whether it overrides, whether it appends. Let's see what happens. If I check out this, you can see it gives me how are you. And if I go into hello.txt, you can see that it has overwritten the particular content that was there before. So this is an FS module demo. This is how you'd be reading and writing files. I might like to also try and read and write JSON in some JSON file that might actually give me a feel of an API that has been created. Let's see how that goes. And then there is something called events. But before going for events, I would like to create a server first. So let's just create a server. And you know, the events are basically something that we would be working with where we would be emitting certain events and then we'll be listening to those events. Let's see how that whole mechanism works and how the event handlers would work and all. But before events, I would like to go into creating the server through the HTTP module because server is also a network application which is something that Node.js would enable us to create. So we'll create a server through the HTTP modules and then I'll come back to the events. Let's see how that goes. All right. So let's just get rid of this FS related code and I'll again go for the FS code in some time. I would also get rid of the hello.txt. I don't need this. Right. And then what I'll do is I'll create a server in here. So for the server, I'll go for var HTTP is equal to require HTTP. And then there is something which is really simple to create a server in Node.js, as opposed to all the other languages, the server is something that a programmer would create. So say, for example, if you compare Node.js with JSP or Java, there is Tomcat Apache web server that is already available. If you compare Node.js with .NET, there is IIS server that is already available. If we talk about PHP, there is Apache server that is already there, compiled and available. 
in Node.js, there is no server. So the concept of Node.js being a server, it's something that is not true. In Node.js, it is just a runtime which enables us to run JavaScript on your machine so that you can create a server if you want to. And creating a server, it's not a big deal in Node.js. This is how you create a server. HTTP dot create server. That's it. And I'd save it in a variable called server. And my server would listen to the port number 3000. The server dot listen 3000. All right. So this is what your server would listen to. And if you want, you can also provide the host name here, which is by default localhost. But if you want explicitly, you can provide localhost as the host name. So your server would be listening to localhost and 3000. And after it, you know, starts listening, I would also like to provide a message. And again, the callback function or an anonymous function would come into the picture. So function. And so log will go for server started on port 3000 right okay so what have we done we have simply created a server by http create server and we are listening on port number 3000 so that is what it is and then at the end we are displaying some message on the console so let's see one thing that you would notice is in the other programs the application actually ended like once we are done with the whole program you see that you get the command prompt back but in this case, when we are listening, the server is constantly listening to the port number 3000. So the application would not end in this particular case. You may have to end the application forcefully by hitting control C. So let's see. Now, if I run it, you see that server started on port number 3000 and the application is not ending. All right. So if I go for, say, localhost port number 3000, there'll be something that might happen. You see here, that the request is sent to the server but the server is not responding because we have not programmed our server to respond with something so here the server is not responding while the server is running all right so if i stop my server you would see it would tell you that the site can't be reached so basically what that meant was previously the server was running so if i for example run the server this would again let me just open up localhost 3000 this would again start to load, but the message that the site can't be reached won't come because the server is still there. The site is reached, but the server is not responding to us. So let's program our server so that it responds to us, in which you go for a callback function inside your create server method. And this callback function has two things, request and response, two arguments. And if I want to send a response in this particular case, you go for response.end, all right? And if I, let's say, server works, that's the message that I want to send. All right. So what this would do is, this would send a message to your browser saying server works. So let's just take that message. So for that, because I have changed something in my app.js, I might have to stop this and I might have to restart my server. So server listening on port 3000. And if I now refresh, you'd see that it gives me the message server works. So this is pretty cool. We have created a server in like almost three statements, right? So that is something on how you create a server. But generally what people do is people use this functionality of creating a server along with Express and then create a server through Express, the framework that we were talking about. So we will see how to create a server through Express. But before that, let's move back to the events and let's see how events would work in this particular case. Now, when you talk about events, there are two methods that you would be generally going for. One is called emit and one is called on. So remember these two methods, emit and on. Let's see how we can make it work and what are events basically or how an evented system would work. So in that case, we again use a core module, which is called events. So var events is equal to require events. Again, a Node.js core module. You don't have to do anything to include this one. And in this particular case, we'd also create an event emitter. So var event emitter is equal to events dot event emitter. And it should be a new event emitter actually. All right. Now, if we go for the presentation, you would see that they have also emphasized on two things that is on and emit. So we will see what these things are. All right. So now in this particular case, let's go for something called 
event dot on now event dot on or not event dot on actually event emitter dot on now this function it's basically an event listener now whenever an event occurs this function would listen to that particular event all right so this would listen to the event and event dot on we would have the name of the event and let's see what we can do as a function there's a callback function that is also something that is involved in here so we will see event emitter where it will go for event dot on and something inside as arguments but as of now i'll just keep it this way and i'll simply go for something on the emit side of things i would like to emit an event and let's see how that goes all right so in this particular case what i would do is whenever there is some request on the server i would like to emit an event and then i would like to listen to the event and log something on the console all right so let's see in this particular case i'll go for event emitter dot emit and i can name the event anything the event that i'm trying to you know emit is basically someone has requested to the server so what i would say is on request maybe just someone i can name it anything that's why i'm naming it a very bizarre name so someone requested that is an event name and um, if i want i can pass in some data as well but as of now i'll just keep it this way i'll just emit someone requested and when i would like to do something when someone requested so i would go for event emitter dot on someone requested and function that is a callback function let's just go for console dot log and i'll just say a request has been done on the server something like this on the console all right so this is an event emitter and basically on is an event listener all right so we are triggering an event or maybe i can call tri event trigger that will be a better name so this is an event trigger and this is an event listener so event emitter dot emit is an event trigger and event emitter dot on is an event listener so whenever this would be triggered this event would be executed and this function would be executed so let's see so if i now rerun my server because i have changed something in my node.js app i'd have to rerun this it says server started on port 3000 i'll just refresh and it'll give me server works that is fine but if i check out on the console you'll see that a request has been done if i re refresh again you see that a request has been done and then there are two requests that is because one is checking whether the method get is available on the server or not and this the other request is basically executed with the method get actually so there are two requests but we don't need to you know go into detail in that particular case uh, however one thing is for sure that whenever the event emitter is triggered we can execute the on method and we can listen to that particular event all right and if say for example i want to pass in some data let's say test right and this data can be taken into the function the anonymous function as an argument and i can just display that for example data that should display test to me so whatever you pass in could be a string could be a boolean an object anything could be taken into the function as an argument you can name it anything and you can display that particular argument as well inside the console let's rerun our program and let's refresh the server is requested and you can see request has been done on the server and test this particular data is also being displayed so that is the event emitter you can emit events and you can listen to events whenever the event would be emitted the listening would happen all right so this way you know our node.js server becomes an evented server and this is really good if we want to create a chat application or any real time application event handling would actually help us create a good real time application so that is where this would basically come into the picture so you know you can check out socket io there is a library called socket io which helps you to create a chat server this would heavily use event emitter on and emit methods all right so this is the one now we have created the server using the http module and if we talk about the server you can always see that the client would be either a web browser a mobile browser or an application that might request to your web server and the web server would contain your server file that is the app.js that we created plus some application logic as well if you want and the logic might be taking data from the data layer or any external system and it might be serving the request back to the client 
So basically this data would be taken into the business layer and to the web server and the web server would respond like response.end sort of a thing would happen in this particular case. So this is how the request and response cycle would go on. And then we see here that it's creating a web server using Node.js. You can pause this particular portion and you can also try out this whole thing. I think you would know how a server is created. You already know that and then there are certain other things that are listed in here which you can try. Now we'd go for third party module or a third party package you may say or even we can call it a library. It is called Express.js. In Express.js it is a Node.js framework which is uh, basically facilitating the management of data flow and routing as well. It is very lightweight and nowadays if you create a node application for an API or a web server, Express.js is something that you would definitely have. So it's like basically the part of the language itself right now. It facilitates faster application development. It provides applications with template engines. Two of them are Jade, which is nowadays which is known as Pug and EJS, two of the very popular ones, but then there are so many others. It helps, you know, building single page applications, building multi-page applications as well. It helps you to connect with any database, MySQL, MongoDB, Redis, etc. The configuration is really simple. We'll see how you create a server in Express. It's really simple. And it also helps you to handle errors or maybe it gives you a good facility to define error handling processes so that your maintainability of the application is something that would work. So let's just create a demo in Express and let's see how that goes. And as I said, I'd be using HTTP and Express together to create a server. That is an ideal way of doing it. So let's just get rid of everything and let's just start with the Express server. For that, I'd have to include Express. Var Express is equal to require Express. Now, when I do this and if I execute this, you might expect that this might work. But remember, Express is a third party library. It's a third party module. So in that case, you would have to install that particular module on your system. Obviously, if I run this, let's say if I try to run this, this will give me an error. Cannot find the module Express. So let's install Express in here. In order to install Express, and remember the file structure that we have, we have an app.js file, a package.json. There's nothing else in here. So let's just install Express. Let's say npm install Express. You can go for install the whole word or I as a short form, it's all fine. I'd install Express and this would actually download Express from the NPM repository and install it on your local machine. And you'd be able to also see where that Express exactly gets installed. So you can see that Express is installed, 48 packages installed, all right. And now you can see a change in the file structure. There was already package.json and app.js in my file system. While there is a folder called node modules created and package underscore lock.json also created. So node modules folder would actually have the library express. And then there are so many other libraries that express depends on which are also imported and installed. So now if I execute this, this will not give me an error. However, we have not created a server. We have not listened to a port number. So we'd be doing that through express. Let's do that. What we would do is express and brackets like we are calling express as a function and we'd be saving it in server, a variable called server. So this is how you create a server in Express, pretty simple. And what we would do is server.listen 3000 and then the same drill, like 3000. I'd not specify localhost because I know that it is localhost. And at the end, a function that tells that the server is listening to 3000. So console log server listening to port 3000. All right. So the Express is required, like included. A server is created and the server is listening now. Let's just rerun the application. And because the server is listening, the application would not stop. It'll keep on listening. And let's go into our browser and let's refresh. Now, this time around, when we refresh, you'd not get that whole loading thing, but instead you'd get an error. And it says that it cannot get slash. This is actually not an error on the server side. The server is all okay. The thing is that we have not programmed our server in a way that it would address the get request on the root path. This is our root path. So there is no get request addressed on the root path. That's what it says. So what we'll do is we'll address the get request. Like we'll do something like this. We'll go for server dot get. 
Well, actually, rather than naming it as server, because I would like to use this server identifier somewhere else in some time, I'll go for app. And I'll go for app.listen this time around. All right. So app, and this also tells you that you don't have to name it server. You can name it anything that you want. So this is my express app and app.get slash and a function request and response, the same request response function that we had, but it is now specifically for the root path. And in here, I can go for response dot, either I can go for end or I can go for send and response dot send, let's say express works. I can also, let's say, have an h1 tag so that our browser displays it as a heading that can be done. And now let's rerun the application and hopefully the root path get request is addressed. So let's go for it. I'll stop this, rerun the application. By the way, there's a utility called NodeMon, which would help you to run your application automatically once there are some changes. But this time around, we'll just, you know, rerun the application manually. So if I now refresh, you see that it gives you an H1 which says express works. So which means this is all done. Your root path is addressed. Your root get request is done. But what I would like to do is I would like to go for something called tasks. Okay. There is no route that is tasks that is defined yet. We not programmed our application so that it addresses the get request on the tasks. In this get request, let me just go for the get request first. So app.get slash tasks is what I want to have the server address and function request and response request and response so now i can go for response.send i can go for another h1 which says tasks work if i now restart my server and remember to stop my server i'm just pressing in control c and if you're a mac user it's command c that is stopping the server and now if i refresh you'll see that tasks work now this works now what we have done here is we have created two routes one is app.get for the root and one is app.get for the tasks. It could be app.post, it could be app.put, app.delete, app.patch. Anyone who is familiar with the REST API would be familiar with all these words. Your server can address any request, get, put, post, delete, patch, any request that you want to address. Here, we are just going for get request. All right. So now what I would like to do in here is I would like to return something from a file. Like for example, I'd create something called db.json. It's a JSON file. And in this JSON file, I'd like to go for, let's say a key called tasks. And tasks would be basically an array of tasks, which would be learn node.js. Now in JavaScript, you can create an array with square brackets. Similarly in JSON syntax, that'll, that'll work. Let's say learn JavaScript, learn express. So these are the three tasks that I have. And what I would like to do is from this JSON file, I would like to read these three tasks and I would like to return them as a response. So let's see what we do in this particular case. Let's see how that works. And that response has to be in this particular case, right? In this particular response.send, I'd like to read the file and then send the response. So we know that what we use for reading the files, which is the FS module. And also we know what we use to create a server as well. Here we have created a server by express, but generally people always use a mix of express and HTTP to create a server. Let's see how that happens. What I'll do is, well, first I'll go for HTTP is equal to require HTTP. And for this, we obviously we don't have to install anything. It's a core module. And I'd go for var server is equal to HTTP dot create server right and app is something that i'll be passing in as an argument so my server is created which has all the goodness of express so instead of app.listen i'll go for server.listen all right again this will all stay the same it'll, it'll listen to the port 3000 and then go for a message that a server is listening to port 3000 and so on and so forth so what we have done is we have included express we have included http we have created an express app we have created a server with the create server method, we have passed on the express app as an argument, which means all these routes would be something that would be addressed. And then at the end, we are listening to port 3000. Now, this is the common way that people would use to create a server and an express app together. All right. So now let's rerun our program. Let's see what happens. 
it gives me an error and that is a typo. So let me just resolve that. Right, and now let me just rerun the program. So uh, again, listening to port 3000. This would not probably give me anything. You can see that it is still loading because there's no response that I have programmed in here, which I would like to. But say for example, if I go to my root path, it gives me express works. So that is all working fine, which is cool actually to be using express and Node.js server together. All right, so now I'd like to read from the db.json. So obviously I would need var fs is equal to require fs. And in here, I'd go for fs.read file. I'd go for the path that is db.json, the relative path, and the callback, which has two things as far as read file is concerned. One is error and one is data. Let's go for console.log or not even console.log. Let's just do a response.send. Once you have the data, you go for data.toString would be something that we'd be going for. Let's see what we get in this particular case. I would have to restart my server and this works. And if I go for tasks, this gives me an object that has an array of tasks. So I would not like to have the whole object, but I just want the array of tasks to be there. So one would think that, okay, I can do something like this. Like let's say var tasks is equal to data dot to string dot tasks. That is the object that we want to get. But the thing is like this to string would convert the whole data to a string, which would not have that property called tasks. So if I want to convert this string to a JSON, I'd like to do something like JSON dot parse. It's one of the core JavaScript methods. This would then have the property called tasks. So JSON dot parse data dot to string which we are passing in as an argument and that will convert this string to a JSON and then I'm going for tasks as a property. At the end, I can simply send in tasks. So that will give me the plain array that we require, all right? And specifically, if I want to send JSON, I'll just do response.json rather than going for response.send. So I'm being specific in here. So let's just stop this and start the app again and refresh. And now you see that you get the array. Now you might not get the same output that I'm getting as far as the color is concerned because I have a, an extension which is running in my Chrome browser that is a JSON reader or something like that. I had installed it years ago. So that is the thing. But the more important thing is you're getting the plain array from the file that we have. So in this case, we have used almost all the things that we have learned. We went for Express, we went for HTTP combined. It was a server that was created and then the FS module to read something from the file. This would probably be something that we would like to go for from a database. Like we'd like to get a database connectivity done and get all the data in and then read data from this particular case. But as of now, read file would be enough and this might give you a good introduction to Node.js. So this is what it is. And further down, you can try out more routing and more database connectivity in Node.js. See how that goes for you. introduction on databases. Now putting into definition, databases are basically a collection of organized information that can easily be accessed, managed, or even updated. Now database systems are very important to your business as I've mentioned earlier, because they can communicate information related to your sales transaction, product inventory, customer profiles, or even market activities. Database is usually managed by a system which is known as database management system. Now there are several advantages of using database, like it reduces data redundancy, it reduces updating errors and increased consistency. There is a great amount of data integrity and independence from applications programs. There is improved data access to users through use of host and query languages. Together, the data and the DBMS along with applications that are associated with them are referred to as database systems, often shortened as database. Now let's understand some of the advantages of using database. As I've mentioned earlier, it is extremely easy to update data and maintain data. The next thing is data security. Now there is high security management for each of the data 
or databases that is used here. Now, database security refers to a range of tools that controls and measures a design which is designed to establish and preserve database confidentiality and integrity and availability. The next thing is there is a uniform data management and administration, which means there is concurrent access and recovery from crashes. Many users can access or even update the database at the same time without any interference. The next thing is data access and auditing. Now, data auditing involves observing a data so as to be aware of the actions of database users. Usage of database will allow you to access and audit your data. Basically, database administrators and consultants often set up auditing for security purposes. For example, to ensure that those without the permission to access information do not access it. Now, there are types of databases used for storing data. First thing is centralized database. Basically, centralized database is a type of database that stores data at a centralized database system. It comforts the users to access the stored data from different locations through several applications. Next, we have distributed database. Unlike a centralized database system, it is distributed all over the system and data is distributed among different database systems of an organization. These database systems are connected via communication links. Next, we have relational database. This database is based on the relational data model with stores in the form of rows and columns and together forms a table. Further, we have cloud database, a type of database where data is stored in a virtual environment and executes over the cloud computing platforms is known as cloud database. Here are AWS, Microsoft Azure among the few comes into picture. Up next, we have object-based data model approach for storing data in the database systems. Next, we have hierarchical databases. It is the type of database that stores data in the form of parent-child relationship nodes. And then we have network database. It is the database that typically follows the network data model. Here, the representation of data is in the form of nodes via links between them. Finally, we have no SQL database. NoSQL database is a type of database that is used for storing a wide range of data sets. It is not a relational database as it stores data not only in a tabular form but in several different ways. It came into existence when the demand for building modern application increased. Therefore, NoSQL represents a wide variety of database technologies in response to the demands. With that, we shall move ahead and understand what is MongoDB. MongoDB is a document database with the scalability and flexibility that you want with the querying and indexing that you need. Put into definition, MongoDB is a document-oriented, no SQL database used for high-volume data storage. It is an open source document-oriented database that is designed to store a large scale of data. It is basically categorized under the no SQL or not only SQL database because the storage and retrieval of data in MongoDB are not in the form of tables. Basically, MongoDB table is developed and managed by MongoDB itself. There is a corporation which develops MongoDB known as MongoDB.inc. Now, this is under SSPL or Server Side Public License, and initially it was released in the year 2009 of February. Now, as I've mentioned, it does not involve any table or SQL. Rather, it involves a BASIN format. Since MongoDB uses no SQL, the format of storage is BSON, which is similar to JSON format. Now, here I might also add that MongoDB is a document database with the scalability and flexibility that you want with querying and indexing that you always need. Now, this is an official definition given by the creators. Basically, MongoDB stores data in flexible JSON-like document, meaning fields can vary from document to document and data structure can be changed over time. So basically, data model maps to the objects in your application code will make the data easy to work with. 
ad hoc queries, indexing, and real-time aggregation provide powerful ways to access and analyze your data. I'm sure you might be wondering what these are. Here, we'll look at all of the features of MongoDB in our Features section of today's video. With that, let's move on and understand why exactly do we need MongoDB. Now, here are the few reasons as to why we need to use MongoDB. The first one, MongoDB is basically built on a scale-out architecture that has become popular with developers of all kinds of developing scalable applications with evolving data schemas. Now, the next thing is that MongoDB makes it easier for developers to store structured or unstructured data, and it uses JSON-like format to store documents. Now, this format directly maps to native objects in most modern programming languages, making it a natural choice for developers as they don't need to think about normalizing the data. Now, MongoDB can also handle high volume and can scale both vertically or horizontally to accommodate large data loads. Basically, MongoDB was built for people building internet and business application who need to evolve quickly and scale elegantly. Companies and development teams of all sizes use MongoDB for a wide range of reasons. Now, these reasons, we'll go ahead and look at it. First reason being document model. Now, document data model is a powerful way to store data and retrieve data in any modern programming language, allowing developers to move very fast. Next thing, we have fully scalable. Basically, this means that MongoDB's horizontal and scale-out architecture can support huge number of both data and traffic. Next, it gets us started fast, which means MongoDB has a great user experience for developers who can install MongoDB and start writing code immediately. The next thing is deployment options. MongoDB is available in any major public cloud such as AWS, Azure, Google Cloud through MongoDB Atlas. In large data centers through the Enterprise Advanced Edition or free through Open Source Community Edition. Now, finding community. Due to extreme development nature of MongoDB, MongoDB has developed a large and mature platform ecosystem. It has a wide range of community of developers and consultants. Now, with these ample reasons given, I don't think you need any more justification as to why we need to start using or learning about MongoDB. I hope this session is getting interesting now. Hence, with that, let's look at the features of MongoDB. Now, as I've already mentioned, MongoDB is a scalable, flexible NoSQL database. It has high number of good features and most important features. The first one being ad hoc queries. Now, ad hoc queries for optimized and real-time analytics is a main and important feature of MongoDB. While designing the schema of database, it is impossible to know in advance all queries that will be performed by the end users. In this case, ad hoc query is a short-lived command whose value depends on a variable. Each time an ad hoc query is executed, the result may be different depending on the variables in the question. MongoDB supports field queries, range queries, and regular expression searches. Queries can return specific fields and also account for user-defined functions. This is made possible because MongoDB indexes BSON documents and uses MongoDB query language. The next thing is indexing. Indexing is used basically for better query executions. Now, the number one issue that many technical support team fails to address with their users is indexing. If it is done right, indexes are intended to improve search speed and performance. A failure to properly define appropriate indexes can usually and will lead to a mirage of accessibility issue such as problems with query execution and even load balancing. MongoDB allows you to index and it can be created on demand to accommodate real-time and ever-changing query patterns and application requirements. They can also be declared on any field within any of your documents, including those nested within arrays. Next thing is replication. 
Replication is basically used for better data availability and scalability. When your data only resides in a single database, it is exposed to multiple potential points of failure, such as several crash, service interruptions, or even good old hardware failure. Basically, in MongoDB, replica sets are employed for this purpose. Primary server or node accepts all write operations and applies those sum operations across secondary servers replicating the data. And if the former primary node comes back online, it does so as a secondary server for the new primary node. The next thing is load balancing. Now at the end of the day, optimal load balancing remains one of the holy grails of large scale database management for growing enterprise applications. Now MongoDB supports large scale load balancing. The platform can handle multiple concurrent read and write requests for the same data with best in class concurrency control, locking protocols that ensure data concurrency. Basically, MongoDB ensures that each and every user has a consistent view and quality experience with the data they need to access. Sharding is one of the main things. When dealing with particular large data sets, Sharding, the process of splitting larger data sets across multiple distributed collections or shards, helps the data distribute and better execute what might otherwise be problematic for the queries. Without sharding or scaling, a growing web application with millions of daily users is nearly impossible. All operations in sharding environment are handled through a lightweight process called Mongo's. Mongos can direct queries to correct shard based on the shard. Now here, I've briefly gone across all the features of MongoDB. First one being ad hoc as discussed. The next is indexing and replication, load balancing and sharding. With that, let's move on and understand the applications of MongoDB. Now looking at the applications of MongoDB, the first one that we have is content management systems. Fundamental of MongoDB approaches and practices are introduced in content management use cases, which would be done using familiar, simple examples and problems. The method for modeling user comments on content like social media and blog spots are introduced by storing comments. A model is proposed for designing a website content management systems by metadata and asset management in MongoDB. The next application is product data management. Now basically for e-commerce website, product data management and solutions, one can use MongoDB to store information because it has flexible schema well suited for the job. One can also manage a product catalog and learn practices and methods for modeling from the product catalog document. Operational intelligence. Basically, MongoDB is beneficial for real-time analytics and operational intelligence use. Now, one can learn storing log data document to know about the approaches and several ways to store and model machine-generated data with MongoDB. Several other few applications of usage of MongoDB are balanced features, which means one can use MongoDB to get multiple balanced features. For example, that one wants to use some features like queuing, map, FTS, but don't require it a lot, which is easily possible through MongoDB. Consistency over availability. If one prefers consistency over availability, then he can get a specific version of consistency in MongoDB applications. Denormalizing the data. Re-denormalizing the data is tough to do and also very expensive. Also, you will not be able to change the shard keys when you are running MongoDB. If you want to use a blend of secondary indexes and key value looks up, then you can use MongoDB, but you cannot use it for too many secondary indexes because it will start scaling poorly. The next thing that we have is data on single server. One of the best features of MongoDB is that it was made intentionally suboptimal to enable sharding on a single server. Next advantage is ideal for querying. As discussed earlier, if the rate of querying is very strong to the database, then MongoDB is ideal. Ideal for documented oriented. MongoDB is the right choice only when there are few relations and 
one wants to scale it. Polyglot database system. MongoDB has an excellent capability to pick up the best part of all the databases, which makes it even more amazing to use as large scale systems that are not using only a single database. Finally, we have something called as mobility and scaling. MongoDB is very scalable and flexible, which gives fantastic database solutions to deal with different kinds of environments. With that, we jump into the final session of today's video, which is companies using MongoDB. Of course, this might interest you as some of the top-notch companies use MongoDB as their database. eBay being one of the multinational company that provides a platform for customer sales, it is currently running a large number of projects in MongoDB like merchandising categorization, cloud management, metadata storage, search suggestions, etc. MetLife is one of the leading companies that we have heard. It uses MongoDB to benefit programs, annuities, insurances, etc. There are more than 90 million customers in Middle East, Europe, Asia, Latin America, Japan, and even United States. MetLife is using MongoDB not only for that, but also for its advantage of customer service application called The Wall. Now, Shutterfly is one of the most popular online photo sharing and it uses MongoDB to manage and store more than 6 billion images, which has a transaction rate of up to 10,000 operations per second. Now, Shutterfly earlier used Oracle, but later transitioned into MongoDB. Aadhaar, India's unique identification project, which has the biggest biometrics database in the world, MongoDB is being used here for database. It uses to store massive amount of demographic and biometric data for more than 1.2 billion Indians. MongoDB is being used for storage of images in the Aadhaar project. EA is an online multiplayer game that is using MongoDB database for its game called FIFA Online. MongoDB can easily handle complicated things that need synchronization with each other entirely. Why do we need REST API? Now consider a scenario where you're using the Book My Show app. I'm sure that you know all of you must be using Book My Show app on a regular basis, right? Now obviously when you use this app, you must have observed that you know the application needs a lot of input data as the data present in the application is never static. So what I mean by that is when you consider the Book My Show app, all the time the movies are getting updated on daily basis. Even the show times and the places where the movies are shown or maybe not just with respect to the movies but also with respect to the events, the data keeps getting updated on a regular basis. So where do you think we get this data from? Well, this data is received from a server or most commonly known as a web server. So the client requests the server for a required information via an API and then the server sends back a response to the client. Over here, the response sent to the client is in the form of an HTML web page. Now, do you think this is an apt response that you would expect when you send a request to the server? Obviously no, right? Just imagine yourself. If you're searching for a data for a specific movie at a specific place and a specific time, do you expect an HTML page back as a response? Well, I'm assuming the fact that you would also say a no, right? So since you would also prefer the data to be returned in form of a structured format rather than a complete web page, the data returned by the server in response to the request of the client is either in the form of a JSON format or in the form of an XML format. Now both JSON and XML formats are sent because you know they have a proper structure in which the data is represented. Now if I talk about the JSON formats and the XML format, so as you can see on my screen, so for example, let's say you know we want to find out the data of the movies which are coming soon at a specific city. So what you can simply do is if you just send a request of this particular information to the client, the server returns the data in either the JSON format or the XML format. So the JSON format, it shows as, as you can see on my screen. So basically there's a city and then there's movies, categories, and in the category you have coming soon. When you come to the XML format, in the XML format section, you basically have cities, movies, and then again we have a category section which shows coming soon. So over here, if you observe the JSON format has basically format of an object where you know the object values are returned to the user. 
and coming to the XML format the XML format follows a hierarchical data structure in which the data can be returned now this sounds quite simple right but the only issue which is present in this framework is that you know you have to use a lot of methods to get the required information from the server even if the data is returned in a simple format that is the json or the xml format the only problem till now is that you have to do a lot of work to get your data back like you know you have to put in a lot of do post do get methods and then you have to request for the data to be returned and so on for a single information this sounds fine but Imagine the scenario where you continuously are requesting for data and then you have to look into so much of methods. Now this obviously becomes cumbersome. Now to avoid such kind of scenarios, what came into picture is the REST API. So the REST API creates an object and thereafter sends the values of the object in response to the client request. So now that you know the need of REST API, next let's look into what exactly REST API is. So what is REST API? Now as I just mentioned rest suggests the fact that you can just create an object of the data requested by the client and then send the values of the object in response to the user. Now let's say you know if you want to find out a scenario of a specific movie let's say you know if infinity war is playing at Hyderabad at a specific place let's say you know at IMAX and then timing at 10 30 in the night. Let's say if you want to find out this particular data. So to find out this particular data what will happen is a client will send a request to the server that you know he wants to find out the data that you know the movie Infinity War is playing in the city Hyderabad at IMAX at 10:30 or not. So when the request is sent to the server, what REST API does is that you know it creates an object of this particular request and then it finds out whether you know it plays or not. So it searches for the data in the server for the client's request. If it finds out that you know the data is present. It just sends back a response to the client with the values of that particular object. So now if you observe over here what's happening you're creating an object and then you have some values of the object and what's happening is that the values of the object are sent to the client. So that's basically the state of an object is sent to the client. So each and every time you don't have to generate a new object. So what happens is you're just passing the state of an object to the client. So since you're just passing the state of an object, that's where the term representational state transfer comes in. Now, if I have to define REST for you, then representational state transfer or REST is an architectural style as well as an approach for communication purposes that is often used in various web services development. This architectural style of REST helps in leveraging the lesser use of bandwidth to make an application more suitable for internet and is often regarded as the language of internet and is completely based on resources. Apart from this, it's also a stateless client server model that you can understand about. So REST is really simple guys. It's just an architectural style as well as an approach for communications purposes that is often used by various web services development. So now that you know what REST is, let's look into the features of the REST API. So the features of REST API are as you can see on my screen. It's more simpler than so it has a proper documentation and it gives you proper logging of error messages. So before the rest came into picture what we had was so. So after rest API took over the world then you can just say that you know you can use the rest API in a much easier way than so. Coming to documentation so it comes with a good documentation so that you understand each and every step of how you can create a rest API using various technologies various frameworks and how you can embed them for your applications and finally coming to error messages when I say error messages it has proper logging information of the errors. So for example let's say you know you're creating a rest API using a specific framework and then you're stuck somewhere. What happens is you get a proper message about the error that's coming up so that the user can understand what's the error about and can debug it. These were the features of rest API. Now let's move forward and understand the principles of rest API. Well, there are six ground principles laid by Dr. Fielding who was the one to define the REST API design in 2000. So the six ground principles are stateless, client server, uniform interface, cacheable, layered systems and code on demand. So talking about stateless, what I mean by stateless is that when the requests are sent from a client to the server, it contains all the information that is required to make the server understand it. So it can be a part of a URL or query string parameters body or even headers. Now the URL is basically used for uniquely identifying the resource and the body holds the state of the requesting resource. 
Once the processing is done by the server, an appropriate response is sent back to the client through header, status, or response body. Coming to client server, when I say client server, what I mean by that is that you know it has a uniform interface that separates the clients from the servers. So separating the concerns basically helps in improving the user's interface portability across multiple platforms as well as enhance the scalability of the server components. Coming to uniform interface, to obtain the uniformity through the application, REST has defined four interface constraints, which are resource identification, resource manipulation using representations, self descriptive messages, and hypermedia as the engine of the application state. Coming to cacheable, in order to provide a better performance, the applications are often made as cacheable. It is done by labeling the response from the server as cacheable or non cacheable, either implicitly or explicitly. If the response is defined as cacheable, then the client cache can reuse the response data for equivalent responses in the future. It also helps in preventing the reuse of stale data. Next, moving forward with layered systems, the layer system architecture allows an application to be more stable by limiting the component behavior. This architecture enables load balancing and provides shared caches for promoting scalability. The layered architecture also helps in enhancing the application security as components in each layer cannot interact beyond the next immediate layer they are in. And finally, coming to code on demand, the code on demand is an optional constant and is used the least. It permits a client's code or app list to be downloaded and extended via the interface to be used within the application. In essence, it simplifies the clients by creating a smart application which doesn't rely on its own code structure. So now that you know the principles behind the REST API, next let's take a look at the methods of the REST API. Now, all of you might be working with the technologies of web, right? So what do you do? You work on crude applications. So when I say crude, I mean that you know we create a resource, we read a resource, we update a resource, and we delete a resource. Now, for example, if you consider the URL that you can see on my screen, what it says is that you know https and then bookmyshow.com slash noida slash movies. Now, if you observe over here, for quite a long of time I've been saying the word resource. Do you know what that means? Well, resource is basically what you want to do. So for example, let's say you know we want to search for the city Noida and then movies. So if you consider the URL that you can see on my screen, if you hadn't put it like this, then you would have searched it like you know, search is equal to Noida and then you put one more query parameter of movies. So basically you would have to put two query parameters that is Noida and movies and before that you had to put the URL. But obviously that doesn't sound like a resource, right? Because you always cannot just put question mark and then you cannot keep putting the query parameters. Instead of that, you can just use these URLs like you know with slash you mentioned the first parameter and with the second slash you mentioned the second parameter and so on. So that's basically how your data structure might also be defined in the server. So that's what basically I mean by a resource. So when I say resource, resource is something that a client wants to know or maybe the data that client is looking for. So now to do these actions, that is basically to create a resource, read a resource, update and delete the resource. You can actually use the HTTP methods, which are nothing but the methods of REST API. So for creating a request, you can use the post method. For reading a request, you can use a get method. For updating a resource, you can use the put method. And for deleting a resource, you can use the delete method. So all these methods together are basically the HTTP methods. That is the post, get, put, and delete are the HTTP methods. So now that you know what is REST API and what all you need to mind in order to deliver an efficient application, let's next look into how you can create a REST API. So for this practical demonstration, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a simple crude REST application using Node.js. So to build the application, basically I'll be using Node.js, Express.js, Joey, and Nodemon. Apart from that, let me tell you that you know I'll be using the WebStorm ID to write and execute the codes. So you can use any ID according to your convenience. So let's start by you know creating a REST API using Node.js. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically create a project directory in which you know I'm going to have all the project related files. So let's say you know I just right click over here and then let me just create a project directory. Let's say demo for REST API. Now basically this project directory is initially blank as you can see on my screen. 
but after a while once I install all the required libraries and packages you'll see that you know package.json file and package log.json file automatically created I'll open my command prompt and then what I'll do is I'll navigate to my demo folder so if you observe over here my demo folder was an e directory and the folder name is demo for rest API so what I'll do is I'll just type in e and colon over here and then I'll mention CD and type in demo for rest API right so automatically I'll navigate to my project folder through the command prompt now what you have to do is you have to first initially install node.js so to install node.js it's really simple you have to go to their official website and then you have to choose the LTS version based on whatever is your bit like Windows 32 bit or 64 or maybe other kernels according to that you download your version double click it and automatically node will be installed so since I've already installed node in my system I'll just open the version and show you so as I type in node hyphen hyphen version you can clearly see that I have the version 10.16.0 so that means our node is installed now what we have to do is you have to basically call the npm package to initialize the npm modules into your system so to do that what you will do is you will type in npm in it so this will basically initialize all the npm modules into your system once you do this what you'll see is basically you'll be asked to enter the details for your project for example let's say package name to be demo right oh it says you cannot put in capital letters right so I'll just type in demo over here and then version let it be 1.0.0 only so I'll just click on enter description let's say we mention it's hands-on for creation of rest API after that entry point this is the main thing that you basically have to enter so remember the fact that you have to mention the entry point file so over here I'm going to mention it to be script.js so this is basically from where our process workflow is going to start and then after that we just click on enter after that you'll see you have test command I'll just click on enter get repository enter keywords enter author let's say I put in my name and the license to be the same so after that it will ask you for a confirmation so basically the project name to be demo version 1.0.0 Description to be hands on for creation of rest API main to be script or JS and then so on So if it's okay, I'll just click on Y and enter So whatever you defined till now is basically the metadata for your project So if I shift back now you will automatically see that you know the package file has been created So now if I go back to my command prompt what you have to do is you have to next install express.js To install express.js what you have to do is you have to mention npm I and then mention the library name that is express so you will automatically see that you know it is getting downloaded so let's just wait for it to be installed so the express is basically a web framework which can be used along with node.js so this is a web framework which allows you to create restful apis with the help of helper methods middle layers to configure your application after that similarly you'll have to install joey to install Joey, I'll type in npm i j o i, right? So once I mention that, you'll see that you know Joey library is also getting installed. Joey is basically used to validate your information whether it's in the right format or not. So all the time you don't have to validate your server. You can just directly install this library, and this library will validate the information for you. After that, you also have to install NodeMon. So to do that, what I'll do is I'll just type in npm i hyphen g I'll mention NodeMon and click on enter. So as you can see, NodeMon is also getting installed. So let's just wait for that to happen again. So as you can see, NodeMon has also got installed. Now NodeMon is basically used to keep a watch on all the files with any type of extensions present in the folder. That is basically the project folder. Also with NodeMon on the watch, you don't have to restart the Node.js server each time any changes are made. So basically what happens generally is that if you don't use NodeMon, then you have to restart the server anytime you make a change. So with the help of NodeMon, you don't have to do that. Automatically NodeMon will implicitly detect the changes and then restart the server for you. Now once you're done installing all these frameworks, let me just open the package.json file and show you. So if I just open the package.json file with WebStorm. All right, so let me just zoom in a little bit. 
So as you can see when I open my package.json file what you clearly see that is whatever metadata that you had entered when you were initializing your npm module right so that's basically demo and the description and then what's the main file and so on. So this was about the package.json file guys. Now what you have to do is basically you'll have to define the entry point for your application right that's basically your workflow. Now to do that you have to basically define the script.js file that you had mentioned in your package.json file. So to do that what you'll do is you'll go to your demo folder over here right click over here and then let's say we create a new JavaScript file. We'll name it script.js and then we'll click on OK. Now in the script.js file let me just put in the code that I've already coded and then I'll explain you step by step what's happening. Right so now let me just zoom in a little bit. Alright, so as you can see this is basically my script.js file. So don't worry I'm going to explain you each and every step and then you'll understand clearly how we are sending information to the client and how the server is sending us back the response. Initially as I told you before that you know we had installed express. So what we're going to do is first we're going to import express So to do that what you'll do is you'll mention const and express and then equal to require express. You're basically assigning it to a variable express over here and then you're just importing that particular library over here. Similarly goes for Joey. So both these libraries are imported to your file. Now what you have to do is you have to create an express application right. So to do that what you'll do is you'll basically use this particular variable that you had created over here that is basically express and then assign it to the app variable. So further what we're going to do is we're going to use this app variable to understand the application and do various actions on this application right. So we're going to use this. So now when I say we're going to use this particular variable so basically you have to make sure that you know that particular variable is using it right. So for that you'll just put app dot use and then you'll mention express dot json because we want to use a json file. What I mean by json file. Now for any application to work you have to put in a database right. You can either use MySQL MongoDB or any other kind of databases. So over here I'm not going to connect it to any such databases. I'm going to just use a JSON file which has a list of the data that we, we are going to enter and that will be stored on our server. So the data is basically stored in the JSON format. So that is the reason we'll be using express.json. Now talking about server. So when a client sends request to the server initially the server has to be running. So for that it needs a specific port. So what I did was I assigned a port environment variable automatically to 8080 right. So basically what's happening is that you don't have to assign it again and again when you use an environment variable. Automatically what I did was that you know the server will be running on the port 8080 and then to just give an output that you know yes the server is running or not. I've just printed a log message saying the listening or the port and then port number will be mentioned that will be basically 8080 over here. So to make sure that you know the server is running and then you know the server is connected to our system that is basically our application from where we want the data to come. So we will just use this command saying app dot listen and we'll basically make the server listen to the port that is 8080 over here and then we'll display the message. So that's with the server. Now if you observe I've told you one thing over here that is a client will send the request to the server right and the server already has a set of data. So to basically define that data I've created an object of customers. So over here that is basically the object of customers which have a specific name that is basically title and an ID. So this particular data will be initially stored into our server and then we can play around with the data based on whatever request that we send the server will return the data. That is with giving data to the server. After that let's start by you know understanding basically the HTTP methods that I just discussed with you that is get put post and delete. So what I'm going to do in this hands on is that I'm going to basically get all the data from the server. Then I'm going to basically find an information of a specific customer. Also I can delete information about a customer and finally I can also update information about a customer. So let's understand the same. So initially let's start with the get method. So if you remember from our presentation that the get method was basically to read the resource. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mention a URL and then what I'm going to do is if I just type in a URL then automatically a message should be displayed right. So over here I've mentioned the URL to be slash so whenever it is localhost colon 8080 slash automatically this will basically send a message that you know welcome to Edureka's REST API. Now over here if you're saying what is the parameter so basically request and response are the parameters that are used in the get method. 
apart from that when i say app dot get what i mean is that you know basically we want our handler to handle all the requests on a specific url now this url that i've mentioned is according to my convenience it is completely user's perspective what url they want to mention so you can mention slash even then the code would work and even then you would display the output so over here request is basically what is sent from the client side and response is basically what is sent from the server side so request over here will be the url so whenever i type in localhost colon 8080 slash automatically a request from the client side will be sent to the server and whenever the server identifies this particular url this particular message would be displayed coming to the next method that is app dot get and then we have mentioning in the url api customers so now what i'm going to do is i want basically the list of customers so that is basically whatever list i have mentioned in this particular object so for that what i'll do is i'll again similarly mention the url that is basically localhost colon 8080 slash api slash customers so whenever a client types in this particular url what i want in response is basically the list of customers that we had mentioned and we had stored on our server side right so that is basically all the five details so to do that what i'll do is i'll mention the command rest send and mention customers over here so that is basically returning our customer object now let's say you know we want to get the information of a specific customer let's say you know we want to get the information of id of josh right so basically his id is 2 right so what i've done is in the url i've mentioned that you know it will be slash api slash customers slash id so whenever you send a request from the client side what you have to mention in the url is basically localhost colon 8080 slash api slash customers slash 2 So whenever you send this request a response will be sent from the server side showing you the details about the second id that is basically titled josh and id to be 2 so don't worry i'm going to show you all the outputs when i run these codes so before that let's just understand these codes step by step so now if you're wondering how is this happening right how is the rest api understanding the fact that you know we have to search for the id 2 in the server side so basically that's happening through this particular line over here So basically we assign the customer object to customer.find and then what we are doing is whatever query parameter that we are passing in the URL is basically checked with the customer ID. So for example let's say customer ID 2 is present only if it is successful it will return the data else let's say you know there's no specific customer ID. For example let's say we have only 5 IDs over here right? Now let's say you know if someone just types in slash /6 So basically he is searching for the sixth id and you know that you know there's no sixth id present then what happens is that a 404 error will be displayed saying that oops can't find what you're looking for right so basically this is also user's perspective of how you want to display the data so over here i used 404 error so that is basically the status i'm checking if the customer is not found and then you display this particular message so that's what is happening when the customer id is not present Now I hope that you know you've understood the get method. Now let me just run this code and show you the outputs. So to show you the output and test the application what I've done is I've used postman. So postman is basically a chrome plugin which is used to send the request to the servers. So I've already installed that otherwise it's really simple to install guys. So what you can basically do is you can just click on the plus button over here and then you can mention the URL So as I was telling you you have to mention the local host colon 8080 and let's say we mention slash and then over here you basically have to choose the method so over here I'm choosing the get method now before I hit on send what you have to do is you have to start your server right so for that what I'll do is I'll go back to my command prompt and then I'll mention node script dot js so once I mention that you'll clearly see an output that you know listening on port 8080 that means our server is up and running Now if I go back over here and then if I just click on send you'll see that you know we get a display message saying welcome to edureka's rest api so that's what you basically saw over here right so whenever we mention a slash you'll see the output as welcome to edureka's rest api now let's say you know we mention slash api slash customers then according to our code we have to get the list of customers so I'll switch back and then I'll mention api slash customers and let the method to be get again and click on send so once i click on send you can clearly see an output that you know we have got all the five details that we had mentioned in our script.js file right so that's basically the list of customers apart from that we also saw one more thing that you know if you want to get information about a specific customer so let's say you know we want to get information about the third customer so that's basically id3 
So I'll just put on slash over here and mention free and click on send over here. So when I click on send, you'll clearly see an output that title Tyler and ID three. So that's how basically the get method works. And that's how basically your API is helping you to connect the client request to the server and so that the server can send back the response to the client. Now let's move forward with the next method that is the post method. So if you remember from your HTTP method, you'll see that you know the post method was used to create, right? So whenever you want to create a resource, you use the post method. So now let's just create a new data, right? So let's say, you know, we want to create a new data and then we want to push it to our server. So for that, what you'll do is you'll use app.post. So app is the same variable that you had created over here. That is basically for our application variable. So app.post and then what you'll do is you'll mention slash API slash customers and then what you'll do is you'll just mention the title. If the title is fine and if it is validated. So basically when I say validate customer, what I mean by that is we have created a function to validate information about the customer. So only if the information is present in the correct format, the customer information will be validated and yes, the customer information will be pushed into the server. Or if it's not, then automatically there'll be an error thrown. So over here, basically our function validates the customer information and our condition is basically that, you know, the title should be minimum of three characters, right? If it is less than that, then obviously it will see that, you know, it is not a valid information and then it will throw an error. So that's what is basically happening. So if I go back to my post method over here, you'll see that, you know, if we'll use this function of validate customer and then if it is validated, what will happen is automatically the customer ID will increase by one and title will be stored by the title that you mentioned. So basically that's what is going to happen over here. So remember the fact that since our customer ID is incremented automatically, you don't have to mention the customer ID in your request. You just have to mention the title and then if the title is greater than three, that is basically it has a minimum character values of three, then it will move forward and then automatically the data will be pushed into the server. So when I say push automatically it has to increase the stack, right? So initially our server had five values in its stack. Now we want the sixth one also to enter. So for that what we'll do is we'll use this function of customer dot push customer, right? So basically we'll push the new value of customer object into the customer and then we'll increase the stack. Once it is done, we'll just send a response again back to the client saying that, you know, that particular ID has been created into the stack. So let me just do the same over here. I'll just shift back my postman and now let's see, you know, I put post over here and then I go back to API customers and then what I do is I go to body over here and then choose raw and let's say I copy this part, paste it over here and let's say we mention the name to be Mark, right? So Mark is basically having four character values. So that means this customer information should be validated. So over here, I'll mention title mark and then in the text option, I'll just go and add JSON, right? So basically this will be identified as a JSON object. And then what I'll do is I'll click on send. So once I click on send, you'll see an output that, you know, automatically ID generated is six. So that means we had five and then automatically it got incremented by one. Now, if I go back to the get method over here and then I click on send, You'll see the information of all the six values that we have stored in our server. So basically our stack has increased. So that's how guys you can use the post method also. Now moving forward with the put method. The put method is basically used to update an existing resource. So if the resource is not found, it's again going to throw an error. But yes, if the resource is found, it can definitely update. So let's see the same how that's happening. So to update a resource, let's say, you know, we consider an example of updating a specific customer IDs name, right? So let's say, you know, we had all the six IDs, right? So for example, let's say we update some customer three's ID and then we mention the name to be Tyler Patterson, right? So for that, what I've coded is basically that whenever app dot put that is basically app is again the same object that you had created over here. That is the express application. Whenever it is with a put method and has a specific URL that is API customers and then you mention the ID whichever IDs you want to update whenever the client sends this particular request. What happens is that initially it is first found whether the customer exists or not. For example, let's say you know we mentioned the ID to be seven. So we know that you know it, it's not present in a stack, right? So what happens is it will throw an error. So over here I've put in the 404 error and then I've mentioned the text to be not found, right? So it basically says the customer is not found. So there's no resource with the ID seven. So obviously you just can't update any resource like that. But yes, if the customer is found. So for example, let's say we're taking the third one. So the customer will be found. Then what will happen is you'll just validate the customer. 
So in your input, let's say we'll put Tyler Patterson. Then whenever you mention this title, automatically the title will be updated for the third ID. Now after everything is done, the server has to send a response back also, right? So for that, this particular command is used. That is response sent customer. So basically, the customer object is updated with the new values, and then the response is sent back to the client. So let's look into the same. So what I'll do is I'll take the third one and then I'll mention the title to be Tyler Patterson. And then I'll choose the method to be put over here and then I'll click on send. Once I click on send, if I scroll down, you'll see the output that you know the title is Tyler Patterson for ID3, right? So now if you just want to look into the stack, what I'll do is I'll go to get, remove this ID over here, click on send over here again. And then you'll see the updated list that you know the ID3 has been updated and the new value is Tyler Patterson. So that's how basically you can use the put method to update your resources. Now, finally, coming to the final resource, guys, that is the delete resource. So the delete method is basically to delete any specific resource. So it, it's as simple as the name suggests. So to do that, what I've done is I've chosen this app.delete and then I've chosen the URL to be API customers ID. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mention a specific ID, let's say the second ID. I want the data to be deleted for the second ID. So that's what I'm going to send at the request as and then what will happen is first initially again a condition will be checked whether you know the customer exists or not. For example, let's say the ID 2 doesn't exist. Then automatically again an error will be sent back saying that you know not found. But yes, if the customer exists, then what happens is you basically have to remove that particular data, right? So you basically splice from that particular data. All the data that is present in ID 2 is removed and automatically the stack is pushed forward, right? Initially you had six values. Now you only have five values, right? But yes, remember the fact that you know the ID doesn't get updated automatically. Over here the ID remains the same. Well, I leave it forward to you guys to explore how you can update the ID automatically whenever a resource is removed from the server. So apart from that, finally, after the data is getting deleted, we want the server to send a response back to the client, right? So for that, we again use rest.send customer. That is basically our object. Now I'll shift back to my postman and then I'll just choose this option of delete. And let's say, you know, I mentioned the ID to be two and then I'll click on send. So once I click on send, you'll see an output that, you know, title Josh and ID two will be deleted. So when I go back to get method, and put customers over here and remove the ID. You'll see we get the data of 13456, but the second one is missing. That's because you know the data has got deleted. So that's how basically, guys, you can use various HTTP methods that is basically the REST API methods to communicate with client and server and to understand how a request from the client is processed by the server and how the server sends back the response. The need for GitHub. It is extremely important for software developers to work on a web based platform to share their projects and collaborate with other developers. This platform must be a version control system, that is, it must enable multiple people to simultaneously work on a single project. Each person edits his or her own copy of the files and chooses when to share those changes with the rest of the team. This application must also be capable of hosting millions of programmers and hobbyists that download and evaluate each other's work. GitHub is one such platform of choice for developers that can host multiple programmers and review their code. GitHub has several competitors. For instance, GitLab. GitLab is an open source web interface and source control platform based on Git. Whereas Microsoft Team Foundation Server is an enterprise grade server for teams to share code, track work, and ship software for any language all in a single package. Bitbucket, on the other hand, stores all of your Git and Mercurial source code in one place with unlimited private repositories. So, what really makes GitHub so powerful and popular among developers? GitHub is an open source platform, and the community is really what fuels it. Moreover, GitHub is the platform of choice for developers from various large corporations too. Microsoft is the number one contributor to the system, but there are also Google, SAP, Airbnb, IBM, PayPal, and many others. Exposure and insight that you can get on GitHub are simply unmatched by any other platform. Here you can discover code written by others, 
learn from it and even use it for your own projects. Versions control on GitHub works very much like Microsoft Office or Google Drive. It simply tracks all the changes made to your code and who makes them. You can always review the detailed change log that neatly hosts all of the relevant information. Using GitHub eliminates the need for complex corporate security solution because everything is on cloud. The platform protects code branches, verifies commit signing, and controls access. Now that we know why we need GitHub, let us understand what is GitHub. GitHub is a Git repository hosting service that provides a web-based graphical interface with many features. A repository is usually used to organize a single project. Repositories can contain folders, files, images, videos, spreadsheets, anything your project needs. Let's say, for example, a team wants to work on a particular project. Here they can simultaneously write and update the code to a central repository which is present on GitHub. So GitHub is a highly used software that is typically used for version control. It is helpful when more than just say one person is working on a project. For example, a software development team wants to build a website and everyone has to update their codes simultaneously while working on this project. In this case, GitHub helps them to build a centralized repository where everyone can upload edit and manage the code files. Most software projects have a bug tracker of some kind. GitHub's tracker is called issues and has its very own section in every repository. Issues basically are a great way to keep track of tasks, enhancements and bugs for your project. Moving on, people often get confused between the terms Git and GitHub. Now let me clearly explain the difference between them. Git is simply a version control system that lets you manage and track changes within your project. Whereas GitHub is a cloud-based service that lets you manage Git repositories. So basically Git is the tool and GitHub is the service. Now that we know the difference between Git and GitHub, let us move on and understand how these two work hand in hand. We already know that Git is a version control tool that will allow you to perform all kinds of operations to fetch data from the central server or push data to it. Whereas GitHub is a code hosting platform for version control collaboration. GitHub is basically a company that allows you to host a central repository in a remote server. Now without any further ado, let's get started with the demonstration on how to use GitHub. So for this demonstration, we're working on the website version of GitHub. There's another version of GitHub that is the desktop version, which you can download it to your personal computer. So we're simply going to search for GitHub in our search engine. The first link will lead you to the official website of GitHub. So I'm going to click on that. So this will redirect me to the main homepage of GitHub. As you can see, there is a search GitHub option. There are also two buttons that says sign in and sign up. If you're new to GitHub, you can simply enter in your credentials. That is a username, email, password and sign up for GitHub. But if you already have an account like I do, I'm simply going to click on the sign in button and it'll redirect me to a page where I have to enter the credentials. That is my email address and password. I'm going to do that now and I'm going to click on the sign in button. Now, this is the main page of my account. As you can see, I have no repositories. It's all new. It's all fresh. But if you're not new to GitHub, you can view all of your repositories on the left hand corner. Now, before we move on, I'm going to explain to you all the features that are present within GitHub. So you can see a search bar here. So the search bar will allow you to look for profiles, certain keywords, look for different kinds of projects that are available on GitHub. All of those can be done using this bar here. And you can see four options next to the bar that says pull requests, issues, marketplace, explore. Pull requests we'll learn later on in the session, but the issues in marketplace we won't be discussing in this video for now. The explore button on the other hand is an extremely important and interesting button. So once I click on that, it'll redirect me to a page with some activities that are going on around in GitHub. You can see here they're trending repositories, they're trending developers. Basically, this is a feed that will allow you to interact with developers and other people, collaborators from all around the world, basically. In Instagram too, you have an explore button, which will allow you to interact with different people from all around the world. 
So the same concept is implied in the GitHub Explore button too. So you can explore topics, you can explore trending repositories, developers. Basically, it's an interaction with other people from different parts of the world. So I hope that's clear. Now, the most important part of the session are the three buttons that are available in the right hand corner of the navigation bar. So you can see there's a bell icon, there's a plus icon, there's a pixelated icon on the right hand corner. So the bell icon allows you to read notifications of your activities that occur in GitHub. So that's what it really is. You can see the inbox will allow you to view all of the notifications. You can also view the hundred notifications by clicking on this hundred button. As of now, I don't have any notifications, so there's nothing available. You can also group these notifications by the date or repository by clicking on this group by button here. You can also view your saved notifications by clicking on here. And the done button on the other hand will let you mark all of your notifications that you're done with your previous notifications. So these are the three important buttons you'll have to know in this bell icon and the filters are not necessary as of now. So I'm not going to discuss that. This button on the other hand will allow you to manage note your notification settings and your subscriptions too. So that's all for this bell icon. The next important button is this plus icon. As you can see, there are five drop down options that appear here. The first one being new repository, followed by import repository, new gist, new organization, new project. So new repository we've already discussed previously in this session. A repository is a place where you create your files for your project. It's basically a storage space. Right. So your repository can directly interact with your Git. Right. So the new repository option will allow you to make files, a repository to your GitHub account. Right. The Git, on the other hand, the tool that which we use to make local repositories in our personal computer can be directly pushed on. The local repositories can directly be pushed onto your GitHub account. So that's what the new repository button allows you to do so. But the new project, on the other hand, is a place to track issues, features, and other tasks that are related to the code within the repository. You can also connect with the DevOps build and deploy process, assign people to tasks, and so on by using this button. That is the new project button. So the difference between the new repository button and the new project button is that projects in GitHub are only a part of GitHub, but not Git. But the new repository option is a part of GitHub and Git. So that's the main difference between new repository and new project. I hope that's clear. So the next button will drop me down some interactions that I can make with my profile. So if I click on this your profile option, it will redirect me to a page where I can edit my profile. I can really create my identity using this page. So here, if I click the edit profile, I can add a bio about myself. I can add the company in which I'm working in the location at where I am, the website, Twitter username, etc. All of that I can add here, all of the information about myself. I can also view the repositories I'm working on currently or the repositories I've worked in, in the past, projects that I'm working on, the packages and the entire contributions I've been making on GitHub from the last year. So basically it allows me to build an identity or it will help me build my profile on GitHub. So I hope that's clear. Now, if I click on this button and if I want to sign out from a profile, I can simply scroll down and click on the sign out button here and this will sign me out of my account. So that's all for getting started with GitHub. These are the basics on what GitHub is and what each of the button and options really do. Now, if I want to move back to the main page of my GitHub profile, I can simply click on this Octocad. That's GitHub's logo. So I'm just going to click on this Octocad logo. And here I'm back to my main page. Now, before we move on and work on the different operations and options within GitHub and learn different things about GitHub, I'm going to give you a brief overview on how to download the desktop version of GitHub. So I'm simply going to search for GitHub desktop on my search engine and I'm going to click on the first link that's available on this page. Now I can simply click on this button that says download for Windows 64 bit. That's compatible to my current version of my personal computer. If you have a Mac, you can simply click on the Mac version and download it to your desktop. But as I've already mentioned previously that we're going to work on the website version. So I'm going to simply switch back to this. Now let's quickly move on to the next part of the session. Create a repository. 
So firstly, let us understand what a repository is. It is simply a storage space for the correct project that you're working on. GitHub is a very popular central repository that allows you to share your files, whereas Git allows you to create local repositories that are present on the system you are working on. So you can basically push your local repository into GitHub and share it with other collaborators via the central one. Now that we know what a repository is and how it works, let's go on to the demonstration part and create our first repository. So you can do this in two ways. Either you can click on your create repository button that is present on the left side, or you can, as I've already mentioned in the previous part of the session, you can click on to this plus icon and you can click on the new repository option. So this will redirect you to a page that says create a new repository. You can add your repository name. I'm going to name my repository as Edureka and it's available. All of your repository names must be unique from one another to identify them easily. You can also add a description, which is optional. I'm just going to add the description. This is my first repository. And a description allows people or other collaborators to understand what your repository is all about. But as a good developer or a good programmer, you would definitely want to add a description and give an overview of what your repository is all about. There are two options now available that says private or public. Now you can choose your repository to either be public or private. So the private one lets you decide who can access your profile, whereas the public one lets anyone view and access your repository, but you can choose who can commit to it. That's the difference between public and private repository. I'm going to let my repository be public as of now. Now, if you scroll down, you can see that you can initialize your repository with three options. The first one being add a readme file. The second one being add a git ignore file. You can always choose a add a readme text file to your project, which often contains information about the project and other necessary details the user must be aware of when he or she is accessing that particular project. Now I want a readme file for my repository. So I'm going to click on this button here. That's going to check it. The next option is add a dot git ignore file. So this file will let you ignore a list of files when the user is pushing files to GitHub. That's what this option really does, but I'm going to let this be unchecked for now. For your repository to truly be open source, you will need to license it. So others are free to use, change and distribute the software. You can simply click on choose a license option and pick your, the required license for your project. There are several licenses like MIT, GPL, Apache license 2.0, BSD, etc. But for this repository, we don't really need a license. So I'm going to untick this too. And now you can see there's a piece of information that says this will set master as a default branch, but I'm going to ignore this for now. I'm going to explain about branches later on in the session. So this is all you have to do to create your first new repository. You add a name, you choose a description, you add an optional description, you let your repository be either public or private, and you initialize your repository with either of these three options. And I'm simply going to click on my create repository option. Now this will redirect me to a page with all the information and the files that are currently present in my repository. You can see here my repository name is present here with the optional description that I gave and the number of files. Currently we have only just one file that's the readme text file and that's present here. So this is all we have. Congratulations. You just created your first repository. Now you can see there are some options that says issues, pull requests, actions, projects, wiki, security, etc. We don't have to really talk about all of these right now. We will just learn about one option that says code here. So this is really important. If you click on this button, you can see that there's a link that is available here and HTTPS link. So if you copy this link and paste it on your Git terminal that's present on your computer, you can download this entire project directly to your local system. So that's what the link is for. I hope that's clear. And the next option that says open with GitHub desktop will allow you to open this entire repository in your GitHub desktop version. And you can also the last option that says download zip will allow you to download this entire repository in the form of zip files. So all of your project files will be within that zip file. So that's all you have to really know about your repository. And I'm going to click on the readme text file that's available. It will take me to another page with some extra information about that file. You can see currently we have two lines and the memory space that is allocated to this file. So we currently have two lines that is Edureka and this is my first repository. 
and you can also see the number of contributors to this project that is just one that's just me for now and you can view the history of the commits or the changes that have been performed in your file so we'll come back to that part later on this session but you can move back to your main page of this repository by clicking on the name button here so edureka is the name of my repository so i'm going to click on that so now i'm back to the main page of my repository before we learn how to create our first branch let us understand what branches are branches allow you to work on other features that can be included and merged with the master branch if required so what is the master branch the master branch is the main branch where your project resides on so all of the changes all of the activities that you do with your main project lies or is on your default branch that is named as the master branch so what really github allows you to do is it allows you to create additional branches so on these additional branches you can work on the other features or you can experiment with your project and if you're happy with this you can simply merge these features to your main branch that is your master branch this is what branches are really for so they simply allow you to work on other features that's what branches are so let's move on to the demonstration part and look at how we can create our own branches so now if you look on the left corner you can see a button that says master so currently we're on the master branch and there's only one branch and the master branch as i've already mentioned is the default branch so when you create a repository you're automatically creating a master branch so this is where your project will be residing on and now if you want to create another branch say let's name this branch 1 branch so this is what i want to name my additional branch i'm simply going to name it and i'm going to click on the enter button so it will redirect me to a page so this is the exact replica of your master branch and you can work on this branch you can work on any other feature or you can add something you can remove something you can really experiment on this branch and if you're happy with this you can merge back this feature or the experimentation that you've been working on to your master branch right so you can see there's a readme text file it's exactly the same there's the name of your repository the description of the repository you can click on the readme text file and everything's the absolute same you can quickly switch back to the main page but the only difference is that you're currently on a branch named branch 1 branch you're not on your master branch now if you want to switch back to your master branch and work on it you can click on this button and you'll find the master here you can click on that and it will take you back to your master branch here you can work on your project so the currently two branches you can see that and everything's normal everything looks simple that's all for branches it's really easy i hope it's clear so you can look for branches here on this bar here that's present here you can also create new ones in the same option so that's all for branches let's move on to the next part of the session make a commit now what are commits commits simply record changes to one or more files in your branches so basically they save the changes that you're making in your project git always assigns each commit a unique identification which is called sha or a hash that identifies the specific changes so for any changes are made to your project files you can simply go back and look at the version history or the history of the each commit you've performed on your project files so that's what really commits are all about it's extremely easy let's go ahead and make our first commit now i'm going to switch to my branch 1 branch and i'm going to make my first commit i'm going to click on my readme text file that's the only file currently in our repository so we'll make the change in the readme text file there are three really important icons that are present in the right corner as you can see the first one is a pc icon that says open this file in github desktop so if you click on this file this entire file will open in your github desktop version the next one that is the pencil icon will allow me to edit this particular file that is my readme text file and the third icon is a bin icon which will allow me to delete this file now what we'll be working on is the pencil icon that's the edit this file option i'm going to click on this and i can simply view a space or a file that will allow me to make changes to my readme text file i'm going to add another line here that says this is my first commit this is what i want to add to my readme text file and if i want to preview the changes I'm going to click on this preview changes button. You can see that this is my first repository, this is my first commit. 
this is my first commit is the additional piece of information that will be adding to my readme text file and it's highlighted in blue so we know that that's the additional information i'm happy with this change i'm going to switch back to my edit file i'm going to scroll down and if i want to add in description about the change that i'm performing to my file i can do that a good programmer would always add a description to the change that he's making to the project file so other collaborators when they view the commit or they view the change they can read the extended description and understand what the change is about so that's a good habit that you must follow but as of now we're not going to do that so i'm going to leave this blank as you can see there are two radio buttons that are currently available the first one says commit directly to the branch one branch this will allow me to make the change or save or make the commit directly to my branch one branch only so the change that i'm making currently is only implemented to my branch one branch the second option allows me to create a new branch for this particular commit and start a pull request we're not going to talk much about this option right now but the first option is extremely important so we'll let this be stuck on to the option that says commit directly to the branch one branch and i'm going to click on the commit changes options and this will simply implement the entire change to the file you can see that the change is implemented the additional piece of line that says this is my first commit is added to my readme text file now the interesting part is if i switch to my master branch the change is not implemented in my master branch so the change is only currently present in my branch one branch and now if i want to view the history of the changes that i've made i've already mentioned in the previous part of the session that the history button will allow me to do so so i'm going to click on this history button and you can see that i made my first commit 23 minutes ago and i made my new commit 41 seconds ago and there is also a hash number unique hash identification number that allows me to distinguish between both of these changes so all of my commits that i'll be making on this branch will be available here so that's the main point of a version control system isn't it understanding and keeping a record of all the changes that we're performing in our files and our projects so this is gives full justice to the word version control so that is what github is all about now that we learn how to make our first commit to let's move on to the next part of the session open and merge pull requests so what are pull requests pull requests let you tell other developers about changes you've pushed to branch in a repository on github so once a pull request is open you can acknowledge and review the changes with collaborators and add follow up commits after which your changes are merged into the base branch so there are two ways to create a pull request the first one being pull request from a forked repository and the second one being pull request from a branch within a repository currently in this demo we will work on the second one that is pull request from a branch within a repository now i'm simply going to switch to my demo part okay now currently i'm on my master branch i'm going to click on this pull request option that's here now it says branch one has had recent pushes 3 minutes ago compare and pull request i'm not going to click on that i'm going to simply click on the new pull request option here so this will allow me to compare the changes there's a base branch and a compare branch the base branch is the master branch and the compare branch i will compare my master branch to my branch one branch so this notification says that the merge between the branch one branch and master branch is definitely possible so it's a green signal so if i scroll down i can view the difference between both the branches so the left hand side indicates the information that is present on the master branch and the right hand indicates the information that is present in my branch one branch plus sign indicates the additional information that is present in my branch one branch i'm happy with this so i'm simply going to scroll up and create the pull request I'm going to click on that i can also leave a comment and i can preview the change that's not necessary for now so i'm going to go ahead and create the pull request now this will redirect me to a page so this page says that the pull request has been opened and now i can choose to merge this pull request that is i can merge the branch one branch to my master branch so it says this branch has no conflicts with the base branch merging can be performed automatically and that's good news right so i'm going to click on merge pull request and i'm going to confirm my merge update my readme text file i'm happy with that so i'm just going to confirm it 
Now it says pull request successfully merged and closed. You're all set. The branch one branch can be safely deleted. I'm not going to delete the branch. I'm going to compare both of the branches and see if my master branch is exactly the same as my branch one branch. So I'm going to click on this Edureka. I'm going to go to my main page of my repository. So my master branch has the additional piece of information that says this is my first commit. Now, if I switch to my branch one branch, it has the exact piece of information. So the information that was present in my branch one branch has been successfully implemented to my master branch. So that's all for the pull request part two. We've reached the end of the demonstration part. Now let's quickly look at the case study of how Microsoft implemented GitHub. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of Microsoft. Microsoft Corporation is an American multinational technology company. It develops, manufactures, licenses, supports, and sells different computer software, consumer electronics, personal computers, and other related services. So initially, Microsoft was against the use of the open source because they held very tightly to the internet protocol. They were completely hesitant to adapt to this new concept of sharing code to the entire world. But in 2010, they rethought this entire scenario and now Microsoft is one of the biggest contributors to open source. Today, about 2,000 to 25,000 Microsoft engineers maintain TypeScript, .NET, Windows Terminal, DARP, Helm, and more than a thousand other open source projects. So first what they did was they released new processes in measured containment. But later on, they released only licensed software. So here, developers can learn from the company's source code, but they couldn't really build on it. Eventually, the stigma died, and now even closed code like .NET is open source under an MIT license. Teams realize that they need to accept contributions to get feedback and learn from other developers. To organize and understand this approach, Microsoft created their open source programs office, which enables distribution and centralization of knowledge. So the OSPO provides the resources and maintainers to manage thousands of repositories and contributors effectively on GitHub. Even though Microsoft invests in its tools, they expect other individuals and organizations to lead the way. Microsoft believes that GitHub's value isn't in any one feature, but its entire community. GitHub is the place to collaborate. It's where everyone is and where most of the entire world's open source is already happening. It's not just a feature, but the whole thing. Why do we need Maven? Okay, so new programmers, especially Java programmers, they have this question like, why do we need Maven for building project when we have Eclipse? So what Eclipse is? It is nothing but an IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Eclipse provides an environment for developing your project. That's it. It doesn't build your code, but Maven is used for building the code. And there's one more thing that I would like to tell you that suppose you're working on a project and most of the Java projects, they require you to work with third party libraries. For example, if you're working on a Spring MVC project, there are numerous dependencies that you need for these projects. Dependencies are nothing but the libraries or the Java files. So for Spring, there are 10 to 12 libraries that you need. So to use these libraries, you first need to download them and then you need to add those to your project. This is a tedious task because all of this needs to be done manually. There's one more problem here. Suppose you're working on Java 8 version and for some reason you need to upgrade your project from Java 8 to Java 9. In this case, you again need to download and add these dependencies for the latest software version. So this is not at all a good practice where you have to do things manually. So this is where Maven makes your life easier. Maven can solve all your problems related to dependencies. You just need to specify the dependencies that you want in a pom.xml file of Maven and Maven will take care of the rest. So even in the later stages of the project, you need to upgrade the version of the software that you're using. Maven will handle all such issues elegantly. For example, like even if there's a change in the version of the software, you need to make the change in the pom.xml file of Maven. And that's it. Maven will automatically download it for you. This is the reason why we need Maven. So before Maven, we had this build tool called Ant. The problem with Ant was we had to write very long scripts for executing our tasks. For example, you have to define what your tasks are and when you need to execute those tasks. So this was a problem with Ant. 
then came the maven framework and maven is widely used in the software industry as of now so now since we know why do we need maven let us have a look at what maven is maven is a powerful build automation tool that is primarily used for java based projects maven addresses two critical aspects of building software first it describes how software is built and second it describes the dependencies it uses conventions for build procedure and only exceptions need to be written down an xml file describes the software project that is being built its dependencies on the other external modules and components the build order the directories and the required plugins it comes with predefined targets for performing certain well defined tasks such as compilation of code and its packaging maven dynamically downloads java libraries and maven plugins from one or more repositories such as the maven central repository and stores them in the local cache this local cache of downloaded artifacts can also be updated with the artifacts created by the local projects public repositories can also be updated maven can also be used to build and manage projects written in c sharp ruby scala and so on the maven project is hosted by the apache software foundation where it was formerly part of the jakarta project so this is maven in a nutshell so now let us discuss the maven architecture as you can see in this diagram these are the various components of maven architecture this is the local repository or the local machine that you work on this is the central repository and this is the remote repository or the remote web server so whenever you specify any dependency in the pom.xml file of maven maven will look for that file in the central repository this place okay if the dependency is present in the central repository maven will copy that dependency onto your local machine but if it is not present here maven will fetch it from the remote web server or the remote repository using internet so internet is very much mandatory for using maven this is how maven architecture or maven works now let us talk about the maven life cycle the maven build follows a life cycle to deploy and distribute the target project there are three built in life cycles that is default clean and site the default is the main life cycle as it is responsible for the project deployment the clean life cycle is used to clean the project and remove all the files by the previous build and site is used to create the project's site documentation each life cycle consists of a sequence of phases the default build life cycle consists of 23 phases as it is the main build life cycle of maven on the other hand the clean life cycle consists of three phases and the site life cycle is made up of four phases so since we now know what maven life cycle is now let us deep dive into what maven phases are a maven phase represents a stage in the maven build life cycle each phase is responsible for a specific task here are some of the most important phases in the default build life cycle validate this phase checks if all the information necessary for the build is available the compile phase compiles the source code of the project whereas the test compile compiles the test source code the test phase is responsible for running the unit tests of the application the package phase is responsible for packaging the compiled source code into a distributable format that is the wav format or the jar format integration test is the phase in which process and deployment of the package is needed to run the integration test in the install phase you install the package to a local repository and in the deploy phase you copy the package to the remote repository so these were a few important phases of the default build life cycle phases are executed in a specific order this means that if we run a specific phase using the command such as maven test so all the preceding phases before maven test will also be executed for example if we run the deploy phase which is the last phase in the default build life cycle that will execute all the phases before the deploy phase as well which is the entire default life cycle so now let us talk about the maven goals each phase is a sequence of goals and each goal is responsible for a specific task when we run a phase all goals bound to this phase are executed in order now let us have a look at some of the phases and default goals bound to them as you can see in this diagram this is the format of specifying the goals the compiler is a plugin and compile is a phase the compile goal from the compiler plugin is bound to the compile phase the compiler test compile is bound to the test compile phase show fire test is bound to the test phase 
jar colon jar is bound to the package phase so this was all about the maven goals now let us talk about maven plugins a maven plugin is a group of goals all execution in maven is done by plugins a plugin is mapped to a goal and executed as a part of it a phase is mapped to multiple goals and these goals are executed by a plugin we can directly invoke our specific goal while maven execution a plugin configuration can be modified using the plugin declaration for example compiler plugin compiles the java source code as you can see in this diagram the compiler plugin has two goals namely the compile and the test compile we will get to know more about the plugins in the demo that we will execute in some time moving on we will now discuss the various advantages that maven has to offer maven's primary goal is to allow a developer to comprehend the complete state of a development effort in the shortest period of time while using maven doesn't eliminate the need to know about the underlying mechanisms maven does provide a lot of shieldings from the details maven allows a project to build using its project object model that is the pom and the set of plugins that are shared by all projects using maven providing a uniform build system once you familiarize yourself with how maven project builds you automatically know how all maven projects build saving you immense amounts of time when you try to navigate among many projects maven provides plenty of useful information that is in part taken from your pom and in part generated from your project's sources for example maven can provide change log document created directly from source control cross reference sources list of mailing lists managed by the project the dependency list and the unit test reports which includes the coverage as maven improves the information set provided will improve all of which will be transparent to the users of maven other products can also provide maven plugins to allow their set of information alongside some of the standard information given by maven all still based on the pom file maven aims to gather current principles for best development practices and it makes easy to guide a project in that direction maven also aims to assist project workflow such as the release and the issue management maven also suggests some guidelines on how to lay out your project's directory structure once you learn the layout you can easily navigate any other project that uses maven and the defaults Maven provides an easy way for Maven clients to update their installation so that they can take advantage of any changes that has been made to the Maven itself. Installation of new or updated plugins from third parties or Maven itself has been made trivial for this reason. So these were a few advantages of Maven. So guys, now let us have a look at the demo project which we will build using Maven. For this project, you need a few things pre installed on your system. Like you need Java, you need Maven, and also you need an IDE, most preferably Eclipse, on your system. So I've already downloaded and uh, installed these things on my system. And here, as you can see, this is the Eclipse IDE. And here I've created a project. Okay. So I'll show you how to create a project in Eclipse, specifically Maven project. Okay. So here you click on File, New, Maven project. So here you check this box like create a simple project skip archetype selection archetype is nothing but a template which is provided by maven for building projects okay so as of now you can create a simple project click on next okay so here are a few things that we need to talk about the group id the group id is nothing but the unique identifier that owns the project here you can specify anything like com dot edureka for example in my case so now coming back to the artifact this will be the final name of the compilation unit of your project so you can specify like since my code is written in selenium like i've written a selenium code along with test ng so i will write something like maven dot selenium dot test ng okay version indicates the version of the created artifacts like if your project deals with the multiple versions, then this is a very useful parameter to deal with such versions. The default packaging is jar and you can also change it to pom or war. Okay. And here you have to provide the name of the project. Okay. So in my case, let us type dummy project. Okay. Here it says Maven Selenium test engine already exists. So what we will do is Maven 
dot test ng dot selenium okay good to go click on finish okay so as soon as you click on finish this is our project maven dot test ng dot selenium so if you click here you will see a hierarchy of folders so this is the best part of using maven so maven prefers convention over configuration so now let us talk about these folders src main java src main resources so this is the place where you write the application code like if you are developing a web application you write that code over here in the src main java and all the resources that you need for developing this code are present here in the src main resources and it is also the responsibility of the developer to write the code for developed application you know test the application so for testing purpose the code is written here src test java and whatever the resources are that you need for testing the application those are present in the src test resources folder so this is the jre system library and this is the pom xml this is the most important part of maven project okay so we will come to that part later now one more thing that i would like to tell you that these are the various java libraries and the version of java that you have downloaded must be compatible with this one like for example on my system i have java 12 okay so here it shows some other versions as you can see on the screen yeah you should click on this one workspace default jre jdk 12.0.1 okay apply and close okay so now let us talk about few of the elements of pom.xml file this project is the root element of the pom.xml file the version here specifies the version of the artifact that is created and snapshot indicates the work is in progress and the name of the project as you can see here is dummy project okay so these were a few elements of the pom xml file right now we have mentioned nothing in the pom.xml file okay so we will add dependencies and plugins here in this pom.xml file so now let us have a look at the code that i have written okay what this code does is this is the selenium script for testing a web application basically i've written a code in which you automatically open a web browser you navigate to a url specified and then you try to fetch the title of the web page that you navigate to and then you try to match that fetch title with the actual title i mean there's a comparison between the expected title and the actual title if both the things are the same then the test case is passed else the test case fails so this is exactly what i have written in this code and this code is written in this package as you can see in the src test java in this package i have written this code demo class dot java as you can see here on the screen okay so this is the code so now we will talk about the various phases now we will try to run this script as you guys must be knowing selenium is the main tool for testing web application but it has limitations such as test case management and report generation hence most number of times we integrate selenium with test ng test ng generates structured test reports and test ng is also useful for performing unit tests test ng provides us with test annotations for managing the test cases so here since we are using the test ng framework we need to convert this java file into test ng so whenever you click this you will see that there's one more xml file created here called textng.xml so this file is nothing but it contains the name of the class that you have created that is demo class so that's it in the pom.xml we have to specify since we are using selenium and testng we have to specify those dependencies in the pom.xml file okay so yeah as you can see these are the dependencies selenium and testng and how do you get these dependencies okay so simply go to mvn repository okay so simply type here selenium okay so you can see this selenium java you need to select a stable version of the selenium as of now this is uh, 3.141.59 so you have to click on that okay so here you can see maven and you need to copy this dependency thing okay these five lines and you have to paste it in the pom.xml file okay selenium java and the version okay so i have to write here the version 
59 i hope it's the same yeah 3.141.59 okay so this is the thing that you have got from mvn repository also similarly for test ng you have to search for test ng over here org dot test ng okay so click on test ng stable version 6.14.3 click on this copy these five lines of maven dependency this thing and you need to paste it over here i've already done this just the version number is different okay so what is the version that is available here the latest one 6.14.3 also apart from the dependencies since we are testing the application you also need two plugins which is nothing but the compiler plugin as the name suggests it is used for compiling the source code and the show fire plugin which is used for unit testing so you also need to add these plugins under the build tag okay as you can see here this entire thing you need to add here in the pom xml and once you add those you have to simply save it using Control s that's it so now it is the headache of maven to download it for you and use it in your project now we will try to run the various phases of maven okay so to run the various phases as we discussed earlier for example if we want to run maven clean what maven clean does is it cleans all the previous project builds that have been created not by us maybe by some other user or something else okay so here i will click on maven clean so how to reach there right click on the project run as maven clean and now you will see the output on the console okay so as you can see here it shows build success also guys note down a few things that work in the background like maven clean plugin this is the thing that is working in the background for cleaning the project okay since we are testing this application we will try to run the maven test okay since now i'm trying to run the maven test since we want to test the web application this will also execute all the previous lifecycle phases of maven which exist before test so now let us click on maven test and see what happens okay we can see the browser okay so it shows build success tests run one failure zero error zero skip zero okay so we are good to go guys this works perfectly so we have already seen how to execute this test code and now we have to do the similar thing using command prompt you can do this even without using an eclipse id so what we will do is we will get the path of the pom xml from here let's right click on pom xml file and the location okay so this is the thing that we need to copy since now we have copied the path okay we have to navigate to that path we are at the location of the pom xml file and now we can run the same commands which we did through eclipse such as mvn clean press enter let us see what it does it shows build success everything is working fine now we will test the code using mvn test test okay so let us see what happens okay so it is installing all the libraries that are required for this project the build is success and test has run successfully no failures no errors nothing okay so this works fine So guys, let's talk about why do we need continuous integration or referred to as CI. Let's talk of a scenario where we are not using continuous integration. When we work in a team, in a development team, there are multiple developers. All the developers works on different, different components for a project or for a code. A developer A may be writing a code, thinking a scenario, let's say Python 1.0, developer B may be writing a code scenario 1.2, 1.3 and so on. One of the biggest challenges that we face is as an industry is how do we make sure that all the developers code gets collaborated and we are having properly release getting deployed. 
that is the biggest challenge in the industry problem of infrequent releases the word that we use for now another challenge that most developers fail is debugging whenever you write a code there are a lot of bugs and issues a code is often thousands and thousands of lines if you don't have any proper continuous integration mechanism or a packaging mechanism you'll see it takes days even weeks and months to debug your code to make it 100% bug free that is a challenge which really makes development process very slow so how to test the code testing used to be a monotonous task there are teams used to spend months a life cycle of a quarter to make the code complete the test code and make sure it's bug free what this used to happen is guys two things you were not able to deliver on time business never used to see value coming out of it if business see it is not adding value it is not delivering product on time they will start rethinking and giving a second thought do you need to invest so much money on the it industry or on your it softwares these things were hampering big time in the development and release of modern day deployment software cycles in modern day world we want to make sure our deployment cycles are robust we are able to cater to the need of the market and deploy the products as soon as possible but with this approach where we were not using ci tools it used to take 6 months to year develop a product deploy a product and make it bug free things changed drastically when we started using continuous integration using continuous integration guys we can deploy codes at the most quickest pace amazon for instance deploys code every 11.6 seconds how that is possible using the continuous integration mechanism using ci we use some ci tools like jenkins and all where we can automate the process like building packaging deployment testing so that we can do all those things with a click of a button in matter of seconds ci process helps us to deploy multiple releases parallelly i can do in one day thousands and thousands of releases without impacting our environment and making sure these releases are in line with our requirement the ci tool has an awesome notification mechanism where it notifies instantly of any success or failures happening so that if i have debug the code or troubleshoot it i will know exactly at the pinpoint location where it is failing you can do multiple notification management mechanisms like an email an sms any itsm tool push notifications all those modern ways of notifications are possible using ci tools like jenkins we integrate these ci tools like jenkins with modern day build and packaging tools like maven ant gradle so that we can automate the common problems which developers spend time on spend their half the development life cycle like packaging the code code review code deployment unit testing all those things can be automated and can be done with a click of a button using these ci tools now what is continuous integration we talked about it helps so much it helps to save time it helps to save so much energy it makes releases so much frequent it helps us to streamline the process now what actually is continuous integration if i go traditionally guys continuous integration is basically you can say a process which helps us to combine or make smoothen the automation of the task like compiling the code doing a testing and deploying the code into our life cycles how does continuous integration works is developers who works on projects generally commit their code in any versioning tool like git github gitlab bitbucket svn using continuous integration we pull the code from the version control system tool like git for example and we automate the process like code compiling code testing code review and then we finally deploy the code in a low life cycle environment you can say continuous integration is sort of development practice where developers pull the code from a version control system and make the code deployed in the low life cycle environment the beauty of using this ci tools is we can automate the process in such a way whenever developer makes a new commit or new change in the version control system tool we create a sort of pipeline and the pipeline automatically picks the code from the vcs tool and then compile it and then deploy the software another good thing about is there is least human intervention so once i have set up a pipeline i no need to worry about running the code again and again or making the changes automatically it happens in a fully automated process as i mentioned a while back we can use the process of whenever a new commit happen or you can run it on a scheduled basis or something the term ci continuous integration was first time proposed as methodology in 1991 as a part of the extreme programming concept at that time it was not adopted so well but in modern day it industry it has become the bread and butter of smoothing up release process or our development process in modern day world continuous integration can be say as a practice of merging all developers working copy to a mainstream where you can develop and deploy the code multiple times in the same day with as many changes as possible there is no limit of how many lines of code it can be it can be tens and thousands of lines of code which can be compiled multiple times throughout the duration let's see a case study where we try to see how things change for an organization after it adopted to the cio continuous integration mode here we have picked up an example of adobe to see how it helped in the development process 
Adobe realized at some point of the time that they are not releases very frequently, which is happening their market percentage share. Adobe was not following the continuous integration approach. They were using the native methods of compiling the code, debugging the code, testing the code, because of which they were noticing that it used to take up to six months release updates. Now, six months was a long duration, whereas their competitors were releasing a bit very frequently, which was helping them to capture market share. Adobe decided at some point of the time that we need to change our software development and deployment strategy, and they tried to adopt the continuous integration mechanism. Once they adopted the continuous integration mechanism, they found that the response time was a lot better and a lot faster. They were able to deploy the updates more frequently with every time a change was made by a developer or new release was being released, and it helped to reduce the response time, and they were 60% more faster. The development teams were getting more effective and they were able to redeploy releases far more in a better and structured way than what they were doing without using CI. You can see how CI helps industry. Amazon is the best case study. Amazon in modern day scenario deploys code every 11.6 seconds, almost five times every minute. This is all possible using continuous integration. Now, what is Jenkins? We talked about what is CI. We talked about why do we need CI, all those things. Let's talk about what is Jenkins and how does Jenkins fit in this particular picture. Jenkins is an open source automation server which helps to automate the process of development related to testing, deployment, packaging, and others. It is a server based system that runs on software as Apache Tomcat. It supports VCS tools like Git, Pitbucket, and also support build automation tools like Apache, Maven, Ant. And it helps to make and facilitate our continuous integration and continuous delivery process. Jenkins was first released in the year 2011, and it's a completely open source software as part of the MIT license. Jenkins, guys, is a plugin based software. In Jenkins, you have got plugins which basically use to interact with different, different tools and components. In Jenkins, plugins are primary releases in languages other than Java. Plugins are available to integrate Jenkins with most version control system tools and most databases. Using these plugins, we set up purposes, for example, unit testing, you can do compiling, you can do packaging, you can create some reports, you can do some logging. All those things are possible using plugins in Jenkins. Another important component that we talk about in Jenkins apart from plugin is Jenkins notification, which we also call as mailer. Using mailer, guys, we can do configured email notification for instance. You can configure scenario, for example, you want mail notification when build is successful. All those things can be done using mailer as the Jenkins component. Another important component in Jenkins is the SSH agent. Jenkins also follows a typical master slave topology. Now, why do we need a master slave topology in a CI tool like Jenkins? When you work in an organization, we have got multiple teams which you want to build and deploy their own pipelines or deploy their own soft project codes. Teams don't want that their piece of code runs on a server which is owned by some other team. So what we can do is we can set up a master slave topology where Jenkins may run on server X, but you can connect multiple other servers which will act as a slave. So when you're deploying a code, executing a pipeline, you can run those code on those XYZ server. That is the beauty of using Jenkins master slave. Another good thing about Jenkins is Jenkins can be deployed on any operating system. You can run Jenkins on a Windows node, on a Linux node, on a Mac OS, Jenkins can be deployed on any operating system. And similarly, your Jenkins master slave can be of any OS. It is not at all dependent. Both master and slave need to be of the same operating system. Another important core component of Jenkins is called as Java Doc. This is sort of plugin in Jenkins, which basically is a part of Jenkins core, which helps us to publish results like build action, build directory, what is the expected build output, all those things that we see in Jenkins, they all are happening using Java Doc. Let's talk about security in Jenkins. Apart from that, Jenkins have other sort of authorization like project-based strategy, metrics-based authorization, which helps to make Jenkins more secure. We'll talk more about this when we talk about Jenkins overall. So as you can see from the diagram, Jenkins is pulling code from some source control system like Git Bitbucket. Jenkins start to deploy it. In Jenkins, we have got notification management system using Mailer, where if the build is successful, we get a war file, a zip file. We can define how we want the build to be created. And it is failure send a notification management to a developer that something happened wrongly with the specific code lines and you need to rectify a code. That is the beauty of using Jenkins. So Jenkins guys is to the bread and butter in the industry. There are some Jenkins competitor also in the market like GitLab Jenkins and some others. But by default, Jenkins is the to-go tool for the CI in the industry. Let's talk about what is a pipeline. So far we talked about Jenkins. Now let's talk about what is pipeline in Jenkins. Now let's say I want to deploy a code. 
the code may have certain steps like first step i am building the code second step i am compiling then code reviewing then packaging then deploying how do i automate or combine all these steps which can be executed in one go to deploy all these scenarios we create a delivery pipeline pipeline is nothing guys it's a combination of different different steps or different tasks that we need to perform in order to deploy our code using a pipeline instead of doing this task or code deployment manually we combine them and deploy them as sort of a one common approach of a delivery pipeline there are multiple ways on how you can create a pipeline the two most common ways or common approaches of using a pipeline as you can see from the scenario are declarative approach and the second one that is used in the industry is scripted approach this particular example you are seeing is an example of a jenkins pipeline script here you are seeing we are first doing a stage called build stage we are combining multiple tasks like first we are using java we are printing something called echo hello pipeline then we are using maven as the build automation tool and trying to deploy a package and then we are doing a shell script output of what all things are present in the particular directory structure a typical example of syntax of how to create a pipeline in jenkins it's example of a scripted pipeline now let's talk about the two predominant pipelines that are used in the it industry scripted and declarative let's talk about what is scripted and declarative and how they're different from each other a scripted pipeline is a traditional jenkins pipeline approach and declarative pipeline is a modern day pipeline approach that is used in the industry in a scripted pipeline the syntax was very strict and traditional while in declarative pipeline we use something called as groovy syntax when you use a declarative pipeline you can get the code from any version system tool like git and all you create something called as jenkins file and you can download jenkins file from a version system tool like git and that can be used to run your jenkins code when you use a scripted pipeline you define a code something called as node block but while declarative pipeline we define a code in pipeline block as we have seen in the previous example now let's talk about what is jenkins file and how it can be used Jenkins file nothing guys it's like a text file where you define your entire structure and syntax of your Jenkins you don't need to download the file as in particular you can just give the path of your git repo if it is in git credential the private repo and it can pull all the contents from there and just execute your code it is a modern day deployment mechanism that we use when we work with a Jenkins pipeline using Jenkins pipeline we use certain things which helps us let's talk about this first is code review and iteration when you do a jenkins pipeline you can easily review your code your code can be reviewed by multiple developer before it executed how that works is in jenkins file stored generally in a version control system tool like git you can put something called as pr pull request for a code review different members of your team can review the code before you actually pull the jenkins file and deploy it you can do an audit trail or refer to as log it you can log each and every step output that is being executed as part of your jenkins file and can see what is happening when the jenkins file is getting executed it's sort of like a verbose logging then you can find a single place to store all your data or all your outputs you no need to have developers scattered here and there and writing their own codes for executing a jenkins pipeline whole organization can approach a jenkins file methodology where code can be stored in a vcs tool and from there code can be downloaded and can work as single source for your entire pipeline let's talk about jenkins workflow in particular how does jenkins workflow work jenkins workflow always starts with a version control system or you can say a source code repository multiple developers collaborate and they put their code in a source code system like git from where jenkins try to pull the data from that source control system repository system there is no mandatory or source code need to be git it can be bitbucket svn whatever your organization uses for using jenkins server we execute tasks like build deploy compiling packaging code review all those things happen using jenkins server where your jenkins actually installed or is running the jenkins server can be any operating system it can be windows machine a linux machine or ubuntu machine it can be any os of up to today's modern world availability using this jenkins server we execute our different different tasks and scenarios in jenkins server only we use the mail functionality for the feedback mechanism we will notify developers the commit or the code deployment is successful it is a failure it has some challenges what can be done using the feedback mechanism be possible using the jenkins server using jenkins servers we always first deployed the code on a lower life cycle environment that is a recommended standard practice we first deploy a qa server on a testing server and once the code deployment is successful on the lower life cycle then we go ahead and deploy the code on our production server that is how the entire jenkins workflow mainly particularly interacts first now guys let's talk about jenkins installation how to install jenkins in our lab to give this example we are going to use a centos machine as a reference to install and configure jenkins Jenkins by default runs on port 8080, the default port for running Jenkins. 
So please make sure that if you're using any cloud VMs or any VMs in your organization, that the port 8080 firewall settings are open and configured so that it can be accessible. Jenkins is a GUI based tool. 95% Jenkins job is completely GUI based. We hardly log into our servers Jenkins got installed or using a CLI command to manage or run Jenkins. It is completely run and managed using GUI, the graphical user interface which comes when we install Jenkins. Another prerequisite to install Jenkins is Java need to be present in our machine. We need to make sure that Java is installed in our machine. So guys, let's go to our lab and see how to install Jenkins. So guys, as I mentioned, we're going to use a CentOS machine. So let's just double check. It's a CentOS VM. So we have got the CentOS VM. We are running CentOS 7. First thing, let's install Java. So install dash Y. You can install any version of Java. I'm installing 1.8.0. We can go for any version. So this completes my Java installation. Another good thing about Jenkins here is Jenkins has got detailed page published by Jenkins community where we can see how to use Jenkins installation for different different types of operating system. If you go to Jenkins.io slash downloads, here you can see the installation step provided by Jenkins community to install Jenkins on different different operating system. You have got the stable release and the release which is like beta release. You can select which release of Jenkins you want to use. I will go for the stable release that is Jenkins 2.2.493.TA3. And since I'm going to use CentOS, I will click on the CentOS installation step for Jenkins. Just copy the steps mentioned here, how to install Jenkins and paste it in your installation server. These are the RPM dependencies that are needed to install Jenkins. So I'm just deploying them on my server so that these dependencies are present before I install Jenkins. And now let's install Jenkins, yum install dash y Jenkins. Once your Jenkins software is installed, let's start the Jenkins service. Service Jenkins is start. Let's validate the Jenkins service got started. So now we have got Jenkins up and running. A while back I mentioned Jenkins runs on port 8080. So let's get the public IP address of this machine. So the public IP address machine is 35.223.206.46. Let's copy this IP address and try to access Jenkins on port 8080. Firstly, when you install Jenkins, Jenkins for securely asks you to verify the Jenkins code. Just go to this path location and copy the code mentioned there on your Jenkins server. So I will go on the Jenkins server and install Jenkins. I will just scan this directory structure and I will copy this Jenkins secret fellow secret key which we need to use to install Jenkins. Click on continue. If your key is valid, it will prompt the next page to install plugins. You get two options here. Either you can install the plugins recommended by Jenkins or you can select your own plugins which you want to install. Here, I will select the install suggested plugins. This step may take a minute or so since it will install a couple of plugins which are need for Jenkins to properly function. So you can see as like in the screen coming up, different different plugins are getting installed in our Jenkins. So once your Jenkins solution is completed, ask you to create your first admin user. Okay, so let's give some username. I'll give the username as Edureka. Give some password. You can give any password of your choice. So I will give some password here. Give some confirm password, give the same password you give above, some name, I will give the name as also Edureka, and some email address. Click on save and continue. So you got the base URL and it's running on port 8080. Click on save and finish. Start using Jenkins. This is how your Jenkins home screen looks like when you configure Jenkins for the first time. Now let's talk about some Jenkins management. On the left side, you see a tab called Manage Jenkins. This is the place where we do the entire administration and management of your Jenkins. You can see you've got a plethora of options here like security, configuration, so status information, tools and action, Jenkins CLI. Let's talk about all these tools in depth. Let's first talk about Configure System. As the name implies, using Configure System, you can configure and edit different different Jenkins properties or Jenkins configuration settings. So for example, how many parallel tasks you want to execute at time? There's a panel of executor. You can give two, three, whatever you want. If you want, you can change the port and specify the default admin address. You can create your own Jenkins email address from where your mail notification should go. 
any global properties or variables you want to link are linked at this place called Jenkins configuration. Let's talk about something about Jenkins security. If you go to configure global security, here you see how we can configure security in Jenkins. There are multiple authorization mode you can use in Jenkins. In order to use this authorization strategy, you need to use the authentication strategy. The most common and most widely used is LDAP integration. Where you basically integrate the organization's LDAP server with your Jenkins database. Once you've done that, you can use different different authorization strategies which are used in Jenkins. The most predominant one used in the industry is project-based metrics authorization strategy. Now, what does this project-based metrics authorization strategy mean? Let's say you have created multiple jobs or pipelines in Jenkins. Now, all these jobs or pipelines belong to different different teams in the organization. Using project-based metrics authorization strategy, we can restrict that specific job can only be accessed by team members of a specific group. It is not imperative that anyone who has access in Jenkins can run all the jobs or all the pipelines. Using project-based metrics authorization strategy, we can restrict that. Another one that is used is metrics-based security. Here you restrict the overall access of Jenkins. That means a user A can have admin rights, a user B can have read-only rights. What type of read rights you want to give, like agent-based read-only rights, the full job rights, full view right, full source code management right, all those things can be done using metrics-based security strategy. Some of the traditional ways which are not being used so frequently in the industry are anyone can do anything. That means anyone who has access to Jenkins is like full admin. Another one that is being not used these days is legacy mode. Legacy mode is something like you have the default admin role where you're granted the full control over system or otherwise you have the only read access it's like read or admin in the legacy mode. And the third one that was not also being used is logged in user can do anything. Logged in user and anyone can do anything is almost like similar. Here also people who log in can basically do any of the tasks which is being done in Jenkins. So in modern industry for security, we only used metrics based strategy and the project based authorization strategy. These are the two things which are basically used in modern day world for using Jenkins. Now let's talk about how does master slave architecture works in Jenkins. How can we configure that and how that is possible. Let's go back and let's go there. Let's go again back to manage Jenkins. You see an option called manage nodes and clouds. Let's see how we can set up a master slave architecture using Jenkins. By default, the server where you install Jenkins is called as the master server, where your Jenkins server is running. On the left hand side of the screen, you can see a tab called as new node. Using a new node, we can add any nodes belonging to any operating system which connect as a Jenkins slave. There are multiple ways of how we can set up authorization between a master and a slave node. The most common methods of using master slave nodes are SSH launch agent by execution of command. This is mainly used when you're using Windows machine as your slave node. For any Linux machine, we generally go by the secure shell as the authorization strategy. We can add as many nodes as you want as a slave node. There's no limitation of how many slave nodes we can have in a Jenkins architecture. Now let's talk about plugins in Jenkins. Plugins, another important component of Jenkins. When you go to manage plugins, you see three options available here. Plugins where you find updates means you have installed and updates are available. Plugins which are installed in your machine, which are already present. So if you guys remember when we installed plugins, we selected an option called install recommended plugins. These are some plugins which get installed by default when we select that option. Then you've got a tab called available plugins. Plugins which are available, which we can use for installation. There's a plethora of plugins which is developed and managed by the Jenkins community, which you can use for installing here. So for example, Let's say we want to install a plugin to integrate to any cloud environment. You can find plugin for that also. So if you search for, for example, Azure, you can find you've got so many plugins to integrate with the Azure cloud. Similarly, if you search for AWS cloud, you can see so many plugins to connect with the AWS services. Same way you can create your own plugins also. We need to create our own plugins and you can upload the plugins which can be used for you to installation in your own Jenkins installation. Once your plugin installation has been verified and updated, then it can be used by the Jenkins community as a whole. But initially, when you upload any plugin, it is just for you to use on your own machine. Now, guys, let's talk about how to create a job at Jenkins. When you work in Jenkins, there are a few terms which we use very often. Items, jobs, project, they all are interchangeable words. They all carry the same meaning in terms of Jenkins. How to create a job or item? Just click on the new item, give some name, let's say job fun. For now, select just freestyle project since we are getting a very basic one. Click on OK. Go on the build tab and select how you want to build step. Execute a shell command, a bash command, now integrate what is your. For example, I want to execute a shell command. 
and let's say I want to print something echo hello from Eureka. Simple job. And just click on apply and click on save. Let's try to build this job. In order to build this job, you see the option called build now. Click on build now. See, my job is running right now. See, my job execution got completed, and I can see my first job got completed. Let's click on this one button, the first job execution, and click on the console output. Here you can see how the job execution actually happened. My job got successfully completed, and you can see a message getting displayed hello from Eureka. So, simple way to see a create a first job and to validate job got successfully completed or not. Let's try to create one more job and then we'll try to see how that works out. Let's say I want to print today's date, for example. So let's again say job two, for example. Again, a freestyle project. Again, click on OK. Again, click on build. This execute shell. And let's say echo hello. And let's say date. And I want to store this output in slash temp, slash temp, slash edureka. And let's click on apply, click on save. And let's click on build now. You see the job output is successful. Let's click on this, click on console output. You see it successfully printed this and the output got completed. You see all this job that we execute are done in a specific directory structure on the Jenkins server. So if I go on this Jenkins server, for example, and go inside this directory structure, and you do ls, you can see that this job got executed in this directory structure job. Similarly, if I go in the temp directory structure and do an ls, you see, when we ran this job, we gave the date should be printed in this Eureka file. If I do a cat and this file name, it is print two days later. Simple example that whatever jobs we execute gets actually executed on the Jenkins server. We just seen the front end in the GUI. What is being done as part of the Jenkins strategy. Now, how do we do a source code management integration in Jenkins? For example, let's say I have got some code in any versioning tool system, let's say like Git or subversion of Bitbucket, and I'll download data from there too. Go to the job or create a new job. Let's click on configure. If you go on to source code management, you see an option called Git. Here you can define the GitHub repository path from where you want to download data. Your Git repository, if you're using a private repository, add your Git credentials and from which particular branch you want to download or clone your code. You can even add multiple Git branch from where you want to get that data. That is how this thing works in Jenkins. Another beauty about Jenkins is build triggers. So every time when I build a job, I don't want to go manually and run the job. We can automate this process using some simple tasks like build periodically. You can define a schedule where you want your jobs to be run. This schedule is defined in a cron tab basis, like every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every hour, once in a day. We define a cron tab entry for that, and accordingly, your jobs will run automatically in that particular schedule manner. If you want to make your life more simpler and want to run the job every time a new commit a developer makes, for that, go with the option of poll SCM. In a poll SCM option, every time a new commit happens made by a developer, at this specific schedule, check for it. If there is no new commit, the job will not build. But if there's a new commit, the poll SCM will trigger that job. That is how we automate the things in Jenkins. When you build a job, you try to get a sort of pipeline. You can create a pipeline on the basis of multiple scenarios. When you say scenarios, what scenario you talk about? For example, let's say I want the next job to be executed only if my build is stable or unstable or failed. You can specify a scenario and then say which job want to trigger. For example, I want to interlink job two and job one. I can give job two interbuild after job two build job one, but only trigger job one only when job two is stable. So it's like creating a sort of interdependent jobs where only if my previous job execution was stable or successful, it will go to the next job. Otherwise, it will skip the next job. That is how we build a sort of pipeline using Jenkins. In Jenkins, your slave nodes or your master slave hierarchy can be a node in the on-premise machine or it can be any cloud VM also. So for example, you can have your Jenkins master server deployed on-premise or in your own data center. While your slave machine can be running in an AWS cloud or an Azure cloud or even both. That is how good Jenkins is all about. Jenkins guys completely open source automated software where there is no cost of using it or there is no licensing cost link. For it. How do we automate all those stages and deploy them in a one single code as a pipeline? So now we're going to see an example on how to create a pipeline. Before using this pipeline, we have just make sure that Maven is installed and present in our environment. So let's go to our Jenkins setup where we installed and configured our Jenkins. Again, just click on new items as we previously created a new job or something. Give some name. 
let's say I give a name as code. Select the option as pipeline. Click on OK. And when you scroll down, you see an approach called pipeline script. Here, basically, you write your script on how you want to deploy your pipeline for your example. Here, in my scenario, you see we have created this scripted pipeline. Here, there are three steps, or you can see three stages for our code deployment. The first is we're preparing our code. Here, as you can see, we're downloading the code from a Git repo or a Git repository. Here, we've defined the Git repo path where we want our code to be downloaded. You can specify whichever GitHub path you want to use. Next thing you can see, we have defined an environment variable that is build the code that is getting downloaded from the preparation step. Which we have named as stage build. Here you can see we are running the bin MVN, the default Maven directory, and we're trying to build this particular piece of code here. Once our code gets built, we are trying to combine this code and create an artifact file, a jar file. You can define whatever format of output you want, a jar file, a zip file, a war file, anything can be defined in this approach. Let's click on apply. Let's click on save. And let's see how this pipeline looks like. So okay, click on build now. You can see different different stages have happened. The first one is preparation stage. In this stage, the code would have been pulled from the Git repo. Then the build stage and finally we see results that something has happened. So let's click on this job and let's click on the console output. You can see the first stage happened that is pulling the data from the Git repository. It was a public repo, so no code need to be specified. The data got cloned or downloaded from this Git repository. Once the data was downloaded, it then tried to combine it. See, it uses a different different Maven plugin, like the compiler plugin, what test support the Maven Surefire plugin. It ran some test cases, you see. It ran some six test cases where it had no failures in this particular directory structure on your server where you install Jenkins. So if you go inside the directory structure where you install Jenkins and click on LS, you can see the jar file for your code has been done. So using a very simple Jenkins pipeline, we automate the entire process of compiling, packaging, building, unit testing, and I think it took less than a minute for the entire thing to happen, probably some couple of seconds for this entire step to happen. That is how Jenkins make life so easy. It overall took says 2.785 seconds. And this 2.785 seconds, it pulled the code from VCS, a version control system. It compiled it, it packaged it, it tested it, and now everything looks good. It packaged our code as a chart file. So that is how Jenkins helps us to make our life easier. So since Docker is a containerization platform, it's important to understand what came before containerization or what is the history of containerization. So before Docker came into the picture, before containerization came into the picture, there was this concept of virtualization or basically using virtual machines. So virtualization was this technique of importing a guest OS on top of an operating system. And this technique was a revelation at the beginning because it allowed developers to run multiple operating systems in different virtual machines, all running on the same host operating system, which nothing but eliminated the need for extra hardware resources. Now, the advantages of virtual machines or of virtualization are many. Multiple OSs could be run on the same machine. The maintenance and recovery was easy in case of failure conditions. And the third point here being the total cost of ownership was also less due to the reduced need for infrastructure. So as you can see here on your screen right now, you can see that there is a host operating system on which there are multiple guest OSs running, which is nothing but a virtual machine. So as most concepts have their shortcomings, virtualization also had a few. So running multiple virtual machines on the same host OS, each to the performance of degradation. This is because the guest OS running on top of the host OS will have its own kernel, own set of libraries and own dependencies. And these take up a large chunk of the system resources that is the hard disk, processor, RAM and other resources. Another problem with the virtual machine, which used virtualization, that it takes a lot of time to boot up. So the problem is very critical in case of real time applications. So these drawbacks were always there. Apart from that, you also have the age old battle between development and production teams that the code works at development and does not work in productions because the developer has a system with their own set of libraries, their own kernel and the apps running on there. Whereas the production team has these resources of their own. So this is a problem that you can blame upon the difference in the computing environment. 
a code that runs on the developer's system might not run on someone else's computer. So this led to a new technique called containerization. Basically, a container brings virtualization to the OS level, while virtualization brings abstraction to the hardware, containerization brings abstraction to the OS. So what you might notice here is containerization is basically virtualization, but it's more efficient because there is no guest OS here. It utilizes a host's operating system, shares relevant public libraries and resources where needed, and unlike virtual machines, the application-specific libraries and binaries of containers run on the host kernel. So each app has its own set of libraries and binaries in its own little container, which makes processing and execution extremely fast. Even if you have to boost a process, it takes only a fraction of a second because in case of containerization, all the containers share only the host operating system, but hold all their application-related binaries and libraries in themselves. They are lightweight and faster than virtual machines. So here, as you can see, there is your host OS or your host kernel, which is shared by all the different containers. So the containers themselves only contain the application-specific libraries, which are separate for each container. This is what makes them faster and they do not waste any resource. All these containers are handled by a containerization layer, which is not native to the host OS. Hence, a software is needed which can enable you to run containers on your host OS. And this is also how containerization solves the difference in computing environment problem. Now, a developer works on containers instead of virtual machines. The app and its required libraries and binaries all are in one container. So when it is passed on to the testing team or the production team, it does not matter whether their host systems have the same libraries. All the dependencies are already present in the container containing the app. So now that you know what is virtualization and what is containerization, and why do we need containerization? Let's move ahead and talk about Docker. Why do we need Docker? So a challenge I briefly spoke about earlier is what I would like to elaborate on in this section. Now, when you have a project code in a development lifecycle, there are different, different environments. You have your virtual server, you have your staging environment, you have your production environment, you have your QA environment. Now, most of the code that we deploy today is done using VMs or virtual machines. Now, how this works is that a developer or certain developers will write the code and all of it is placed in a version control system such as Git. Now, this could also be placed in a staging server depending on your organization's infrastructure. But most organizations these days use a version control system. So more often than not, the code is placed in that version control system. Now, this code is never directly deployed in the production server. It's usually first deployed in a lower lifecycle server like your QA server or your staging server. Now, once it is successful in that, then only it is deployed on your production server. Now, this is where the chances of conflicts increase. So, the same piece of code that might be running on your staging server might not run on your production server. And the reason is very simple is the difference in the computational environment. This is also known as infrastructure incompatibility. Now, in most cases, your QA servers or your QA environment, staging environment are always updated. In most organizations, that's the case. It usually has the latest libraries, latest binaries, latest jars, all that jazz. But the same cannot be said for the production environment. So in order to face all these challenges that is faced, difference in environment and lack of optimization of resources, we use Docker. So this is where Docker comes into picture. Docker does virtualization in the software level and we call it containerization as I had mentioned before. So here, as you can see, containers are bundled with their own set of libraries and binaries, but they can communicate with each other with a fixed set of protocols. The thing about containers, however, is that they do not have their own operating systems, which is a great thing because this is what makes them lightweight and function on very little resources, which makes them really fast as well. So what exactly is Docker? As you can see on your screens, there are two machines. The first one has three software applications. One is Angular-based, one is React-based, and one is Django-based. 
Now, all of them are using common resources from the systems, libraries, RAM, processor, etc. And the frameworks are allocated a location in the memory. Now, how is it different from your machine with Docker? Since you have a Dockerized machine, you have a Dockerized system, all of your frameworks and binaries and libraries required by your Angular app, your React app, and your Django app can be put into their each isolated containers, which are going to run independently from each other without interfering with another app. And the space in which you had your framework stored has opened up. So now you can add another software application there with its own frameworks and libraries, binaries, etc. And that is what Docker is meant to do. It's a tool designed to make it easier for you to create, deploy, and run applications by the usage of containers. Docker is a containerization solution. Docker containers do not use the guest operating system. They use the host operating system. And on top of that host operating system, there is the Docker engine. And with the help of this Docker engine, Docker containers are formed and these containers have applications running in them. The requirements for those applications, such as all the binaries, libraries, frameworks, jars, etc., are also packaged in the same container. There can be multiple containers running simultaneously, as you can see. There are two containers here in our example, and those containers have applications running in them. And you don't really have to pre allocate any RAM to those containers. These containers allow a developer to package an application with all its parts, all its needs, and then you can deploy it as one whole package. They are basically lightweight alternatives to virtual machines that use the host operating system. This is basically a general workflow of Docker. So you can see one way of using Docker over here. What is happening is that your developer writes a code and defines an application requirements or the dependencies in an easy to write Docker file. And then this Docker file produces Docker images. So whatever dependencies are required for a particular application is present inside the image. Now, as we have specified many times before, what are Docker containers? Now the Docker containers we spoke so much about are basically the runtime instances of these Docker images. This particular image is then uploaded onto Docker Hub from where anyone can pull the image and build a container. Now, Docker Hub is nothing but the GitHub of Docker. It's like a repository for Docker images. It contains public as well as private repositories. So from the public repositories, you can pull your images and you can upload your own images as well to Docker Hub. And then, as I mentioned, from Docker Hub, various teams such as your QA team or production team can pull the images and prepare their own containers, as you can see in the diagram. So this shows a great advantage of Docker is that whatever dependencies that are there that are required for your application to run are present throughout the software delivery lifecycle. If you can recall the initial problem that was there with VMs was basically that the application worked fine in a development environment, but when it reached the production environment, it was not working properly. So that particular problem is easily resolved with the help of this particular workflow because you have the same environment throughout the software delivery lifecycle, be it a developer, testing, QA, or production. Now, before moving on to the next section, let's look at a case study about containerizing the NASA Land Information System framework using Docker. Now, developed by the Hydrological Sciences Laboratory at NASA's Godard Space Flight Center, or GSFC, the Land Information System, or the LIS, is a high-performance software framework for terrestrial hydrology modeling and data assimilation. Basically, the LIS enables integrating satellite and ground-based observational products and advanced modeling algorithms to extract land surface states and fluxes. Now, this framework was very difficult for non-experts to install due to many dependencies on specific versions of the software and compilers. This situation then created a significant barrier to entry for domain scientists interested in using the software for their own computing systems or in the cloud. In addition, the requirement to support multiple runtime environments across the LIS community had created a significant burden on the NASA team. 
Now to overcome these challenges, NASA had deployed LIS using Docker containers, which allowed installing an entire software package along with dependencies within a working runtime environment. They also used Docker Swarm, which we shall learn about later, to orchestrate the deployment of the cluster of containers. This installation that used to take weeks or months was now completed by NASA officials in minutes either in the cloud or on premises. Now moving on, let's look at Docker's workflow and architecture. What you see in front of you is the Docker workflow. Now the Docker engine uses a client server architecture where the Docker engine is simply a Docker application that is installed on your local machine. The client server architecture communicates using a REST API and the Docker daemon checks the requests to manage the containers. So the Docker architecture includes a Docker client, which is used to trigger Docker commands, a Docker host, which runs the Docker daemons, and a Docker registry, which stores the Docker images. The Docker daemon running with the Docker host is responsible for images and containers. We'll understand the concept of images a little later in this very section as a part of Docker components. So to build a Docker image, you can use the CLI or the client to issue a bill to command the Docker daemon which runs on the Docker host. Now the Docker daemon will then build an image based on your inputs and save it in the registry, which can either be the Docker hub or a local repository. So if we do not want to create an image, then we can just pull an image from the Docker hub, which would have been built by different users. And finally, if we have to create a running instance of any Docker image, we can issue a run command from the CLI or the client, which will create our Docker container. So this is basically the overall architecture or the overall functioning of the Docker architecture. As we move forward in this section, things will be more clear to you. So as you can see, the heart of the Docker architecture is basically the Docker engine. The Docker engine is simply the Docker application that is installed on the host operating system of your host machine. It works like a client server application, which uses a server, which is a type of long running program called the daemon process. The second point here is the command line interface or the client. The next component here is the REST API, which is used for communication between the CLI client and the Docker daemon. So now if there is a Linux based OS and there is one Docker client which can be accessed from the terminal and a Docker host which runs the Docker daemon, we build our Docker images and run our Docker containers by passing the commands from the CLI client to the Docker image. So this was all about Docker engine and its workflow. Now let's talk about the Docker components which you will be most acquainted to hearing. You have your Docker file which builds into a Docker image, which you run, you get a Docker container, and then you store it in a Docker registry. Let's go ahead and look at all of these components in a little depth, shall we? First of all, you have your Docker file, which is nothing but a text document, which contains all of your commands that you as a developer call on the command line to assemble an image. So basically, to create an image, you'll have to write a Docker file and then build it. So Docker file basically has your set of instructions, which creates the Docker image. Next, you have the Docker image, which can be compared to a template used to create a Docker container. So Docker images are basically the building blocks of a Docker container. These Docker images are created using the build command, and these are read-only templates. You can then store them, as I had mentioned before, in your Docker Hub or your local registry. Next, after building your Docker image, what you get is a Docker container. And these are read-only templates. You can then go ahead and store them in Docker Hub or your local registry, as I had mentioned before. Docker lets you create and share software through Docker images. And you also don't have to worry about whether your computer can run a software in a Docker image because a Docker container is always there to run it. So in case of Docker images, you can use a ready-made Docker image from the Docker Hub or create a new image as per your own requirements to run in a container. 
With that, let's move on to the next component, which is a Docker container. So the Docker containers are the ready applications created from Docker images. It's the running instance of a Docker image. And this Docker container holds the entire package needed to run this Docker application. So a Docker container happens to be the ultimate utility of Docker and hence this is the part of Docker which is most popular and most widely used. So if you talk about the applications, every application is run inside a container. So it is an isolated application platform that contains all you need to run an application built from one or more images. So finally, let's move on to Docker registry, which is a storage component for the Docker images. Now this is where the Docker images are stored, which could either be a user's local repository or a public repository like the Docker Hub, which allows multiple users to collaborate building an application even with multiple teams within the same organization who exchange or share containers by uploading them to the Docker Hub. It helps you control where your images are being stored and integrates your image storage with your in-house development workflow as well. Now, Docker Hub, as I've mentioned before, is Docker's very own cloud repository, which is similar to GitHub, which is kind of like GitHub, but for Docker images. Hope you guys are with me so far. With this, we have seen the architecture and components of Docker. So now we are going to talk about two other components of Docker, Docker Compose and Docker Swarm. So first of all, let's start with Docker Compose. Now, Docker Compose is a tool for defining and running multi-container Docker applications, which basically means you can run different or multiple containers as a single service. The containers are still isolated, but they can interact with each other using a YAML file, which is used to configure your application services. And then with a single command, Docker Compose up, you can create and start all the services from your configuration. A great example of this would be a microservice such as a shopping app. So for example, you can take any online retail stores app. It could be Amazon, it could be Flipkart, it could be Argeo. And the idea behind an app like this is that it's a microservice app, which basically means it has multiple services in one big application. So all of these services individually are easier to build and maintain. And when one service is failing, the entire app is not down. So a retail app like Amazon or Mintra or Flipkart or any app of your choice, it'll have multiple services like it'll have a login account, it'll have your product catalog service, it'll have a shopping cart service and a checkout service. And this is just the bare minimum. And each of these services could be scaled up or down in their own container, tested and built and fixed in their own isolated containers without interfering with any other service in that entire application. So using something like Docker Compose, you can connect all of these isolated containers as a single service. All right. And the next thing I want to talk about is Docker Swarm. Now, Docker Swarm is a service which allows you to create and manage a group of either physical or virtual machines or nodes and schedule containers. Each of the nodes is a daemon which interacts with others using the Docker API. Docker Swarm is basically a technique to create and maintain a cluster of different Docker engines. Services deployed in any node can be accessed on other nodes in the same cluster. It allows for high availability of services, auto load balancing, decentralization of access, easy upscaling and downscaling of deployments and rolling updates. So basically how it works is that your manager nodes know the status of all the working nodes in a cluster. Your worker nodes then accept tasks sent from the manager node. There is an agent assigned to every single node to give its task updates to the manager. And finally, the workers communicate with the manager using an API over the HTTP protocol. And that is how a Docker Swarm works. Basically, Docker Swarm is an orchestration management tool that runs on Docker applications. It helps you end users in creating and deploying a cluster of Docker nodes. 
Each node of a Docker Swarm is a Docker daemon and all the Docker daemons interact using the Docker API. And each container within the Swarm can be deployed and accessed by other nodes of the same cluster. So if you consider an environment having Docker containers, if one of the container fails, we can use the Swarm to correct that failure. Docker Swarm can reschedule containers on node failures and the Swarm node also has a backup folder which we can use to restore the data onto a new Swarm. So with that, we have come to an end to the workflow and architecture of Docker. So now I'm sure all of you might be eager for actually doing something on Docker. So let's go ahead and install Docker. So here are the steps to install Docker on Ubuntu, on your Linux systems, on your Ubuntu systems. You will be using the command sudo apt install docker.io on your Ubuntu systems to install Docker on your system. So let's go ahead and start up with the installation. Today I am using the Ubuntu distribution running on my Oracle VM VirtualBox. So we're going to start out by updating. So sudo apt update. And this might take a little bit of time, so kindly be patient. This is a good practice before making any installations, any setups on your machine. All right. As you can see, all my packages are upgraded. And now we can go ahead and install Docker. So to install Docker, we are going to use the command sudo apt install docker.io and then click on Y. And there's also something which takes up quite a considerable amount of time depending on the speed of your machine as well as the speed of your internet, so on and so forth. Now understand this is just one way of doing this and this is the method I am most comfortable with and that's why this is the method I will be demonstrating here. There are two, three other methods through which you can download Docker on your machine. And not just in Linux, you can also install Docker Desktop on Windows just in case you do not want to use a virtual machine. And you can also use a cloud platform such as an EC2 instance to run all of these Docker commands that I shall be showing you later in this session. So now we are going to start and enable Docker using sudo systemctl. Okay, with that, we have started and enabled our Docker machines. And now we are going to go ahead and check out our Docker version that's running. And as you can see, this is the Docker version and this is the Docker build that we are running. All right. So moving on, we are going to get to our hands on section. In this section, we will learn how to create a Django project setup using Docker and deploy it on our local host. For that, remember, you need to have a GitHub account and Docker installed on your machine, just the way I showed you right now. We're gonna build a backend REST API with Python and Django. We're gonna create a new GitHub project that we are gonna to use to store the source code for our recipe app API. Now, this is a wonderful way to show the versatility of Docker now I found this project while browsing through GitHub and I came to a conclusion that this was a wonderful way to show how eclectic, how versatile is Docker as a tool. So the first step would include initializing a new project on GitHub and coming back 
to your Linux machine and navigating to where you wish to store your API. There, we are going to create our Docker file using an editor. You can obviously use the VI editor or nano editor if you please. There, using the editor in our working directory, we are going to be creating our Docker file, our requirements file, and our Docker compose file, which is our YAML file. And then we are going to run our app on the terminal. So this is the basic breakdown of how we are going to create our Django project setup using Docker. So let's go on straight to our demo machine and put all of this into action. So we are going to navigate to GitHub and we are going to create a new public project or repository on GitHub. So let's create a new repository and let's call it Docker Demo API App. And the description, we're just going to write demo app setup. We're going to keep this public and we're going to initialize this with a readme file. All right. So let's go ahead and create our repository. So as you can see, this is a blank repository, Docker demo API app, just the readme file there. So here on our repository page, I'm going to click on the screen button code button and copy the URL from here from your clone or download option. We're going to copy this to our clipboard so that we can clone this particular repository using our terminal. I'm going to move on to the terminal and I'm going to load my terminal and navigate to the directory where I want to store my app. So maybe I'll just save it here. I'm just going to clone this repository to my local machine. All right, and that's done. Now you can go ahead and change your directory to the repository. So now I'm going to use the command ls to see if my repository has been cloned. Yes, it has been cloned. You can see the Docker demo API app is cloned right here on my local machine. So I'm going to change my directory to this repository I just created by typing the command cd docker demo api app. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this project in the editor. Like I had mentioned, you can use any other editor. You can use the vi editor, the nano editor, any editor that you're comfortable with. So now I'm going to clear all of this and I'm going to use the nano editor to create the docker file first. So just nano and docker file. There's no spaces between docker and file. And I am going to put in this code over here. All right. So this is my docker file. So the first line of the docker file is the image that you're going to inherit your docker file from. With docker you can basically build images on top of other images. The benefit of this is that you can find an image that has pretty much everything that you need for your project. So you can just add customized bits that you need just for your specifications. So we are going to create our docker file from Python 3.7 Alpine image. Now you can find this if you head over to the Docker Hub. You can find a list of available images that you can use to base your project off of. If you search for Python, it'll take you to a list of items where you can choose this one. So we're going to use the 3.7 Alpine image. So what it is, is that it's basically a lightweight version of Docker. And that's what Alpine means. And it runs Python 3.7. And the next line is optional. It's usually a maintainer line, but it's useful just to know who is maintaining the project. So I'm going to leave that one out, but you can go ahead and put in your maintainer line. You can put your name or your company's name whatever name you basically use to keep track to show that who is maintaining this Docker image. Next, we are going to set the Python unbuffered environment variable. 
the way you set unbuffered environment variable. Now, the way you set an environment variable in a Docker build file is that you type env and then the environment variable that you want to set. We're going to set one called Python and it's got to be in all capitals, unbuffered, and then we're going to set it to one. So, what this does is that it tells Python to run in the unbuffered mode, which is the recommended mode when running Python within Docker containers. The reason for this is that it doesn't allow Python to buffer the outputs. It just prints them directly and then avoids some complications and things like that. So when you're running your Python application, we are going to install our dependencies. We are going to store our dependencies in a requirements.txt list or file, which we are going to create in a moment so that what we need to do here is we need to copy our requirements.txt file. And what this does is it says copy from the directory adjacent to the Docker file copy. So we're going to copy the requirements.txt file. Further, we're going to copy it on the Docker image, which is what this forward slash requirement txt file means. Next, we're going to run pip install our forward slash requirements.txt. So what this does is that it takes the requirements that we have just copied and installs it using pip into your Docker image. Next, we're going to make a directory within our Docker image that we can use to store our application source code. So you have your run mkdir forward slash app all in lowercase. And below that, we are going to type work the forward slash app and below that, we are going to type copy dot slash app space slash app. What this does is it creates an empty folder in our Docker image called forward slash app at this location. And then it switches to that as the default directory. So any application we've run using our Docker container will run starting from this particular location, unless we specify otherwise, of course. Next, what it does is that it copies from our local machine the app folder to the app folder that we have just created on our image. This allows us to take the code that we created in our project here and copy it to our Docker image. So here we have run add user hyphen capital D and user. And finally, we are going to switch to that user by typing user. Now, this might be a little confusing because I've added the username user for our user. But what this command means is that it says add user, which creates a user. User hyphen D says create a user that is going to be used for running applications only. So not for basically having a home directory that someone will log in. It's going to be used simply to run our processes from our particular project. Finally, this user switches Docker to the user that we've just created. The reason we do this is for security purposes. If you don't do this, then the image will run our application using the root account, which is not recommended because that means if someone compromises our application, they can have the root access to the whole image and they can go ahead and do other malicious things. Whereas if you create a separate user just for the application, then that kind of limits the scope that the attacker would have within our Docker container. All right, so we can go ahead and write out, we can save this file and move ahead to creating our requirements file. So this is what your requirements.txt file will look like. It's a fairly, it's just two lines. In the first line here, we are installing Django. We are using version 2.2.4, which is the latest stable version that I could find. And that's the version that we are going to use for the project. And then type Django more than equals to 2.2.4. So basically what it says is that install Django that is equal to or higher than this particular version. And we do this to take the minor version, which is the last number and make sure that we install the latest available version because typically 
it's the version that has the security features and security fixes and things like that but typically doesn't have breaking changes so we can be confident that our application when we rebuild our docker image will have the latest security patches even if it does not have the latest version okay in the next line we're going to install the django rest framework so we are using 3.9.0 and in the same way which we did with django we are going to make the install one less than 3.10.0 to get the latest version of 3.9 which is whatever is the latest minor version at the time we build our project so now we're going to go ahead and save this file as well now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create an empty directory called app here for our docker file to call because when our docker file will run and it's going to ask for an app folder we are not going to have one then we're going to face issues so now if i do an ls here you see we have a docker file we have our requirements file and we have our app folder now understand why this is required for our docker file for us to build it now so now if you try to copy it without the app folder actually existing it will give you an error so now we can go ahead and build our docker image so we are already at our terminal if you're not on your terminal you can load up your terminal and if you're on windows it will be your command prompt let's make sure that you navigate to your project folder which i am already at and then i'm going to type docker build dot now what that's going to do is that it's going to build whichever docker file is in the root of our project that we are currently in the reason we call it docker file in the first place is because it's the standard convention that docker uses to identify the docker file within our project so we're going to wait for it to complete and it should be fairly quick because we are using an alpine image it's a very lightweight minimal image that runs python that's how we create a docker file for our project and go ahead and create our docker compose configuration for our project so we're going to use docker compose as a tool to allow us run our docker image easily from our project location so it allows us to easily manage the different services that make up for our project so for example one service might be the python application that we run another service might be a database for example so let's go ahead and create the docker compose file for our project so nano docker compose dot yaml or yml so this is a yaml file that contains the configuration for all services that make up our project the first line of the docker compose configuration file is the version of docker compose that we are going to be writing our file for so version colon and 3 next we define the services that make up our application right now we only need one service for our python django application so services colon and in the line below you're going to type app this is the name of our service so we are going to call it out and then we are going to type build and then context code on context so what this says is that we are going to have a service called app and the build section of the configuration we are going to set the context to dot which is our current directory that we are running docker compose from next we're going to type the port configuration so we're going to type them in open speech marks 8080 is our host to port 8080 on our image so we're going to type that and then we're going to add a volume the volume allows us to get the updates that we make to our project into our docker image in real time so it basically maps a volume from our local machine here into our docker container while we'll be running our application now this means whenever you change a file or you change something in the project you will automatically update it in the container now the good part is you don't have to restart docker 
to get the changes into effect. So then you have a dot slash app, forward slash app. So what this does is it maps the app directory, which we have here in our project. And this it maps to the app directory in our Docker image. Then you have the command to run your application in your Docker container. So just make sure that the indentation is one indent from where your command starts and then you type the command. So we're going to use to run our application bsh hyphen c. This means we are going to run the command using the shell. The Python manage py run server. Then we're going to run the server on our local host at port 8080. So this will run the Django development server available on all IP addresses that run on the Docker container. And it's going to run on port 8080, which is going to be mapped through the POS configuration on our local machine. So we can run our application. So again, we are going to move on to our terminal and build the Docker compose file. And what this does is it will build our image using the Docker compose configuration and this should not take too much time. So if we're going to build our Docker file. So now we're going to add sudo docker compose build. And as you can see, it's successfully built Clear it out. So now we're going to use Docker Compose to create the project files for our application. And for that, you can either log in as super user or just type sudo. So Django admin.py, we're going to start project. Now after running the command, you will realize that if you go into your empty app folder, which was the folder that you created initially and list out, it's not empty anymore. It has another app folder in it which contains all of our app setup, I will show you. There you go. You have these files, one, two, three, four, five Python files, which is basically your Django apps, entire setup, and all of this Docker created and set it up for you. So a teensy little detail, let's just open up our settings.py file and we're going to go down to allowed hosts and just in case it's empty between the close brackets you can go ahead and add your local host or put in the asterisk which allows all hosts all right so i'm just going to do that and then i'm going to go back and now all we have to do is deploy the application through your terminal so we're going to go sudo docker compose up. So now as you can see, your Django application is up and running. And all of this was possible because of Docker. With that, I come to the end of my demonstration. Hope you enjoyed this demonstration. Now it's time for you to go ahead and try this on your own. I shall leave you with that thought. My name is Upasna. Thank you and have a great day. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!